Good evening. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education open session on Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? I proceed to general provisions of Article 3-305 and 3-104. I move for the board to meet in closed session to discuss performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this body has jurisdiction or any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals to consider matters that relate to negotiations, to perform administrative function, and to consult with counsel and obtain legal advice. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to go into closed session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We will see you back at 430. Thank you, Mr. Strait. Good evening. Uh, it's Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education open meeting. I'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. I need to start a uh, motion to amend the, ag the, cr the uh, agenda to reconvene closed session at 12.0 and we will close out uh, close out the meeting in closed session. Do I have a motion? To move. Second. And second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to amend the agenda to add reconvene closed session at 12.0 and to reconvene and to close out of the closed session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Do I have a motion to accept the amended agenda? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the amended agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We have some housekeeping duties right now. The approval of the minutes. <coughs> Do I have a motion to accept October 7th, open and closed. October 21st, open and closed. October 28th, open and closed. Do so I have a motion. Do I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Questions or comments on the motion? Did everyone have a chance to review the minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. I call, hearing no discussion, I call for the vote on the motion to approve all minutes of October 7th, 21st, and 28th opened and closed. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you so much. Recognitions. I'd like to recognize right now our acting superintendent, Ms. Janet Pauls, who comes to us, comes back to us from retirement. We're very grateful and thank you so much. Yep. And we have some recognitions tonight. Yes. Good evening. Turn on, please. Good evening. Tonight we are going to have a very special recognition for all of our principals who have worked diligently throughout the school year, especially during a very difficult time, and we'd like to let them know how much we really appreciate them. The month of October is National Principals Month, so today we really want to take the time to celebrate these unsung heroes who are on the front lines on a daily basis. We thank them for their leadership and tireless pursuit, pursuit of success for each student. Each of these leaders are very impactful leaders who motivate students and staff to strive for success each day. COVID has added a new layer of responsibility and challenge to a school's already full schedule. Each of these principals have persevered with strength, compassion, and accountability. So we'd like to honor them this evening with a small certificate and a thank you for being resilient and unwavering in their leadership. So at this time, we're going to begin with our secondary um, administrators. So we'd like to have our secondary administrators. First would be Mr. John Schreckengoss. And Mr. Schreckengoss is principal of Ken Island High School. Thanks. 
So at this time, we'd like to recognize our secondary administrators. First, we have Mr. Kevin Kintop, who is the um, principal of Arise Academy. That's right in back of the Board of Education. Mr. Kintop, we thank you so much for your service, and we appreciate everything that you do. Thank you. And then we'd like to recognize Ms. Amy Hudock, principal of Queen Anne's County High School. Had the opportunity to visit her school yesterday and today, and many great things happening there. So thank you, Ms. Hudock, for your service. And then last but not least, we have Mr. John Schreckengoss, principal of Kent Island High School. And Mr. Schreckengoss, we thank you so much for your service. You're very welcome, thank you. Wait, let's do a group shot with everybody. Hey guys, go to the back of the room and hang out. Okay. We're getting everybody together. Just a secondary. No, we'll do it right here. One time. Okay. Oh. Middle school. So at this time, we'd like to recognize our middle school principals. And first of all, we have Mr. Rob Watkins, principal of Sutlersville Middle School. Mr. Watkins is in his second year as principal, so he's no longer a rookie, and we appreciate everything that you do. Absolutely. Then we have Dr. Lewis McCoy, principal of Mattapique Elementary School. Dr. Colt McCoy, we'd like to thank you for everything that you're doing at Mattapique. Thank you, dear. Mr. Sean Kenna, principal of Stevensville Middle School. Middle School. And Mr. Kenna, we'd like to thank you for all of your service at Stevensville Middle School. Thank you. And Ms. Chambers is not here with us, but she is principal of Centerville Middle School. And now we'll celebrate our elementary principals. Okay. First, we have Ms. Jen Schreckengoss, principal of Mattapique Elementary School. Ms. Schreckengoss, we'd like to thank you for all that you do at Mattapique Elementary School. And next, we have Ms. Teresa Farnell. And I also had the opportunity to visit her school today, and she was busy at work. Ms. Farnell, we thank you for all that you do. Michelle Carey. I also visited Ms. Carey's school today and they were busy at work. She was meeting with teachers. Ms. Carey, we thank you for all that you do. Ms. Carey is at Kennard. Yes, Ms. Carey is at, I'm sorry, principal of Kennard Elementary School. And then we have Ms. Walbert, who is principal of Churchill Elementary School. Ms. Walbert, we thank you for all that you do. Thank you very much. And Mr. Walls thought he couldn't be with us today, so he may have broken some speed barriers, but he's here. Uh, and he let me know he definitely wanted his shout out. So Mr. Walls, we thank you for all that you do, principal of Center, uh, Sutlersville Elementary School. And next we have Ms. Louisa Welch, the Blue Ribbon School, and of Bayside Elementary. So Ms. Welch, we thank, thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Carol Camp, principal of Graysonville Elementary School. And Ms. Camp, we thank you for all that you do. You. Last but not least, we have Mr. Dave Dulike, principal of Kent Island Elementary School. And principals, before you came in, we talked a little bit about October being National Principals Month and how we wanted to celebrate you because you are the unsung heroes who are on the front line. And you've been doing this except uh, ex uh, since March. And we just wanted to take the time to thank you and recognize everything that you do. And we talked about COVID being a new layer of responsibility and challenge, but how you have persevered with strength, compassion, and accountability. So we'd like to take this time to thank you for all that you have done. We greatly appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you. Can we do what? Can we go ahead and do the second thing, and then we'll take a picture? Okay. Ms. We'll do the second thing, and then we'll take a picture. Okay. So the second recognition that we have is for a board member who has served us for the last nine and a half years. It's a long time. 
And she was appointed to the board in 2011 and elected for two consecutive terms thereafter. She served as board vice president, president, and um, she was president in 2019, just uh, last year, very recently. She served on MAVE's legislative committee, and um, she has kept us all abreast of, of the legislative concerns. She is a United States Coast Guard retiree, so at this time, I'd like to ask Ms. Bev Kelly to come forward. And Captain Kelly, we can't thank you enough for everything that you've done in serving the system. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. And we hope that you have some time to enjoy your Wednesday evenings a couple of times a month now. So again, we thank you so very much. Thank you. We have a certificate for you if you get a free hand there. And it reads, Captain Beverly Kelly, in deep appreciation of your outstanding service and dedication to the students of Queen Anne's County. Thank you, Zee. Thank you. We have two other members um, who their term officially ends, but could be back with us. So we all would also like to recognize them as well. And the first one would be Mr. Richard Smith. Okay. And Mr. Mark Anderson. We'd like to thank you. So we don't have election results, so we don't know what may happen. should. <laughs> we thank you so much for your service. Yeah. Okay, group picture. Now it's group picture. Come on up. And Jeff, I don't know how you're going to do that. Early One of the board members get back here. You guys come on back here and we'll fill in with the principals. Here. You stand there. How about you stand in front? Stand in front. Yep. Well, Janet stand in front, and then in principles, there's some can come here, some can go on the sides. Come on, don't be chicken. We're come on up. Come on up. There we go. There we go. Anybody down below? Can you get everybody in? Miss Chambers just arrived. Just Yay! There's Miss Chambers. You're good, you're good. You got everybody, Jeff? Yep. We're not Tom. <laughs> I'm sorry. One, two, three. One, two, three. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for everything you do. Yeah, thank Thanks for making so the time to come in. You're welcome, thank you. <clears throat> you got everyone in here. Mr. Strait, can you see around that or is it in the way? Is that good? Mm. Fabulous. That surprised me. <laughs> so uh, we are at uh, board and staff involvement and as Ms. Pauls has mentioned, um, the elections were yesterday. Mr. Smith has reported to us that um, the elections board may not have our results of our board members until next week. Is that correct, sir? It could be a week to 10 days due to get all the to, uh, uh, contested write-ins. Okay. Uh, I have spoken with um, Catherine Hagar, who is our clerk of circuit court. She will have to then wait for the certificates to come down from the state before these board members can be sworn in. If this, as a part of our handbook, they have to be done before the first meeting in December. If that is not possible, then the two uh, or three board members um, that are here now will serve until those folks um, are sworn in. That's that's our protocol. So just let everybody know. Um, for our acting superintendent, you have a report for us? Yes, I have only been here a few days and I've been quite busy um, as you would expect. But it, as I as stated earlier, it's been my pleasure to visit all of the schools in the Centerville area. And I was able to visit the Queen Anne's County High School yesterday and today. And today I was able to visit with students 
students and observe the students actually in the classrooms. So it was very nice to see students and um, the team is doing an excellent job. I also visited all the elementary schools uh, as well and Centerville Middle School. I also was able to participate in one of the PD sessions that was held on Monday. I had a meeting um, very close behind that so I was able to attend the um, ELA part of the professional development session. And I've had the opportunity to meet with the executive team and all of the principals on Monday. And um, I've had the opportunity to meet with board members as well. I've attended an athletic meeting. And today I had a meeting with Dr. Ciotola um, from the Queen Anne's County Department of um, of health. So I've uh, been busy in those three days and it's been an enjoyable three days and uh, I certainly have appreciated being uh, welcomed by all of the members of our uh, Board of Education. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, we have our student member, uh, Alexis Gross from Ken Allen High School. Alexis, you want to come on down? Good evening. So in this past month of October, we've had National Honor Society inductions. It was on October 27th. We had three groups come in at different times to make sure everyone got inducted while also having the precautions there. And then as known, on October 30th, quarter one ended. In the last week of October, our SGA held a virtual spirit week. So uh, there was a different theme each day. On Monday, it was America Monday. Tuesday was Tropical Tuesday. Wednesday was quarantine, so everyone stay in their pajamas. On Thursday, which was my favorite day, was Generations Day. So the freshmen were babies, sophomores were college students, juniors were mom, dad, middle-aged, and seniors were senior citizens. On Friday, we all wore jerseys. And if anybody wanted to show off their spirit wear, we all met on a Google Meet, so yeah. And then in November, quarter one reports will be emailed on November 6th. Uh, quarter one interim, or quarter two interims will be sent out on November 11th. And currently we have 273 students participating in fall sport training for sports with women's and uh, men's soccer, cheerleading, cross country, football, field hockey, and volleyball. And all of our staff at Ken Island High School has been working really hard to set up our classrooms and everything for us to come back. And I went in recently to talk to my principal, Mr. Schreckengoss, and it has looked really nice. They have labels down the ground to tell you which way to go and everything. And there's many hand sanitizer stations. So it's exciting. It's great. Thank you so much. Miss mm -hmm. Natalie Smith from Queen Anne's County High School cannot make it with us tonight. She sent in this report. So far, fall sports began to practice on October 20th, focusing on skills and conditionings out, conditioning outside in small cohorts. Masks were worn. Senior pictures were October 7th and 14th. College applications and information. Information about deadlines and financial aid is found in our Thursday communication. Uh, multiple Google Meets are taking place a week to directly uh, communicate with seniors. Virtual college visits are also available. Signups sign ups take place through Naviance. Then a link is sent to join the information session with that college. Similar Google Meets are happening for dual enrollment for the spring semester. Upcoming events, November 7th is the SAT test at, QAC, at QACHS, uh, not for, just for seniors, for students from surrounding counties too. November 12th is on-site admissions for Salisbury University, and spring sports begin on November 16th. Thank you very much, Ms. Natalie, for sending that in. Uh, we are now at the uh, 5.0, Citizen Participation and Public Comment. Mr. Smith. Okay. We ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to the matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are inappropriate for public comment and should refer to the superintendent, acting superintendent of schools or board president. 
If you have any specific question, the board will make sure the appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but ask the courtesy board for our citizens to show respect for all. Do we have any names yet? Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Mm -hmm. okay. The first name on the list is Jesse Freeman. Good evening. Evening. I'm uh, Jesse Freeman. I uh, live at 216 Lentley Farm Lane, Centerville, and I'm a first grade teacher at Churchill Elementary School. Um, I wanted to thank Ms. Pauls and the board for allowing me to speak. I wanted to come to just kind of give the teacher's perspective of everything going on. The first thing I wanted to address was the, the misconception that virtual was not working. I understand it's frustrating for a lot of the parents that, that we work with, but you gotta understand us as teachers, this was thrown to us at the last minute. Schoology, the virtual thing, it was frustrating at first, but honestly over these two months we've adapted. We've collaborated with each other. We've worked to find ways to reach the students. I've had parents in conferences these last couple of days who have thanked me personally for making it easier for their students. I've talked to many teachers around the county. They all feel like we were starting to hit a stride and now we're flipping the script and changing the whole schedule again which is going to make it even more stressful for us as the teachers and the students too. Not to mention with this hybrid schedule I want you to understand we want the kids back in the building. We love the students. We love having them there. We love interacting with the kids. But the hybrid model we have with the current guidelines is not gonna allow for that. It just will not be a friendly learning environment for these kids. Not to mention, we've had many questions that we tried to address as teachers that just have gone unanswered over these past months. So it gets a little frustrating. I wanna make it simple for you to understand. In the typical room, the thing the kids that wanna come back to, I'd have my classroom laid out where it has tables, the kids could come in, they get to interact with their classmates, they sit wherever they would want to. When they were doing inter independent work, they could lounge around, pick different seats. They work together all the time. That's what I loved having my kids do. Unfortunately, with these CDC guidelines we have, it's not going to be that like that. My room is just plain sad right now. I have nothing on the walls. I have desks separated six feet apart, all facing the same direction. They couldn't even be like you guys are right now, slightly turned. They're all literally facing the same direction, so they can't even see their teammates beside them or have the opportunities to work together. If they finish their work, they can't go to a center and have fun. They stay at that desk and have to continue to work on busy work. The only time in these guidelines that they're allowed to move around is to go to the bathroom. And if you've been in an elementary school building, that means for us, they're gonna ask to use the bathroom way more than they have to, which is another thing we have to deal with. The main thing I wanna stress out here is that virtual was working. If we go to hybrid, particularly now in this flu season, we now have to basically screen all these kids and every little thing that comes up, we have to address as possible COVID. It's just the way it has to be. We can't take the risk and just say, oh, Johnny's got a cold, it'll be okay. So now we're putting ourselves in a position where every time a kid blows his nose or coughs, we have to think they might have COVID. What should we do? It's just a lot of stress on us. If you're looking Looking to get these kids in a friendly environment, I'm asking you to stick with virtual. Virtual allowed these kids to talk to each other, allowed them to move around, it allowed them not to have to wear a mask the whole time. I know it's difficult, but trust us as teachers that we were finding ways to make it work. So all I'm doing here tonight is just pleading with you guys to reconsider that suggestion until the guidelines are better for us in the classroom with the students. Thank you. Thank you. The next name is Karen Fields. <laughs> Who? Dr. Henry, thank you. Dr. Henry, please.
Uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Would you state your name and where you live for the record? Uh, Reverend Dr. Jacqueline Henry, 2517 Mellington Road, Mellington, Maryland, 21651. Thank you. I'm here tonight um, because I wanted to file a complaint against the principal uh, for an unjust act. And I would also like to include two vice principals, student support. Hold, 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 uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. This is not the forum to do that. You have to direct all of this to the acting superintendent to the HR director, ma'am. Well, I, I went. I did um, contact uh, the superintendent, which I was unsuccessful, and I sent um, the president of the board, which was you, Tamar Harper, an email on October the second, 2020, and I've yet to get an acknowledgement of the email or any response to even see if this was an open session or a closed session. It, I sent it on to both of those parties and I, they were supposed to. you Tam? I am, ma'am. Okay, and, yeah, you and, never, and never acknowledged my email from October 2nd. I apologize, ma'am. I thought I sent it to you that I had forwarded that email to both the HR director and to the superintendent. Those were the people. Su super, neither one of them has got in contact with me about this matter. But, but then can I this, go ahead? Let, let me I, just read this. The comments about actions of state and individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment. If you could just please address this to Mrs. Harper, president of this board and, and Mrs. Um, Paul's acting superintendent and they will respond to you in a timely manner. Yeah, well, and I thought I had and I apologize oh, that if I, she has not gotten the email back from me, but I, I did forward anything. it. I, I had even contacted um, Dr. King, I mean the superintendent, yes. uh, before I contacted of you. And I haven't gotten anything from anybody. So I felt that I would come today in person okay. and maybe I would be able to get some type of results. So let me uh, introduce you to Ms. B Vanessa Bass uh -huh. and she will take care of this outside with you right now. Okay. Okay, thank you so Thank much. Thank you. I appreciate really appreciate it, it Dr. Henry. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Bass. Appreciate it. Karen Fields, please. Good evening. I'm Karen Fields. I'm president of the Queen Anne County Education Association. And I have to wear my glasses because I small print. Um, in some important ways throughout this crisis, our members' voices have been listened to and support has been given to making teaching and learning work for educators and students. Having the flexibility to teach virtually allowed educators to balance the responsibilities of home and work. Giving teachers the flexibility to work from home in the afternoon during the hybrid um, will help with daycare issues and allow educators to continue to instruct um, students that they've built relationships with. Having joint labor management meetings has given the association the opportunity to bring to the forefront our concerns about health and safety and to ask questions and keep an open dialogue. So that is greatly appreciated. While I know everyone is doing their very best under very difficult circumstances, there have been many unanswered questions that you yourself have posed over the course of the last few months. The honest answers were often, we are working on it, we'll be ready shortly, it should be here. With schools reopening to more students on Monday, the time to answer those questions is now. Are we, are we ready with alcohol wipes, sanitizer stations, and other PPE? Will the consultants be brought to the buildings to test air quality before students arrive? Will classroom cameras be delivered and ready for use on Monday? Do we now have the bandwidth increased to handle camera feeds from every classroom? Do parents have a clear understanding of what the school classroom experience will be in elementary, middle, and high school? As educators and support staff, we want to be back in school with our students, but we must do so safely and sustainably. This is our chance to get this right. We can't afford not to. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Meehan. Good evening. 
I'm a teacher at CMS. So for the record, your name, please, and oh, where sorry. you live. Mary Meehan, and I live in Centerville, Maryland. Thank you. And I'm a teacher at CMS and a parent of a senior. Um, and I know tonight you're probably going to hear a lot about safety concerns and health, but I would mostly like to address the feeling of teachers about the workload. There are a few things, though, that I'd like to start with about health and safety that came up today in my building. One is that we realized we don't have enough teachers to cover classes. So our new plan is to put one teacher in a gym or a cafeteria with several classes of students. This is hardly safe and extremely difficult for a teacher to be assigned to instruct a class while watching other students in the room. This seems more of a catch-all than a plan. Currently, there are no wipes in our classrooms, and there is a small bag with a few masks and no gloves. The traffic patterns designated in my part of the building do not keep cohorts separate. In fact, they require the students to pass through my cohort from the other side in order to go to their next class. Again, this isn't really fostering confidence in our readiness to return plan, nor the safety of the plan. For my purpose today, I would like to just to begin with a quick, <clears throat> excuse me, a quick result of a state survey that, that found that the average teaching time for teachers during virtual instruction was 12 to 14 hours a day, including weekends. We in Queen Anne's County have adjusted to our virtual learning environment, given all the requirements that the district has asked of us, just to name a few. We have taught ourselves Schoology. We are recording daily videotapes. We are grading work that is being, being handed in 24 hours after or later from the time of assigned time, sorry. Um, we are tracking attendance through three different sources, and we are overwhelmed and exhausted. My 30-minute classes meet every day with asynchronous Wednesday schedules, and it has become a routine for my students. They are comfortable with it, they show up, they talk, and they are turning in their work. Now, I, that schedule is about to get blown up. Uh, the new cohort that I will teach on Mondays and Tuesdays for 60 minutes will involve a plan for them as well as a plan for the virtual students that I am not seeing. That means I have two preps for every class that I teach. My struggling learners at the moment are very nervous about this new schedule. Parents that I have met with this week for parent-teacher conferences have asked endless questions about how their child is to keep track of which days they meet with which teacher, and at the end of the day when they aren't in school, which teachers they are expected to check in with. This will vary from day to day. Finally, um, we will be asked to record these 60-minute classes for students without cameras, requiring us to take our planning time to record what normally takes us 30 minutes now. Sorry, I ran out of time. That's okay. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind emailing that to all of us. I can. Absolutely. That'd be awesome. Thank you, ma'am. Patricia Moeller. Good evening. Good evening. You could state your name and town you live in. My name is Patricia Muller. I live in Centerville. Thank you. I am the reading specialist at Centerville Middle School. I've been teaching at CMS for the past 20 years. First, I would like to state the obvious. I do not think virtual teaching is, is as effective as face-to-face. -face. I desperately wish to interact, instruct, help, and provide guidance to my students in person. But that does not mean that I believe this proposed hybrid model is the way to achieve this end. At this point, with COVID rates rising not only in Maryland but around the world and restrictions in place everywhere, pushing students into the schools for the sake of trying it out will put the health of many at risk and will prove to be a disservice to all involved. Students, teachers, parents, paraeducators, custodians, and administrators. I know we strive to do what's right and what's best for students, but hybrid is not the way. Considering that students are finally adapting to their virtual routine, introducing the hybrid one will only prove to complicate matters. Specific to CMS are concerns related to the health of the building. To 
provide my own personal example, when I began teaching there, I spent a year fighting case after case of bronchitis, regular bouts of coughing, which forced me to leave the classroom often, resulting in hairline fractures to my ribs. All of this culminated in an extremely painful case of pleurisy, inflammation to the lining of my lungs before finally seeing an allergist. I ended up being extremely allergic to mold and dust, which apparently is prolific at CMS. I began being treated with allergy shots, which went on for years. It was these allergy shots that saved my career as a teacher. So I've known all along how unhealthy the air and atmosphere at CMS has been due to the age of the building, multiple leaks that were left unfixed year after year, lack of air circulation, and erratic and extreme temperature fluctuations due to our outdated and poor HVA system, and ability to open windows to allow fresh air and sunlight to enter the building. Beyond this, we do not even have something as simple as hot water for effective hand washing. I say that to say this. I have seen other teachers suffer from similar ailments throughout the years there, and many of the symptoms are similar to those of COVID. When these symptoms appear, what are the teachers to do except report them, which will possibly, <clears throat> excuse me, which will possibly lead to quarantining until test results come through and we know the likelihood of obtaining substitutes to cover them. In addition, I fear that if there are students or staff in the building who have COVID but are not presenting, the condition of the building will only exacerbate the spread. Just a couple other points. Technology seems to be a problem with only a dozen people in the building. When we have Google Meets, it is the people in the building who cannot be heard because they glitch and freeze. Thank you for allowing me to express my concerns. I hope the information I provided will be used to help you make the best decision possible. Thank you. Would you please email that to all of us? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, appreciate it. town you live in? I'm Ann Neese. I live in Centerville. Thank you. I come to you this evening as a classroom teacher, a wife of another classroom teacher, a mother of students in our county, and as the building rep for Churchill Elementary School. While my colleagues and I have multiple questions and concerns, I've tried to narrow it down to the two or three that most directly impact the practicality of returning hybrid model. One of the main questions I've been asked and that I have myself has to do with quarantining and substitutes. According to the flow chart we've been given, if a teacher or a member of a teacher's household exhibits two or more of the COVID symptoms that are on the checklist, that teacher cannot return to the building until one of three things occurs. A doctor's note clearing a return to school, a negative COVID test, or a 10 day quarantine. All of these scenarios take time. It's that time that we as teachers are worried about. Don't get me wrong, I believe this flowchart is necessary. It's what we have to do to ensure the safety of everyone and that's more important than anything. However, the concern comes back to our kids. What will happen to the 50% of the children who are slated to come back face to face? Are there substitutes available? Will families be notified at a moment's notice that their child's schedule will be all virtual once again until their teacher has been medically cleared? It seems that that'll be adding more chaos, confusion, and upheaval once again to our families and our students. The second concern I wanna bring up this evening is a lack of electronic devices specifically within our building. So far this virtual school year, students in second grade and below in my building have not been issued any electronic devices and therefore have been using whatever their families have at their home. If we come back to a hybrid model, how will our students submit their work to us? Currently, as I said, these students and their families have used whatever electronic device they have in their households. A lot of times a tablet or even a parent's phone smartphone and how resourceful and generous our families have been. They've made it work. 
However, if we come back in a hybrid model, we can't expect pre kers through second graders to transport their family's devices back and forth to school. Certainly, they won't be bringing mom's cell phone into the building with them. Our teachers want to know what learning, teaching, and assessing will look like within the classroom when there are no electronic devices to use the Schoology platform. Finally, please don't mistake these questions and concerns from my colleagues and me with a desire to not be back with our kids. Truly, nothing could be farther from the truth. As I'm sure you know by now, teachers become teachers because we love kids. It's our passion, it's our calling. Kids are what make teaching great. They're what it's all about. And we wanna be back in our physical classrooms probably more than you know, but when it's safe and only when we can assure that it's what's best for our, their education and their emotional well-being. We can't, in good conscience, begin a whole nother way of learning without having questions answered and logistics worked out. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Would you send that to us, Ms. Ann? Sure. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you Appreciate so much. It. Do we have anyone else? Two more. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Ms. Mitchell? Cecilia Mitchell. Good evening. My name is Cecilia Mitchell. I'm a teacher at Graysonville Elementary School and I'm also the vice president of our association. I'm here tonight to talk about our future and what we're up against as we move forward and welcome. I want to first thank you all for all of your understanding and flexibility as we've been working through this process, the flexibility that you've offered to teachers um, with choosing their work site and what have you. It's really very appreciated personally um, for me. So um, just really quickly, you know, teachers worry about details, 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 checklists, what we're, how we're going to get through the day, the thousands of little decisions that we make each day for our students. Um, so I'm concerned, obviously, about the manpower issue um, with the shortage of substitutes. Um, other little teacher workload issues like with the shift um, hybrid, we have a virtual teacher. So one of um, my teammates will be the virtual teacher. The other teachers will be absorbing her homeroom roster that's not virtual. How's that gonna work with power school? How am I gonna take attendance? How am I gonna do the grades? All the questions that we start asking ourselves so that we can do our jobs effectively. I will say that um, today was the first day I've been in my building for months as I'm trying to get ready for Monday, um, assuming that that's the direction that we take. Um, and I just started with more questions. Do I need extension cords? Do I need power strips? What if they don't have their charger with them? What if they have an accident? They're little kids, you know? Um, they have to have a change of clothes. Um, they're gonna be carrying all that stuff back and forth in their backpack and they're really little and that's really heavy and where are they gonna put their backpack? And so. Um, what I'm really asking, I guess, is if we could have time to work out those nitty gritties, like for me, to have like a dry run of what arrival's gonna look like <coughs> with breakfast in the room and what if somebody spills something because they're babies and it happens all the time. And breaks and uh, having specials in the classroom and how's, how do I share that information with the specials teacher if she's teaching art and I don't have a webcam yet and I have to use my Chromebook and manage just all the little logistics can be a little overwhelming. So um, it would be nice if we could postpone this even till after the holidays, after everybody's had all their time with their family and we can be sure that they've had their two weeks to be sure everybody's healthy and then come on back and give us time to work through those little kinks. Does that mean my time is up? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm talking as fast as I can. Now listen, if you want to go to dinner and talk about this more, because there's a lot to be said and to figure out. And I know it's a monumental task and it's taken um, a tremendous uh, level of teamwork to get to where we are. And I think our teachers are extraordinary and I think our families have really stepped up in an amazing way. Um, having just finished conferences, you know, they're concerned with what it's going to look like and what their child's day is going to be and how, you know, how we're going to pull it off. So, but we'll do it together. All right, that's all. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy your evening. Coral Adams. Good 
University. Good evening. My name is Coral Adams Nichols. I live in Southersville. Um, I'm also, I'm a teacher at Southersville Middle School and I'm a parent of a Queen Anne's County High School student. And I'm a constituent which I feel like sometimes gets lost in the sauce. I'm a teacher, but I'm also a constituent of all of the people that were up here and were up for election yesterday. Um, should I keep this on or remove oh, it? How are you comfortable, ma'am? Okay. Um, so I came here and I wanted to talk about two main points. One is what hybrid learning is gonna look like in, in an actual classroom in Queen Anne's County. And two, I need to touch on the the um, attitude and the way that teachers are being viewed in Queen Anne's County in this current pandemic. Um, one, classrooms. We've had two days of teacher conferences. I've talked to a lot of parents and a lot of kids, some kids, and I've had to crush a lot of hope. And that's really not my favorite thing to do because I'm a teacher and we don't really crush hope, we build it. Um, but I've had to crush a lot of hope because there's a lot of parents and a lot of kids in this county that truly believe that on Monday, when they come into my classroom, according to the current hybrid plan, that they might not get to sit next to their friend, but that I'm gonna be able to stand next to their desk and help them. I have parents of special ed kids who are really convinced that I'm gonna do the things that I've always done for my special ed kids, like put a little sticky note on their desk with essential vocab words or some sentence starters in their English class. I have English language learners that are praying and hoping that I'm gonna be able to put a picture of picture vocabulary in front of them that they can look at so they can understand the content. And I've had to explain to all of these parents that that's not what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen on Monday is that your kids are gonna come in and they're gonna sit six feet apart in a classroom. They're not gonna get up for two hours because I have a double block. They are gonna log on to Google Meet and they're gonna learn virtually in my classroom because I'm responsible for more kids on the Google Meet than I am in the building. And I have, I'm, re I'm responsible and required to teach both the kids on the Google Meet that are home and the kids in front of me. And the only way that I can do that, that I can even think to begin to fathom to do that, is to have all the kids log on to the Google Meet and continue to teach as I have with some kids in the room and some kids at home. And there are some parents and some kids that are pretty devastated that they're still gonna have to battle Google Meet. We're st I'm in North County, so we're not gonna have any fewer connection problems on Monday than we do today. I've had kids that are in the building and I can't Google Meet with them when they're in the cafeteria and I'm upstairs because there's connection problems in the building with minimal children and teachers in the building. So all of the frustrations are gonna be the same and students are gonna be stuck at their desk, still pretty isolated, still far away from their friends, still not talking to people, and I can't go and stand behind them and point to their computer and say, no, you need to click that button. No, you need to click on that spot on Schoology. I can't do that. There's no traffic pattern in my classroom that would allow me or the students to be safe. So I'm gonna be teaching virtually with kids in my room, and there's some very disappointed parents, but I want, the parents and the board to understand that that's what hybrid learning looks like under the current plan. There's no other way for us to do this safely. Nobody likes it, but that's what we got. The second point that I need to address is that teachers, the majority of teachers in this county are residents, constituents, and the one that I keep, feel like keeps getting forgotten in these meetings is humans. And we have families. My mother is my childcare, so I have to be very concerned about if I pick up something from a student and my kid takes it to, the, to my mother. That's not a risk I'm willing to take. Um, I don't get plugged in at the front of the room like a computer and just charge. I go home to babies. I have a parent that's over 60 that I deal with daily. So I have legitimate health concerns about students coming into the building without a solid plan of what's gonna happen when they're sick, if they're gonna be able to be sent to the nurse's office. If the nurse's office is full, because we have a small office and there's only a small bubble of space, so if there's more than kids that are sick than that office can hold, where are they staying? In my room with me? Are they staying in the hallway? What's the plan? It's very concerning to me. Two years ago at the beginning of the year training, we went through, as all teachers in the county, we went through training on 
what to do if there's an active shooter in the building. And we've done that for a lot of years, and it's, it's really good. But we also did a training on how to pack a bullet wound, and we did a training on how to um, stop bleeding. And, and hold blood in, and I'm willing to do that. I will go in every day for strangers' kids. I will take their kids out of a building if a shooter shows up, and I will pack their wound. And if I get shot in the process, that's a risk I'm willing to take. I am not putting my infants at risk because it's inconvenient. I am not putting my mother at risk in this, for this virus because it's inconvenient. And that's where Myself and many teachers feel that the public and the board, that's, that's what you're expecting of us. That it's supposed to be okay that the people we love, when we're not loving on the kids in school, are at risk. And that's just supposed to be okay. Thank you. Thank you. What school is she? What school is she? Elementary. Elementary. Do we have anyone else, Ms. Spass? Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, the presentations at this time, uh, we have school enrollment, Mr. Evans. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Ms. Harper, Ms. Pauls, board members. So I'm here to just briefly discuss with you student enrollment, fall enrollment for 2020-2021. Um, I, I shortened it a little bit from what I normally do in the yearly in December. The, uh, they're not official until November 30th, once the state certifies that, and I'm happy to give you a more detailed report, but I know there's certainly some numbers that you want to look at tonight. Um, you know, basically we want to show you what we reported to MSDE as well as the, the elephant in the room, the number of students that have transferred to home instruction during all this. Um, we kind of want to look at the trends, talk about last year's data as compared to this year. So in short, um, the, the total number of enrolled students as of September 30th was 7,421. That is down 369 students compared to last year. Um, Money. Pardon me? Down from? Uh, it's down uh, 369 students from last year. So last year we had 7,790, this year 7,421. And looking at a, at a graph here, you can see we were, we were fairly flat. Um, you know, it wasn't changing a ton from year to year, but it was definitely a significant change in the fall of this year. And that's when I talk with, with my colleagues across the state, they're all experiencing the same thing. Um, is that percentage drop consistent across the state? It is. Ours, ours is pretty high for the number of students that have transferred to home instruction, but um, and it varies from from school district to school district. But it's definitely been significant. The, the overall information I'm hearing is that most school districts are a yes. That was a, a huge increase for us this year. I know Frederick County. I think there was a thousand students that transferred to home instruction. And when you say home instruction, you're talking about either homeschooling or going to private schools no just homeschooling so just homeschooling just homeschooling so are, are we uh, what about i know we have children that have lost our students that have gone to private schools out of is that number in this number too so yes i'll give you the numbers the, the number of how many transferred to home instruction which is i think around 300 and, and 334 but three but 379 is our total drop in enrollment 369. 69. And, and, I'll, and I'll have these numbers up here. Approximately 334 were transferred to home instruction. The others went to private school. <laughs> that was a good question. But yes, that, that's the, the vast majority did tran that we lost transferred to home, home schooling. Um, so again, we, we broke down the fall enrollment data for you by school, uh, looking over the past five years. Uh, what One thing that I noticed in the trend is that uh, the, the decrease is represented more in the elementary schools than it is in, in all the schools when you're looking at as compared to secondary, particularly uh, K through two. Um, looking at elementary school enrollment, and, and you can see the, the decrease in all the elementary, school, elementary schools, particularly uh, Graysonville, Ken Island Elementary, Mattapique Elementary. 
And then when you look at the middle school enrollment, it's there's a decrease in three of the four schools, and actually one school, Mattapique Middle, has an increase as compared to the last three years. But that's attributed to the fact they had a very small uh, eighth grade class last year that exited in a rather large sixth grade class that came in this year. Sixth grade is the largest class right now. Is that what I understand? In, yes, at Mattapique Middle. Or, I mean, across the across, county? Across, it could well be. I had, I didn't look at that It's always a year where we have a, a larger population of students. Yes, and we wonder what happened that year. Uh, high school enrollment, uh, again, it, it, you can see where, it, and, and actually Queen Anne's County has this anomaly, anomaly as well, is that they have increased their enrollment this year as compared to the last four years. And it's very similar to Mattapique. They had a large or a small uh, graduating class last year and a large incoming ninth grade class this year. Um, here's, here's the big data, the home instruction, schooling data by year. You can see the significant increase this year as compared to the past four years, both with students that fill out the form and we're going to monitor their instruction, which is twice a year, or if they register with an umbrella group that's, that's um, monitored by MSDE, but both significant increases. First group there that not monitored over 17. So those are so if a student is 18 years old, they haven't received their GED. Um, they can still have us monitor them if if they wish, but they're not required to by law. So uh, the compulsory attendance law is students five to uh, five to 18 or five to 17. Anybody over once you're 18, you're not you're not required to attend school. If in, in that law, of course, it changed from 16 to 18. So we used to not monitor students after they turned 16 on homeschooling, but now we do monitor 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, looking at the home instruction data by grade, uh, it increased in every single grade for this school year as compared to years past. And again, you see the more significant spike in kindergarten through second grade. Um, but ultimately, yes, it, it increased in, in all grade levels. And like I said, so the, the actual data will be official as of uh, November 20th, I believe. And, and again, I'm happy to come back and give you more detailed uh, breakdowns regarding uh, ethnicity, et cetera. But I know you wanted to see this data tonight and have lots of other things to discuss as well. And what are you going to have for November 20th? This, these are September 30th numbers. Right, right. So the actual, the MSD does not certify or make this, this date official until November 20th. Okay. okay. And then if, if you would like, I can give you more detailed presentation in December that has further breakdowns. Do anyone have any questions? No? Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Evans. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Mm. Next presentation is the status on staffing. Uh, update as of three o'clock this afternoon on staffing. We have several teachers, excuse me, several teachers who have taken the ADA accommodation, which is medical, and we have several teachers who have taken the CARES Act number five. We have 12 teachers all together that will be taking the number five and 25 ADA. We actually have 25 substitutes that have completed the substitute processing, which matches exactly the number we need. Now, however, I am not actually sure that all of them would want to take the positions that are available. Substitutes are temporary positions. Therefore, they have the luxury of deciding if they want to do high school, middle school, or elementary. Substitutes have been with us since it's been schools. They have the, a certain affinity for certain age groups. So the 25 that I have don't necessarily mean that's the 25 that will be matched exactly to what they would like to have. 
we are still taking subs. We sent out 171 invitations to substitutes that had been in our past employment as subs, but all of them have not responded back to us yet. And we will be waiting on that each and every day. Does anybody have any questions? Do we, and they, did, and the sub looking into this day, knowing that we're operating a little different than we did two years ago with this virtual learning and hybrid model going into effect and things like that, they understand it's not as it used to be. They certainly do. Um, when I sent out the invitation, I explained to them that one of the criteria would be that they had to be technologically savvy and willing to either learn with a department chair, school specialists or some people from central office. So it has to be some training with the Schoology or Google Meet. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bass. Status of Queen Anne's County Public Schools recovery plan update. The Tiger teams, are they in the hallway? Tiger team one, Miss Pullen, thank you. No, Maria is here. Is she here? And she closed it out. Found it. Mm -hmm. the right one. Good evening, Ms. Fellers. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Hello. Good evening, members of the board. I think Superintendent, Mrs. Pauls. Good evening. For the record, I am Carla Pullen. I'm serving as the interim chief operating officer. And with me is Mrs. Maria Lagares Fellers. She is our school health services coordinator, and we are co-managers for Tiger Team One facilities and operations. updates this evening. Building access and building utilization. Jackie, I don't believe this is the correct version. The update that we have this evening is use of individual equipment and supplies when feasible. And that is a recommendation uh, that we have made throughout our time with the Tiger team. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. If it is not feasible to utilize individual supplies, then here's what Tiger Team One recommends. Number one is that good hand hygiene would be essential. Number two would be to wipe down any type of shared items with disinfectant before and after use. And a third remedy would be to wear disposable gloves. We know that there have been concerns about the use of shared equipment. We know that there have been questions raised about whether it's acceptable to pass papers back and forth to one another. And while we stand behind the fact that we don't believe equipment should be shared, in some cases, the educational benefit is greatly going to outweigh the risk. There have been questions about whether soccer balls can be shared. That would be a very low risk item, especially if you're sanitizing in between. Something more along the lines of science equipment, definitely necessary 
to the educational program, it would need to be thoroughly cleaned and disinfected between use. But then the potential to do some sort of shared equipment would be there. If you recall, we also had some questions about food service. And our recommendation had been to serve food within the classroom as well as our public spaces. We're still maintaining that recommendation. The classroom would be the only time that the student would remove their mask while they were eating. That would be done then within that cohort. And it would maintain the same um, group of people together at the same time. <clears throat> this is done in a public space, such as a cafeteria in the gymnasium, our fear is that we could be transmitting the potential for the virus to everyone then that would be utilizing that space and not just to that classroom cohort. This doesn't apply to high schoolers though. High schoolers move around in different cohorts. They are moving around. So the cohorts at that point are more broken than what we initially recommended. Yes. Our next recommendation deals with cleaning and sanitizing. I wanted to bring you up to speed that cleaning and sanitizing protocols have gone out to the staff in all schools in the way of a recording. We'll be doing a town hall meeting tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. as well as one on Friday at 4 p.m. just to answer any questions that staff may have about what's happening in the buildings in terms of cleaning, in terms of sanitizing, and what they should and could expect. So are we asking students to clean their desks? I'll address that in, in okay, just a you. second with this one. I appreciate it. So there's a new classroom checklist that we have rolled out to the schools. We've met earlier this week with the custodians to look at all of the uh, recommendations as well as the expectations for them. The documents are now in place and should be utilized. So there should be a checklist affixed to every door so that everyone is able to see who has cleaned that space. Once the custodian signs off on that, the lead custodian will also sign off behind them so we know that there has been effective cleaning and sanitation for that day. All classrooms will be equipped with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer as well as alcohol sanitizing wipes. With the sanitizing wipes, we are saying that these are acceptable for students to use and it would be appropriate for them to help in wiping down their own desk and chair. Each classroom will also be equipped with Spectre 404, which is the disinfectant that we've noted to you several times that we utilize as part of our green cleaning program. We'll have wipes, disposable wipes for use with the 404, as well as proper PPE. The Spectre 404 is what we're asking staff to use only because it is a cleaner and disinfectant. We'll provide the gloves and the goggles that are recommended to be utilized. They're in every classroom. These are the Spectre 404 is appropriate if we're cleaning desks and chairs between class cohorts, as well as the high touch areas, such as light switches, doorknobs, things that we want to make sure that we're disinfecting between those cohort groups. And we want the Spectre 404 to only be used when students have vacated the space. Here's where we feel we give both students and staff a choice. There are alcohol sanitizing wipes that can be used to spot clean in between groups. There's also the Spectre 404, so that someone may use either depending on their comfort level but that way we will have both options available in the classroom. A question at the end of the um, morning session, then that's when, if, if you're in like elementary where they're there the full time, that's when that gets cleaned and the, like the light switches and all that, right? And, so and during the day. Doing that. Yep. So during the day in our elementary schools, every hour, we're asking the daytime custodian to spot clean all of those high touch surfaces in the public areas. So again, our light switches, our door handles, anything that students will touch on their way from class to class. The students and staff will then spot clean their own desks in the elementary area, their chairs and the high touch surfaces in the classroom. So we're asking them to be responsible in elementary school for their classroom since we can't have a custodian in there every moment with them. At the secondary schools, it changes just a little bit. So after every class change, we will then ask the daytime custodians to do that spot clean in the, the main areas. And then students and staff will also spot clean their desk, their chairs and the high touch surfaces. Yes, sir. In the event of uh, a more catastrophic development, like a student uh, with nausea, et cetera, 
Uh, will the classrooms be evacuated so this can be cleaned up and then returned? I, I know that this is, you know, it's the way my mind works. Look at the worst thing that can happen. And are we ready with at least some way of dealing with that? Yes, so we've thought about that. First of all, the nursing staff inside the school will be employed to make the decision as to what the necessity is for that. We are able to do a sanitation with our electrostatic machines during the day. The problem becomes we have a cohort of students who potentially have been exposed to somebody who's symptomatic. Now where do we take them within the school? That will be made by a case-by-case -case basis, and that will be the nursing staff that will help. But yes, in the event that a space needs to be sanitized during the day, such as our nursing suites, they will be after a symptomatic patient has vacated. We're getting into flu season. It may have nothing to do with COVID, but it may have everything to do with something on the floor. The next update I have for you is for transportation. We have provided at the end of last week all of the bus routes to the schools and to the LLCs. Changes are continuing to occur at the school level and we have to make adjustments as those come in to us. As of today at noon, we've asked all of the school buildings to finalize those changes so that we can get the routes set and the final routes and notification out to students and to parents. The ultimate cost is about pretty much the same as what it would have been. That's correct, because we're running the same routes just with half our capacity. As I mentioned last week, we've determined that because of incidents that have happened in other counties in Maryland, that the seat behind the bus driver will remain empty. We've adjusted our bus plans to reflect that, and we have no issues in accommodating 50% capacity. And there have been some questions as to how the buses will be loaded. Tiger Team 1 has recommended from the beginning that we load from the back to the front and then unload the opposite way, from the front to the back. And this just... Um, assures that students aren't passing one another unnecessarily. Food service, the grab and go locations for both breakfast and for lunch are uh, solidified with Sodexo. They are now coordinating with schools and with our principals as to how that will happen in each building. And just a reminder that food service is available after all of our sports practices that are occurring right now that is free of charge to all of our students. And we hope that everyone will take advantage of that. With that, I am going to turn it over to Ms. Fellers. Let me ask you one question. Sure. And I guess just for a lack of terminology, security, we'll have wipes and all this sanitizer in each room. Yes. Uh, who's going to check to make sure that's there every day? I'm not saying anybody is going to take a box of wipes with them, but in this day and age, somebody, you know, the thing's half empty, and all somebody says, well, I'm going to take one home with me. I mean, do, do we have a protocol to make sure that that room is either there when they, not when they leave, I'm not worried that as much as when they get there, so there's adequate supplies in that room for everybody, because I'm sure we just can't leave this thing, it'd be like leaving a box of cereal at the Walmart and, sure. you know, be gone. Sure. So we have a PPE coordinator that's been identified in each school. So they are keeping track of our inventory and what is accessible to everyone. Our request would be that the classroom teachers, if they see that they're getting low on something, or if they find when they come into the classroom in the morning, they let their PPE administrator in the building know so that we can get that supply out to them, or they can uh, let the board office know that they need replenished. But there'll be a contact at each school. Yes, there is already a contact that we could in place. get in touch with that they'll be aware of that they can get something. I mean, the board's calling this board's fine, but that might be a two-hour exactly. process. No, it would go through the school and to that PPE administrator first. It would be right there on the spot to get yes. something taken. Okay. Yes. So I have a couple. Oh, go, go ahead. No. Tra on uh, training, you know, I see this as like when we open Monday that there would be, you know, some training done to the students, you know, that the first day they're in there about these are the kinds of things we'll have. I imagine you've worked this out with the principals to do that kind of a thing so they know what, what to expect. Uh, yeah, these kinds of things. Is this in your um, training program you have for them? Yes, we outlined pretty much the same thing that I've given to you this evening, um, how that process is going to look and that we are asking students and staff within their classroom to be responsible for their classroom right. and how that would look. And we do feel that the wipes, um, they make it the easiest for the students to help participate in that. And we know that they are safe. It's, it's essentially hand sanitizer. Ms. Morris, do you have any questions? 
today, I mean, we're still getting emails from teachers saying they don't have supplies, they don't have PPE. Yes, so there are large <coughs> numbers, quantities going out today, tomorrow, and Friday to all of the buildings. So deliveries are in process. So by Monday? Yes, we have everything in stock and in our buildings. Mr. Anderson, do you have any questions? So, um, as Ms. Moore said, said, we are, the board is receiving a lot of emails from people in the buildings. I just received a picture of one of the teacher's bathrooms at one o'clock today that was not cleaned. Okay. You know, we're asking also our custodians to now take on even more responsibility in between classrooms and then still try to keep up with our regular cleaning process. Yes. It's daunting, and we don't have enough staff, and you know it, we know it, everybody knows it. It's the elephant in the room. I know parents that are gonna have extreme problem with their students having to clean the desks, even though they, their students were at that desk. And you know, it's just, it, it, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say it, it's, well, some people are not going to want to do it. Yeah, I'm not going to I'm, want I'm to. I'm just look. I'm just throwing out all the scenarios that are possible with anybody bringing their students into the schools. But if you eat at a table and you make a mess, you spill, you wipe it up. I mean, there's some common sense in this mm -hmm. thing. Not everybody, dear. Well, we're sir, try to not everybody. It. Anyway, um, I want to address the issue about Centerville Middle School's air quality. Yes. I mean, you brought it was brought up to us just a few minutes ago. Yes. Are we addressing that issue? We are. So we received the same email, and as typical protocol. We've done an inspection. There was nothing evident to the eye that we were able to find in terms of any type of mold. But as is typical, we have employed uh, an air quality specialist who will be doing sampling. We're waiting to schedule that right now. Um, as soon as the results are available, we'll make those available to the principal to disseminate to the staff. If there are any issues at that time, we'll be sure that we remediate. Um, and, and we'll go from there. But yes, we are on top of that. In the meantime, we're changing filters and trying yes. to keep sure that the air quality is. Yes. And, I, think I recall we had an issue with this a few years back too. Mr. Dunn was in the building. Were you around then? Mm -hmm. And we, we had to do that re-evaluation. To do the evaluation? I believe yes. so. Yeah. And yes. We work on fixing it. The yes. Mold. It was a mold issue, I, I thought. Yes, at this time, there are no active roof leaks. We've been able to check for that. We were able to check for visible signs of mold. We've cleaned all of the carpets once again um, and are not finding anything to the eye that would indicate that that's present. So we will have the air quality testing done to give everyone some peace of mind. Well, you and I both know that mold isn't always available to the eye. You're so. correct. Um, you already answered about the wipes. Okay. I'm sir? sorry. I just wanted to add that if mold is found... The Into the mic, please. Oh, I will. Uh, if mold is found, it's going to be a very expensive track down and repair because it gets into this everywhere. It's not it's the first time out. a building's had it. So I hope I, it isn't there. Eight, I remember Remedies. Bayside years ago. We had a lot of issues there. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Fellers. So for the component from School Health Services, um, some of the key issues that we wanted to um, identify and sh or that have been identified and shared is um, communication with staff and family of all of the various things that we have put in place. Many of the questions that are coming to us are because um, you know parents, the guardians, the staff just need more information. Um, so that is one of the things that we identified that needed to be addressed um, quickly. So for communication with with staff and family, and I apologize, they're not able to see it up there, but um, for staff accessibility specifically, um, there is a drive, a shared drive that has been created and um, it will be pushed out this evening or uh, tonight or tomorrow. Um, and in that drive are the district uh, protocols, guidelines, documents, and resources so that staff members can um, access all of that information. Obviously, it, um, the editing components like the templates, the notification letters for the community and schools for outbreaks or you know um, cases would only be 
accessible to certain staff, but um, a teacher would be able to access that information and say, hey, what's my policy for COVID-related blah, blah, blah. Um, so that is going to be available um, for everyone to view. Uh, it's also a handy tool for the administrators um, and for um, you know the AP um, folks in the building because if one is not present and the other one is, they can go into the document documents and see, okay, this is what our school does. There's a folder that has building specific information, so specific to that, that to that particular entity, whether it's a rise or you know Church Hill Elementary School. There is um, a folder that has resources, um, infographics that teachers and staff can print and use from the CDC. They're colorful. Um, there's a section that has. Um, everything from the health room components. So if a teacher needs to lost her health room visit process that was taped to the wall, she would be able to pull that up relatively quickly. Um, and so I, I do feel that that's going to hit a huge, um, it's gonna put a huge piece of the puzzle in there for the staff um, and for the administrators. Um, Has some of this been at PD, you know, professional development? Some of this been, oh, yes. so this isn't, wouldn't be like very first This is time. not the first it time. just makes it one compact thing. So. Everybody can go in there. The nurses, um, I, I can't speak for the substitute staff, but um, the nurses can access it, the principals, the coaches. Oh, and that's the other piece. We, um, the, the folks that created the shared drive, we put in our pieces, the big pieces. So this will be pushed out to the athletics folks. And so any specific COVID athletic policies, procedures, guidelines, graphics, um, screening forms will be in that one space. Um, special education, they'll be able to put their components in there. So I think it's it's going to allow for cross covering with you know the staffing shortages and things like that um, to be a little more um, it'll be user friendly. So will it be something similar like that to go out to the parents because um, yep we'll, okay yep we'll wait we got that. You <laughs> um, and so that's the, so that's that piece for communication with staffs uh, with staff members. The next piece we identified was communication with the families um, and so QACPS COVID-19 guidelines for turning for 50% capacity in person um, instruction, we are going to distribute that information. So we're gonna share with the parents a document. Um, it's the COVID-19 awareness and parent guardian acknowledgement of self-screening and consent to participate guidelines. So everything is gonna be in that document. It has um, the screening process. It has symptoms to look out for. It has our um, face mask policy. It has it addresses mask exemptions. It addresses um, teaching because a key piece of public health and community health is teaching the community. Um, there are, for those folks that receive it through the internet or via email or text, um, hyperlinks that they'll be able to click into that puts them into, for example, the Maryland Department of Health FAQ. It also will click them into um, the Maryland Department of Health like te lo testing locations. So they would just put in their zip code and um, how far they're willing to travel and it will share with them testing locations and their hours and all that good information. It has links to um, additional CDC resources, travel advisories for each state. It has the governor's information in there as well. Um, so it's all in that one document. Now for folks that don't have internet access and to address um, uh, folks that may have disabilities with um, processing the, the documents in that format. Our plan is to distribute it in the form of a, a, a robocall um, and a school messenger, um, <coughs> Spanish and English. Um, all of these documents, by the way, that I'm addressing today, that I'm mentioning today, excuse me, are going to be um, made um, available in Spanish as well. Um, in fact, one of them ha has already been done. We, we didn't want to distribute it until we could distribute it both at the same time. Um, so we're just waiting on the other one to be um, translated. How soon will all of these documents be ready to go? So our goal is to get this out ASAP. And, and by ASAP, I mean like tomorrow or the day after um, or, or through the weekend at the latest. Obviously, uh, so you're asking. Okay, so this, if I could pull it up, I could show you. Oh, there it is. Wonderful. If you could click. Um, and I, I don't want to read the whole thing because there's lots of Tiger teams to still present. But you'll see that 
there's the section that has the hyperlinks, the bullet points at the top there. What, uh, what you should know about COVID-19 to protect yourself and others from the CDC. What you can do if you are at higher risk of severe illness for COVID-19 from the CDC. Coronavirus disease 2019 frequently asked questions. That's that FAQ that I mentioned. That is a wonderful document. It has lots of information. Um, and then the last one is um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, uh, which is MISC. Uh, and that is one of the key um, complications that they're seeing in children. So the parents are going to go into this with eyes wide open. Would you please, um, I also see on here the COVID-19 SY21 health room visit process. I think I had the wrong. And the COVID-19 SY21 notice of illness along with this. Can you send that to all of the board members so that Absolutely. we could, I mean, we need to see what everybody else is seeing. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, yeah. if this has some of the questions, answers some of the questions, especially the health room visit. Mm -hmm. Where are we quarantining a cohort if everyone is infected? I mean, that, I, I know that's a In principle. that case, that, that's room a would become our, that room would become our space. Like we would, we would make that the space and, to, and, and dismiss students from that space. We wouldn't be having them walk through the entire Are we building. talking about putting them in the gym? Are we talking about putting them, you know, No, no, if, the if, we've identified, if we've identified that that room, that space is where the issue is. They stay there. They, they would stay there. Yeah, we would not want to traipse them through the school building. Um, if it's, the, if we're, if you're, what you're describing is an entire class, like Mr. Anderson said, oh, they've thrown up and now the whole class has been exposed. Correct. We have a process. If it meets the criteria for uh, isolating, I mean, excuse me, for identifying all of those class members, as close contacts, then we would keep them there and dismiss them from that space. Again, some of them, if they're in a high school building, they would have to go from upstairs all they're the way done. down. They're done. They're in that space. They're not moving. <laughs> yeah. I noticed this form, too, this form in particular. You know, we get a ton of these forms the very first day of school, so... Mm -hmm. This is going to be something every parent will receive and have to re uh, get back to their so-called homeroom. To address, I will. I'll take your question as well. To address that, so we talked about emailing this or sending it as a, through, you know, accessible through the person's cell phone. We talked about disseminating it through school messenger, um, through a, you know, phone call that reads the information to them because we recognize that sometimes there are vision issues, you know, um, learning disabilities that doesn't allow them to process it. Um, we, the plan is to also on the first day of school, just like we. In the olden days, we used to do the student handbook, and you had the syllabuses. You had to say, hey, take this to mom. She's got to sign it and bring it Thank back. You. That's the process. We're going old school here. We're going to do that process. They have until the, the Friday to turn this in. Um, now, this is good stuff because the principals are hearing this for the first time as well today um, because we, we had to obviously have this reviewed by legal, and it needed to you know be tweaked and everything. So it is going to be something that Matt is going to reach out to the principals and, uh, and go over for exactly how this process is going to be disseminated. Go ahead, Mr. Anderson. Can you take this all the way to the end? Absolutely, sir. Um, so let me hit the points, if I may. Right. Uh, so the next piece is the guidelines. So the parents are going to be um, seeing the key guidelines that pertain to their student participating in face-to-face -face instruction. Um, it talks about considering the health risks for their family. Um, you know the possibility that you know you're aware that such a, such exposure can occur. And and the reason we put that in there is because, and I keep saying this every time, is that the risk of COVID-19 spreading in a school is directly related to the level of COVID-19 spread in the community and safety measures in the school. So we have to acknowledge that there is that risk, there is that possibility. Uh, and then we encourage them to communicate with their physician. And that addresses the piece where um, one of the questions that was brought up was, well, what about those folks, that do, the students that have the high risk, who have the comorbidities? So this guides them to please you know, go back and speak to your child's physician or to the family practitioner. Um, it talks about the cloth mask, you know, that you should work with your child at home, and that is the expectation, hand hygiene, physical distancing, all that good stuff. Um, it talks about what we expect is their responsibility, that you, they will only send their child to the school building or activity if they are not exhibiting any signs and symptoms of COVID, and the symptoms are listed below, sir, um, or if they have not been exposed to someone with COVID-19 or someone suspected of having COVID-19 in the past 14 days. So that's very concrete. Um, that they're going to review the symptoms with their child and monitor um, their child's temperature every day, that the child attends in-person instruction or any 
activity that's school related. Uh, and that students should not attend in-person instruction or participate in any of those activities if their temperature is 100.4 or higher. It talks about, you know, if the child becomes ill while in school, you mentioned that, sir they are agreeing to the fact that they are going to ensure that they will pick up their child promptly. Students who are not ill are not, excuse me, students who are ill are not permitted to be transported home via the school buses. So if your child gets sick at 3 p.m. or 2.55 p.m. and they are identified as having COVID-19 like symptoms, we are not supposed to put that child on a school bus with the other children to go home, obviously. So we want the parents to go into this with their eyes wide open. That means have a plan A, have a plan B, have a plan C. Um, there will be instances where let's say you cannot make it in that time. That's where your plan B will come into effect. Uh, and I'm sure there's gonna be questions of like, well, what about if the parent just refuses to come pick up the child or cannot pick up the child? Um, there have been discussions with um, the, PP, uh, the PPWs and um, the SROs uh, to, to consider that and, and it's already been in effect. Highly recommend everyone having a backup person. Yeah. And I don't the, mean a plan contact. A and B, a I mean, C and a D. <laughs> as our contact list, I mean someone yes. who's allowed to pick they up their student. They need to be, up, and this is the, per, I don't even know which camera I'm supposed to look at, but this is the personal plea to the parents and guardians in the community. Please, please, please update your contact information. Please provide information that is current and advise the, po the folks that you're putting on that list because sometimes parents will put people down and not notify that person and they won't know, they won't recognize the number, I'm not answering that. And then our two or three or four other contacts they've provided to us, they won't answer, they won't acknowledge. Um, and then we're still back to square one of not being able to reach someone. It's kind of thing we already have for regular, you know, when a kid gets sick, they call the parents. That is an expectation. No one rides home on a bus. So right, right. There's no change. As as right, that is the expectation and now we just want to make it clear um, and then that they will notify the school um, that their child attends um, as soon as they're aware that their child has tested positive for the virus that causes COVID-19 or that their child has been exposed to a person to the best of their ability obviously um, and then I acknowledge sir that there's um, if you have specific because this is a piece that MDH has put down to us that we have certain responsibilities of what we have to share to the public and to the parents so I share information about the health department. Um, we put information um, of the symptoms and then, you know, that they are reading this and they're acknowledging that we've shared this information with them. And then the principals, we're gonna task them with following up and tracking down who has not turned it in, just like those syllabus forms and just like the old student handbooks. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Anderson. I was, the reason I wanted to go to the end to see if somebody had to sign, because it reads like a contract. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we're going to get many of these back. Well, it's a consent to participate guidelines, and that is a bridge we will have to cross and consider as well. And, and this has, um, Mrs. Falls, you can step in, right? This, um, our legal team has reviewed this, and it is in for consideration. But if it's something they're used to seeing and signing off on, but this, this kind of goes a long way. The expectation is that we're supposed to step up our game. I'm challenging the parents to step up their game, too. Mm -hmm. And other counties are using this, a similar format. They are having parents to sign off as well as employees. And parents are using used to signing on these in the, in the beginning of school. Even for yeah. athletics, you, you, you know, you've you read it all many, over. How many since, COVID, uh, not COVID signings? Not COVID specific, but the exact what same. It's all about. They can yes, remain virtual. Sir, the the yes. nice thing is we're not saying they cannot participate in education. We're saying that if that's just not your cup of tea, this is not an option that you're willing to consider, then we definitely will proceed with virtual for them. They were going to be required to sign this, and if they, I mean, it's a resp social Smith. responsibility on both sides. So there's a social responsibility on both sides. So if these parents want the children in school, then this can be one of the things they have to cohere to. And if they don't, then they go back to virtual. I mean, I think we need to sit there and be very strict on that to protect our staff, Teachers. other students, yeah. and our, everybody. The bus drivers, the bus drivers. You know, I mean, we, we've got a lot of people staff. we're responsible for, and okay. if the people are not going to be socially responsible, if if they wanted to come back into school uh, in this time, that's something that people are have to adhere to. Very we're strictly. Held, we're being held to a very high standard. And, 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 and I think we should, but we have a lot of, you know, we have, we're <laughs> taking a big responsibility in opening up these schools mm -hmm. and people have to be 100% behind us too to, to work with us. And I think there's no question that somebody gets this and if they aren't willing to sign it, mm -hmm. then you're willing to be virtual. Right. I, 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 we really tried to hit, but keep in mind that we also hit the points that we were mandated to hit. Mm -hmm. um, the 
Department of Health and um, MSDE gave us specific things that we had to place in a document like this. So can this support, I need to ask this because I've had this from a couple teachers. Why isn't it that uh, the health departments aren't requiring everyone to have a COVID test before coming into the buildings to begin with? I mean, students and, and staff, why are we you testing? You can't mandate testing. You can't mandate testing. Testing, it's a voluntary thing. I mean, if, okay. if you get sick and you assume it's the flu, no one's telling you you have to go get swabbed to make sure it's the flu. You assume and you stay home. And, and that's the big thing. If you're sick, stay home. And keep in mind, we're not the army. We're not the military. Those are different. Those are exceptions where those kind of things can be. You can't mandated, impose medical treatment on somebody who does not want it. In the military, but not but this. In, not in this. In this setting, you and, cannot impose. And some impose. employers, some employers could do that. But just keep in mind that that employee also has the right to say no. I don't think so, and then seek employment elsewhere. And and you let them know ahead of time. This is the expectation that I, as an employee, this is my expectation of the things you're agreeing to. Yeah, I'm still not would crazy about them not being, not having temperature checks when coming to the building. But I mean, I can't do anything about that. Dr. C. Atola, did you talk to him? We did speak to him today and we did pose that question and he said he thinks we're okay with what we're doing. He did recommend that uh, visitors to the building take a temperature check. Yep, so we'll set up stations at the doors. But employees will have to sign something very similar to this. Mm -hmm. And then each day they will have to check in to make sure that they have signed it and they have none of those symptoms. So it'll be like a cross check for them as well too. So it'll be for employees and for children as well. Because right now they're, they're completing that one sheet anyway that they have no symptoms. This should be a little bit easier. I know in some of our neighboring counties, the day doesn't begin until everyone has completed that, that sign off for everyone in their building. And, and to address, because now you've jumped from the students to the staff. So this is the student's version. Let's go to... May I question, a uh, question about the student version? So you've got A, B, A day, B day. The A kids will come in Monday. When are they expected to return with their form? T Tuesday or the following Monday? So the final turn-in will be... Oh, so you mean for the, the Thursday, Friday crew? So if my child comes Monday, he should bring the form back the next day. You should bring it with him on Monday in instead of waiting a whole week. To yeah, bring. Let, let me talk with Matt about that to see because you're right, that does change. And, and my Thursday, Friday crew, the kids that come in on Thursday, It'll Friday, be a week. will need, yeah, and I think he was going to give a whole week yeah. for that to be turned in, just like it's usually done with the syllabus okay. and things like that. And in the meantime, yeah. you could have a COVID case. Well, I in, mean, yeah. it's possible. Which is why we're sharing the information now. And okay. the information, um, I know for some parents and guardians, this information is new, um, but I know the health department is doing a great job of um, informing our citizens and the public. So I feel like most of this information is not new, just the general signs and symptoms and the physical distancing and um, you know the limiting signature. interactions. And so it's the, the signature, signature chart. chart will be new. Oh, that piece, yeah. right, right. No, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about the information, Sharon. Oh. No, you're absolutely right. Yep, that is true. So, so the next piece is the employee acknowledgement of QACPS building access screening, but something to go back to the parent guardian self-screening process. We are implementing weekly reminder notifications to complete the daily temperature screening checks and symptom screening, along with the, re we're reiterating the criteria for exclusion and for your child remaining home in weekly phone, um, uh, weekly notifications. So Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, it's going to be sent out as a weekly reminder. It's going to go out once a week and we've, they've chosen Sunday Sunday afternoon um, for that time. So the employee acknowledgement, this, is, as um, Mrs. Pauls mentioned, addresses the self-screening acknowledgement building access guidelines for our employees moving forward. So it explains what the expectation is of the employee when they come to work every day. Uh, you know, I will self-screen at home prior to arriving at the workplace. This includes performing a temperature check and symptom self-screening to determine if they have COVID-19 symptoms. The symptoms are listed at the bottom of this form. That you'll proceed to the workplace if you're able to attest that you're fever-free at that moment when you've taken the temperature and we define the fever and that they're free of COVID symptoms at that time and that they are able to reply to no, or reply no to the following screening questions. Uh, since last at work, are you waiting for a COVID test, been diagnosed, et cetera, et cetera? 
Arizona. It talks about in the last 14 days, have you had close contact within six feet cumulative? It has the new updated guidances in there um, with anyone diagnosed with COVID-19 or suspected of having COVID-19. And I say this every time, these questions weren't pulled out of thin air. This, these questions were created by the CDC and by the school ent entities because something happened to generate this question being created. So upon arrival at the workplace at the entry point, they're going to agree to sign the log sheet. It's going to be changed in that we're going to add a little piece that says, you know, here's the one form taped to the table or to the wall or, you know, a big poster that says, okay, I've read all of that. I can answer no, 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 and I don't have any symptoms. And then by signing that log sheet, you're, that's our attestation that you've done your self-screening. Um, Each morning they're going to do that? Yeah. When they come in. Yeah, it's, well, they already do that now, but this just solidifies and it's something that they can put on the fridge and it's, you know, it shows that they are, you know, committed to, to doing this. Uh, and it cuts back and saves a few trees because those forms were killing trees left and right. <laughs> um, the Girl Scout in me hurts. Um, so it talks about, a, you know, the sign-in sheet. It talks about the face covering expectation, face mask. It talks about physical distancing so that we don't have an employee saying, hey, I didn't know about that. No one ever told me about physical distancing. We're taking care of that. Um, it talks about the risks that they you know, are taking. You know, it, It's right there for them to see. And it does talk about, okay, well, let's say if I do answer no or I have to I mean, answer yes to one of those questions or I do have a symptom. It talks about if your initial temperature check and symptom self-screening performed at home results in a positive screening, i.e. if you have any of the signs and symptoms of COVID or you answer yes to those questions listed above. I will not proceed to the workplace, but will instead contact my direct supervisor or administrator for additional direction and guidance. Um, and again, these are new documents. We're gonna, we're gonna go over it with the employees and the administrators um, in the next day or so to make sure everybody's on the same page. It talks about the Maryland Department of Health recommendations that you do reach out to your healthcare provider. Don't sit on those symptoms at home alone. And it talks about um, monitoring your temperature every day because that's a piece that really, physicians are like, really, you're not taking your temperature every day and you think you have COVID symptoms? So it encourages that. And in, if they're not able to reach their direct supervisor or their administrator, it gives them an alternate person to contact for additional guidance. We have some hyperlinks that are in here because this is a piece that's mandated as well that we really want to make sure we hit is if you have specific questions regarding COVID-19, you can contact the healthcare provider. You can contact our local health department. I listed the call center um, times that they are open along with an email that they can email the, health, the call center folks directly. And then hyperlinks similar to what was shared with the parents uh, so that they have the information. And I really do, the FAQ is my favorite piece out of all of those. And the final piece is COVID testing for our staff because that is one of the biggest frustrations that I hear from our staff is I can't find a place that'll test or, or you know that's open because you're not open 24/7. And so this you put in again your zip code and you put in how far you're willing to travel and this will tell you where in this state and um, then there's other hyperlinks within that to take you to other states. So let's say you're traveling for vacation or whatever and the signs and symptoms they're listed here and there's the acknowledgement piece, Mr. Anderson, at the bottom there. So that is a huge piece of communication for our staff and our students. We go on to then the next question that we hear, the, you know, the st staff and parents asking is, so what if we have a probable case in the school building? What if we have a student that we've identified <coughs> symptoms? We're not making this stuff up. We are taking it directly from the documents provided to us by the Department of Health and by the Department of Education. Response to a laboratory confirmed case of COVID-19 and personal with COVID-19 like illness. You can click, I'm sorry, I'm looking at it here and I'm assuming it's up there, my apologies. There it is. So this walks us through the process step by step. It talks about the CDC definitions of it was a case definition, a probable case. So, what's, so if you've got your COVID designee that's covering and helping the nurse out, what's a probable case, what's, a, what's an actual case? It talks about um, outbreaks and how we communicate that to the staff and the community and the parents. You can just keep scrolling down. It talks about notification of contacts who must quarantine, isolation, exclusion, return to school. These are all available on the student process map and those are pieces that are going to be either going home with the students ahead of time. I mean, excuse me, being sent out ahead of time. Um, are, are they listed on the website still, Mrs. Falls? I think I'll check with my information officer. 
And it, good, so they still are on the website. Now this piece is a decision aid because we have the employee process map and we have the student process map that are Queen Anne County public school specific documents created to address that very question of what do we do if a kid gets sick in school or a staff member does. But then we also can fall back on the standard provided by Maryland Department of Health and MSTE. So if we're looking at our process map, the student process map, the employee process map, and we can't answer it using those tools, this is our gold star go-to. So we would utilize this information here to walk us through the process. I like this document better, I will admit. Um, it's very easy to use. It's got the arrows that take you directly. Um, the nurses are gonna have all of these color coded in their COVID binders. It's available on that shared drive for the administrators to do with what they wish. Um, I, I do like this document. It's very concrete, very easy to read. So there it is. So to answer your question, what are we going to do when we have a case? That information is there and it's available. Well, the question you always gets is if somebody has a, how long is the 10 days? Is the start of the day that they found out they had it or 10 days after they have finished having the symptoms? I mean, there's always that question. Madam, where is that? Sorry. Contact tracing. When we get a positive, our first question is when did your symptoms start? And then we take it two days prior to that. If they're not symptomatic, it's two days prior to their positive test. So it, it depends on if they're symptomatic or not. And if they're positive test, then there's an isolation period until their symptoms have resolved or their temperature. They've been temperature free or fever free for, I believe it's 24 hours now. Mm -hmm. It was it's three days changed, before, now right. it's changed. Mm -hmm. Or they have a negative test. The negative test, but if they're still symptomatic and they've been exposed to a positive, we still treat them as if they're positive. And the terms that she's throwing around are not something that come naturally to most administrators and most teachers and so forth. So in the shared drive, the COVID binder, so to speak, or the playbook as the nurses have called it, um, has CDC infographics, photos. One section says, what is quarantine? What is isolation? What is the recommendation for? And it's, so there, it's all in there. So that if they do have a question that one of um, the administrators or HR or myself or their school nurses, because don't forget, you've got a wonderful resource in each building. Um, if they can't answer it, they can go into this qu and quickly get those answers. Um, a positive test, they will be referred for contact tracing through, this, okay. through the Maryland Department of Health. It, and, and I actually am gonna build on what she just said, because um, the next question that a lot of parents and guardians and staff have asked is, okay, so what about notification of close contacts of person who are, persons who are confirmed to have COVID-19 and for close contacts of persons with COVID-19-like illness? Um, so there's pieces that kind of, there's a piece that start, or a part of the puzzle that gets put into place very quickly, and then there's the next one that falls into place. So the school begins the process for identifying close contacts and begins the notification process to expedite the contact tracing investigations. And I say in collaboration with the health department, oftentimes we start that process obviously within our building, and then we roll it over to the health department, what, you know, if the case is identified as positive, or if the school nurse identifies some very key components that need to be followed up on. So for example, if that staff member has um, multiple counties being affected. So let's say we have an employee who works in our county, lives in another county, whose wife works in a third county, and whose kids go to two different, so that's a piece, I would pull the health department in and say, hey guys, we got a lot of moving parts, um, how, do we, how do we go about addressing this quickly? So the health department will communicate directly with anyone requiring isolation and quarantine, that's the piece you just said. Uh, QACPS will communicate with the affected school communities while maintaining the health privacy of those directly affected. Uh, and so that's the piece where in that shared drive, there are templates, there are letter templates. So if, if we have to send out a community notification, if we need to send out a notification to that school building staff, if we need to notify parents of close contacts, like your child is identified as a close contact, um, those are all template uh, letters that are templated into that shared drive. So when would we have to shut down a school? That's what a question I keep getting from some parents. There is outbreak criteria criteria and let's see if I can pull that up. Is on. it I mean if we have one or two cases here or there 
Yeah, so let me let me get through this. There was an outbreak. And I'm will, sorry to bring it up ahead of time. It's just no, 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 we'll, something's been asked. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good question. So we have guidance for that, um, and it's very specific. So it talks about, and I read that to you, like the not the last meeting because I wasn't here, but the meeting prior. That's that piece I read to you about um, what is the class uh, outbreak, what is a cohort outbreak, and what is a... Um, district outbreak. Okay. So those are clearly explained. Okay. Is it in that document? Because I'll just read that. It is in our shared drive. So I'm going to pull that up. And I don't, you won't be able oh, to pull You know what? Just here. send it to all of us okay. if you wouldn't mind. Well, the public, I mean, if, if I have the time, I can address it. I'm sure that that is a question that the public has. So let's answer that right now. And so I'm a teacher and I want to know what's a, what is an outbreak defined? How is an outbreak defined? And so I go into that shared drive that I have access to. I look on here and I, I'm going to look for, is it resources? No, it's COVID positive uh, classroom and school protocol. So we click on that. And it's in the document, you can't see it, but it's right there. It says protocols for outbreaks in classrooms, cohorts, or schools. And it talks about, you know, per the Maryland Department of Health, School Health Services Division, COVID-19 guidance and return to school. That version was October 1st. Outbreak definitions, a classroom or a cohort outbreak. Two or more laboratory confirmed COVID-19 cases among students, teachers, and staff with the onsets within a 14-day period. And as you mentioned, if they were asymptomatic cases, we use the collection date as our time frame. Who are epidemiologically linked, but not household contacts. But not what? But not household contacts. So in the case of a classroom or cohort outbreak, learning of that class or cohort will be 100% virtual for the next 14 calendar days. So there's your answer, Mrs. Harper. Thank you. That's the plan for that. For the school outbreak, three or more classrooms or cohorts with cases from separate households that meet the classroom cohort outbreak definition above, meaning the classroom cohort definition, that occurs within 14 days or 5% or more unrelated students, teachers, and staff have confirmed COVID-19 within a 14-day period. A minimum of 10 unrelated students, teachers, and staff is what it breaks down to. And in the case of a school outbreak, learning for that school will be 100% virtual for the next 14 calendar days. So there's the answer to that. What if there's a school outbreak? What are we gonna do? That's the recommendation. We still have our county metrics that we have to go by as far as if the county hits a certain level. We have to spot that, that. on. That's the next. That's the next slide that we're on, sir. I'll hold my, I'll hold my tongue a second. No, no, you're good. Um, so health metrics. Um, we utilize the Maryland COVID-19 data dashboard and the, our local health department. I have been communicating with Mrs. Strader um, on Fridays. Uh, it's a weekly check-in, and she kindly brings us up to speed as to what the new case rate is, what the positivity. And again, we have this information, but as Dr. C Tola highlighted for us today, he gets the information a lot faster than we do, a lot faster than the dashboard um, populates. So if we really had a concern, I would reach out to them directly and get that information in real time. Um, so the health metrics, what, what, what are the health metrics? Why do we use them? So they serve to guide the school reopening discussions. Uh, they help the district make reopening decisions and they provide guidance on when to adjust in-person educational offerings. I'm not going to click on the dashboard. I mean, unless you think you, I mean, I can, we can, if you think the parents at home need to see it. Mrs. Balls, should I move forward? That's up to you. I mean, a, a quick glance at it might be helpful. So our public, thank you. Our public health information, our public um, information officer has put this link on our QACPS website. So parents, you guys have access to this information now. It's been up there for a little while, um, but I just want to show parents how to navigate it so they have the information as well. Because just giving you a link is not going to cut it. So you, all right, this is a computer and I, oh, here we go. <laughs> Okay, so parents, when you go to the website, when you click on the coronavirus.maryland.gov, this is the piece you're going to want to look at right here, the square. You're going to click down here and scroll over once. You're going to go and select the county and make it whatever county you want. 
and we are looking at the positivity percentage because the guidance, uh, COVID-19 guidance for Maryland schools identifies the specific health metrics for us to consider. Again, we're not making this stuff up. We're not pulling out of thin air. They tell us what to use and it's figure one, page two of that document. Um, so positivity by jurisdiction. So it's tricky. You hover over it, you don't click on it and then you just slide that mouse across until you get to the end and then you will be able to see this data for yourself right here. So there's November 3rd. Were you asking Mr. Smith as to what the numbers were? Uh, actually interesting, yeah. So November, and this information was shared um, from our health officer as well today. Um, Queen Anne's County's positivity rate is 5.2% and there's the state metrics there as well. The other piece that we look at is the case rate, the new case rate per 100,000. So our Maryland school guidance tells us to look at the can, percentage. Can you come back one second? Did you say, what's our current rate right now? It's 5.2%, we'll talk, I'll talk about that because I know your antennas are kind of going, no, no. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the COVID-19 guidance for Maryland schools tells us or tasks us with looking at first the percentage of positivity. And then once we meet one tier, going left or going right, then we go down to the next tier. And let me see if I can show you what those tiers are because you ask, sir. True, everyone's information. I've been doing this every day and the... Um, you can drive yourself crazy though doing that. I know. So when you go down to the part where you hit for the county, I couldn't find that box on mine, but I went up to where it hit full screen in that mm. box, and then I saw where you, you put your. Were you doing it on your cell phone? Because sometimes if you're um, doing it on the phone, that's well, iPad. So. Yeah. So here are the metrics, Mr. Smith. Um, MDH says we start at the positivity rate and then depending on what that is, it's like a choose your own adventure book. You go left or you go right. So today our health officer said that what really he, ha he follows and he really concerns himself with and what we should really concern ourselves with is the case rate, the new case rate. Not so much the positivity rate because there are other factors that can affect that number or that percentage, excuse me. So he wants us to focus on the new case rate when we make, when we make our decision. That's his recommendation. So, yes, sir. Are the cases, like this county has 50,000 people, and the cases that you see listed are number of cases per 100,000. Are our numbers adjusted because we have half of the per 100,000? Because if they're not, our we're twice as many. So and to that answer that question, adjusted. yep. What, so what the guidance that we receive regarding that is that they are they're essentially comparing apples to apple. They are reviewing the data from other um, other counties and other regions, but it is an apples to apples comparison. So when you see five, it's really two and a half for us. They, no, they, sir. So the calculations are that's already been um, addressed and calculated yeah. into that number. Can you add to that, Mrs. Morissette? I, She's correct. It, well, what you're she's seeing correct. is I a just daily average. The math. Well, no, I'm not always right. <laughs> okay, so what is our right now? What okay, is our? Okay, so our new case rate in Queen Anne's County at, for November 3rd is um, Queen Anne's County is at 11.06. Statewide, we're at 14.24. So for the county, um, Dr. Ciotola stands firm with his recommendations, and, and we've discussed that with um, Mrs. Pauls as well. So let's go back to that. What's the make or break rate? to 15, so less than five here is, or can you see it up there? So the new case rate, less than 5%, so we go to the left. And so here we can start with um, limited in-person programs. So those are the small groups that we've already started. I know a lot of parents are saying, you know, get the kids back in school, get the kids back in school. We have a lot of kids already in school, in, in many different schools, and pretty much all of the schools. Um, and then we can consider hybrid or partially in-person programs, which is that, you know, that 50% capacity. And please, Mrs. Pauls, correct me if I'm wrong, because the curriculum is not my piece. Um, and then the next piece is the expanded in-person program. So that's like roll out the carpet, open the doors, let everybody in. Um, and that is a progression. We don't just do that and let everybody in. We gotta ease into it to make sure we're not opening Pandora's box. So on the right, let's say we're at above 5%, right, which are 5.2. Um, our health officer said that we need to not do what you're doing, Captain Kelly. Don't look at it every day. We're not fixating on the every day. We're looking at trends. Uh, and so that's what we consider. And he said, don't focus on the positivity. The new case rate is what we really have to, to worry about. So and just because just it hits at 5.02 or something, one day or... One day isn't good. It doesn't, that doesn't 
knocks out of the ball game, it could be a trend of four or five or a week average, rolling average. I mean, if it's five and keeps going up for a week, then we have a problem. Yes, and 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 I will add to that because um, Dr. Ciatola also added today, right, that. That's one piece of the puzzle. The other things that we're looking at is the community exposure. Is there a specific factor that is adding to that number to make that shoot through the roof? And I apologize, because he gave some very specific examples, and I can't remember what they were off the top of my head, but there could be any number of things that could make that number jump. And so that's where we would say, hey, what's going on in the community? What's going on in the northern section, central or southern section? So between five and 15, doing limited people what we're already doing is acceptable. Yeah, so, so that's yep. what Dr. C said. Right now what we're doing is, is fine. And he said what he pays more attention to than those numbers are the case rate. So not the positivity percentage, it's that second piece, the case rate. This right here. And he says 11. it's 15 is the case rate and to this date we have not had anything above 12. Who makes that call? I'll Mrs. Pauza, you and Dr. Ciotola, I mean, probably on a day, not a daily, but a coach enough thing where who you know, makes talk to you and you'll talk to him and then you make the call if we happen to go over a certain number, you just say, hey, we're shutting down. <clears throat> yes, or the health department could say. I mean, yeah, they could <laughs> understand. They could call you and say we're, you're shutting down. Yeah. Or when you talk to him and you feel uncomfortable. Ooh, sorry, guys. Which you're going to go by scientific numbers, then that would be a call. And the community numbers too, because that's the piece that we don't have insight into. We don't. Well, I heard time. was um, all of a sudden he realizes that the rise. We have a nursing home that has most a lot of problems in it, and or it's being reported because like the high the you know, high school kids that well the college kids if they're if they go positive out in you know California if they're Queen Anne's County residents it gets thrown against our numbers so those kinds of things he, I read somewhere that he I think had, that affects the percentage positivity rate yeah, more does. that's he what he's that. saying is skewing that's why he doesn't concern himself as much with the positivity but rate pay more attention to he the per school. That. On the top of this, everyone knows, I, I sit here going, oh my gosh, you know, we got to, we're telling us to do this, but it says your metrics are a guide to our school reopening discussions, basically. Mm -hmm. So I was anxious to see what Dr. Ciotola thought of these numbers. So it was 5-3. <clears throat> So he's up on it on a daily basis and it would Correct. contact you Correct. if he thought there was a concern Correct. that it was wrong. getting out of control. He Correct. wants us to watch this closely right now. Keep an eye on it. Yeah, he just kind of gave us the numbers beginning November the 1st, <clears throat> which was 4.4, the second 4.4, the third 5.3, and now 5.2. So it, it's too early to really pick up any trends based on the November numbers, but you can kind of see where we're headed. And you can see all of October. That's 20 some, 27 days of, of numbers as well that heads a trend. Um, so My concern is that we get to Monday, November 9th, and we just shot up from over the weekend, and what do we do? We well, talked about that. Yeah. Okay, yeah so what did. is the recommendation? Well, at that particular point, we have kids in school. We would have kids in school, so we would have to make a decision at the end of that day. I mean, it would be too early by the time we get this data to turn them around. Okay. Keeping in mind too that you have to look at the classroom the cohorts and the definitions of what you know are those numbers cases in the school um, we, we want to head it off before we get to that point but we wouldn't have any of that we wouldn't have any of that data right exactly Monday morning yes yeah, so and he he addressed this week as well because that, that the question you're asking is the one that you know other people are asking is so you know we have this information we're supposed to just wait and see i mean monday is the start so we have thursday and friday and we have the weekend as well if, if you know if a decision needs to be made the decision will be made at this point most of our positivity is coming from community social gatherings yes. that are not protected not adhering to the recommendations of social distancing and mask and out-of-state travel yep or traveling they're going on vacations they're they're doing whatever they're doing and they're not adhering to the recommendations and you know that because you do the when you do the contact tracing piece people sh share this information they're like oh yeah I went to this party went to this party I, I don't do thing. a lot of the contact tracing part I am the lead site manager for testing County so I talk to the folks when they come through to get swabbed 
Yeah, so that's why keeping the community spread low is critical because it, it those are the things that are going to affect our being in session. And he um, had minimal concerns about our younger students. What I keep getting is we're going to go into you know holiday season. Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, the college well, students are going to come home. That point, even before, we, I mean, we have to, that's why we, we really rely on, you know, the media blitzes, the health department, the Department of Health kind of blitzing us with that information. But I mean, even early voting, you know, that was five or six days of continued, you know, large numbers of people kind of congregating together in one space. So we, we the health department, the, you know, our health officer is watching um, these numbers carefully. So we talked about that. Talked about the response. Oh, are we done? Oh, I'm going the wrong way. It's different from my computer. Sorry. So team number one also has athletics under our purview. I do see that you have a separate agenda item to discuss eligibility. We can continue with athletics or pick back up. I think the athletic directors are going to address that when they come up. And so if you're still here, you can kind of chime in. Very good. It's part of their presentation. Other questions for team anyone one. else? For, no, gentlemen, you'll you'll talk at your time. You're with us for a while. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs> oh, you know what? Well, can we just go ahead? And I think this is their time. It's yeah, just they're, they're part of us. They're going to all right. Let them come. They're going to. Uh, they want to sit through. <laughs> the nice rest try, of the Tammy. <laughs> yeah, don't you want to be here with us all night? Come on, Dan. Wait, we got. Wait. <laughs> let them clean. Let them clean. Yeah. And they were on the call with us today. When I, we Dave, I know you want to be here with me. Come on. They were on the Hang out. They were with us. You said the athletic directors were on the call. They were with us, yes. So. Like baby wipes, they're all kind of... <laughs> thank you, Maria. You're very welcome. Do you know, Get your phone. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, but now you can get hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> get thrown out of this meeting. No! <laughs> <laughs> that poor pack is head. Uh-huh. Did you do your sign? Uh, yes. Yep. Thank All you. Right. This is where Jeff cringes when he sees me do that to the keyboard. Good evening. Good evening, gentlemen. And for, for the, the record? Uh, for the record, my name is Dave Wagner. I'm an English teacher at Queen Anne's County High School, and I also serve as the athletic director. And I am Dan Harding, the assistant principal and athletic director at Ken Allen High School. Uh, Ms. Harper, Ms. Pauls, we, we appreciate the, the time to report uh, on the return to play committee. And uh, I also want to, uh, Mr. Wagner and I were talking about it, really want to thank Dr. Ciotola and his office for their continued support and participation, especially today. I feel like we got a, a lot accomplished in our meeting earlier. Um, so on uh, last Monday, uh, or a week ago, the state Board of Education uh, unanimously voted to go with the 12, the December 7th winter competition season start date. So I'll just show that real quick. Um, so basically what that does now is it bumps up just for the community. It bumps up the um, suggested start date, first available practice date for winter sports uh, uh, to December 7th, which then adjusts the corresponding fall and spring as well. And essentially uh, what the counties were saying was they wanted more time for the, ath the athletes to participate, and we got that. So along with that, uh, I don't think I'm supposed to touch that after you did. Um, along with that, we went ahead and met um, as a committee on Friday and discussed a number of topics. Uh, I'll cover this one and then uh, Dave can talk about the next one. But our probably our biggest concern coming out of the virtual learning and, and is our, our athletic uh, eligibility as far as academics. Uh, we see a, a, an increasing number of students um, that just seem to be struggling. And, and we would hate to have this big carrot of athletics dangled in front of them only to be taken away. So that's kind of where we started. What we are asking for really is a, a slight adjustment to our current code. So what's listed in there at the top of this page on that hyperlink was the minimum requirements from the Bayside Athletic Conference bylaws. So what we're asking to be considered, what we're proposing, does meet that minimum standard. Uh, and then what is listed under that is our current uh, scholastic eligibility code within Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And then highlighted under the proposed COVID-19 virtual learning code is simply an adjustment that we would look to um, keep students practicing with their teams. So 
Hopefully, they come back on the 9th of November as students in a hybrid model. Hopefully, on December 7th, they begin winter sports practice. And between those two kind of changes to their schedule, we're hoping that the board would consider um, making the eligibility a, a eligibility requirement of maintaining above a 1.99. So you'd have to have a 2.0 GPA or higher as of January 4th, which is when we begin our competition season. So an ineligible athlete, a student that shows up to us hybrid learning on, on the 9th of November with below a 2.0 could still try out on December 7th and could, if they made the team, if they were selected as a, as a, you know, a, a teammate, it's important to note the coaches would know what their GPA was at tryout time. So as a coach, if I decided to keep an ineligible athlete, we're asking that they would be able to practice with the team and hopefully get that GPA up to a 2.0 or higher to begin our competition season. If at the December 4th date, that student athlete was below a 2.0, they would be considered ineligible and would not be able to participate with the team and, and would have to wait until the next reporting period to do so. So it's very much in line with our current policy. Uh, however, we are asking for a slight extension to the fourth um, so that they can get as much time to get their grades up. This was also discussed with building principals who are in support. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that this wasn't um, an easy way off our athletes, but rather use coaches and sports as a method to re-engage students in something productive. So we which, know that there are difficulties. So what, as I understand, you need right now is a, mo is a, a motion from the board to accept the change for the eligibility code. Is that what I'm? Is that what I understand? That's our understanding of how this has to change. And after you get input from all the Bayside teams, then no. So each or by by county. Each school system um, is able to determine their own eligibility code. Okay. There is a basic code, and this meets both standards. So, and the other thing that's that we want to be clear on, this is not something that would repeat at the start of every season. The idea would be that this, this first. This this year. Coming out of fully virtual learning, they get one chance to bring themselves up. But once we then move from winter into fall, the 2.0 eligibility would come into effect right at the start and would be required even for tryouts for those seasons. Madam Chairman. Yes. I make the motion. Let me get it straight first. Hang on a sec. So, so you're saying this goes to is January 4th and approval, but then the next, when they start fall, and the seventh, what is it, the seventh of February? They have to be eligible on that day. Is that what you're saying? For workouts or for? So to, to clarify, yeah. on December 7th, we'll begin our first competitive season, which is winter. We're hoping that for the first about a month, December 7th to January 4th, there's a grace period for eligibility. But from January 4th moving forward, it's our traditional 2.0 requirement. And the significance to the fourth date is that is right now slated to be the first date of, of actual competitions where we would play another school. So we would not have ineligible athletes representing Queen Anne's County Public Schools, um, though our hope is by giving them an extra month, we're, we're you know, getting as many student athletes as possible to participate. So the motion to change the student eligibility code to reflect the eligibility date to be January 4th, 2021? Yes. Beautiful. That, no, uh, January, not January 4th, 20. 2021. Next year? No. It would be this coming, this coming January, January 2021. 2021. It's 2021. It's yeah, two months away. It's just December 20th. December the 4th is the 20th. January. He wants to move January. to January. Okay. Is that a proper motion, sir? Mr. Cesarius, is that a proper motion? It's, would that cover all the bases for, their, for what they are asking for? Procedurally, it's proper. Um, I leave it to you to tell me whether it is capturing what you're trying to do. Okay. If you're, you're trying to change the eligibility, eligibility date criteria for a, a, a period of time. Right. If, if I could hear the okay, comment. motion to change the student eligibility code criteria to reflect the eligibility date to be January 4th, 2021. It could also be simpler to write it that we'll enforce a 2.0 eligibility starting January 4th. But that's neither here nor there. What I'm sure. trying to do is change to December 4th to January 4th. Yeah, it's essentially December. we would be waiving it until then. But Correct. Yeah, either way. To waive the eligibility date to be to January 4th. Uh, yes. 
waive eligibility date. <clears throat> that, okay, so motion to change the student eligibility code criteria to waive the eligibility date to January 4th, 2021. I have a motion. Yeah. Second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Discussion. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. I, I this is waiting. based on the fact that we're tentatively going to look open up November the 9th for the art hybrid. So we're going to go in there. So And then you want to roll this into your athletic schedule behind opening up schools on a 50% basis. This is assuming that we can start a winter competitive season on December 7th. Yes. I mean, we discussed in the past that our athletics would follow our opening of schools. They're just asking that eligibility date to be pushed back to January 4th, therefore giving the students more time to get their GPA up. Would it be more I flexible? I under I understand that. I agree with that. But what I just want to iterate, that we are looking at opening our schools on the 9th. That has and nothing we're looking, to do with okay, Yeah, that's, your, that's two different well, but, but issues. We, when we've talked about athletics, we've talked about having athletics follow opening up schools. I mean, I wouldn't want to have athletics open up and not have schools well, that's, open. They're, they're, not, they're not concurrent with each other at the moment. Not concurrent. In the would, moment. It, would it be more flexible Flexible yeah. for an adjustable schedule to say that we would no, enforce. You're just asking about eligibility code. Yes. Okay. They've been having athletics already. The, the reason I support this is. Please talk it, into your microphone, Mr. Give, Anderson. It will give incentive to those students who have a shot at getting eligibility to connect with thinking, learning, and athletics. And it's just one six-week period or four-week period or one-week period, whatever the period turns out to be, virtually or in class, a chance to achieve something and learn because we have a number of them who haven't. Right. And I think that's comments. what it's, I'm sorry. Excuse I'll, me. Go, go ahead. I was just going to say the other part is we... Please use your microphone. The other thing I want to say is we... we um, we have been told that GPAs have been going down because of solely virtual. And so if we are able to open up and have some in-person that might contribute to them improving their grades so then they can then be involved in the athletics. And that is certainly our hope. Yeah, and that was the principal's perspective that they wanted to give those students, whether we open or not, they wanted to give them the opportunity to increase their GPAs because, as we talked about earlier, many of the GPAs were a little bit lower. So we didn't want to punish the student. Any other discussion? I have a question. Every coach will be abiding by this, not insisting on a hire for their sport, correct? So the standard's 2.0, but for you to play on my team, I want a 2.5. Are coaches allowed to do that? So our eligibility code does allow for a coach. It says it down here, coach with principals and athletic directors approval may establish additional team standards. I, I would say this. It would be very difficult for a principal or an athletic director under the current circumstances to look to require a higher standard. So we would entertain the conversation per the policy, though I, I don't see a scenario coming off of eight months of being shut down where I, I would, where I would support um, anything other than our minimum standards okay and the two principles were in agreement with that <clears throat> okay I just want to make sure because I've heard different sports to get on the team it's one thing but to be an active player is a different thing do we need to codify that with this change as an additional change to this I mean I think simpler better they're just asking Mr. Better. Smith are you guys just going to take care they're of just, it, I say make it simpler they're just asking to move this up until January and under these conditions and the return to, yeah they're asking us to change the date uh -huh. that's right the how is up to them it has to make a motion to amend no we're not doing that <laughs> we're just changing an eligibility date okay no other questions comments okay the motion to change the student eligibility code criteria to reflect to waive the eligibility date to January 4th, 2021. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. We have a couple, two other quick pieces. Okay. One, just for the just so that you're aware, spectators at home events. Um, we are going to need, per the governor's order, as well as just safety purposes to severe to heavily limit spectators, though we are 
looking at any possible way to safely allow a limited number, and we're thinking parents. Um, so that's that's where we are going. Though we bring this up because we do have Pixlot cameras in both of our gyms and in the stadiums, and for um, I believe it's ten ninety nine a month or sixty nine dollars a year, they a person could stream every event that we you know that we have. Uh, and so those will be up and running for um, by January fourth when we start competitions. Well, bring, in, in that light, what are we going to do about the um, you know the opposing teams coming in with their uh, you know parents and and you know spectators? Are we going to limit that as well? So good, absolutely. Um, the athletic supervisors for the Bayside Conference have already met once. Um, there was, a, my understanding, no discussion of allowing fans from opposing schools to enter the building. In fact, many schools were leaning towards no spectators at all. And are we going to be doing temperature checks for these visitors? We will have to work with Ms. Fellers and Dr. Siatol to establish specifics. Um, our goals right now are to make sure we understand the rules, and then we feel very confident we can implement whatever we are permitted to do as seen as safe. Well, you have two months to get this in line, so. Absolutely, January yes. January 4th is going to be here tomorrow. Yes. So what is the number of uh, visitors that are going to be allowed? So the current governor's order says, says 100. serious than outside. Yep. So in inside, so if we're talking winter sports, the current governor's orders uh, suggest a, a 100 spectator limit, which currently, if you go by the, the more recent Gov Governor Hogan's order, that is truly just spectators. However, the Bayside Athletic Conference, the biggest concern was contact tracing if you allow visiting fans in, uh, and that turned in seemingly to be a nightmare. So we, are, we were looking at... And, and we're not we're not 100% here yet, but we were looking at um, each home athlete being able to have two adults come in per game, and we can we we have avenues to, to control that. Uh, whether we need to take temperatures, you know, we we can do all that. The building principals and Dave and I both are able to control a crowd of 30 to 60 people. Um, that that won't be a problem at all. That will also allow for us to socially distance on the sidelines so that we can make sure we're adhering to all those guidelines with you know six feet apart for the chairs and for our for our athletes as well. Well, you have both sides of both gyms. I mean, only one side of a gym could be open. We'll have to use the other side for socially distancing the teams uh, when they're not actively playing. Yes, okay. that's what we're looking at. So we are saying that two parents per athlete is our goal. It is possible that we aren't able to do that. Um, so we'll have more information as we continue. Um, like you said, January is right around the corner. So we're working hard. Okay. I mean, I had 12, kid, 12 players on a basketball team. Yeah, 12 times two, so you have 24 yeah, yes, parents. Sir. I mean, I'm doing the math. I'm, th I'm thinking about that one side. It's that's Don't forget, cheerleaders. If cheerleaders are in attendance, we could very quickly be at a capacity um, that we may or may not be able to handle. So like I said, our goal is to have two parents per athlete, um, but until we look at the practicality of our gyms, um, and of course, continuing to monitor health metrics, um, we'll be sure to let the community know um, more explicit expectations when we get closer. All right, well, let's roll with that. So mm -hmm. we have the two basketball teams, and then you let the 14 cheerleaders in. Are you gonna let the 14 cheerleaders have two parents a piece. We feel we would have to. It would be difficult not to. So so I, I would assume you said the number 12, anywhere from 12 to 15 basketball players, if we're going to use that as an example, 14 cheerleaders, multiply that by two, and you're still well within the governor's order. Um, the, the Bayside Athletic Conference seemed to really not be in favor of visiting fans solely because of contact tracing. Uh, that, that The concern was you just may not be able to get it done in time to safely host an event the next day or two days later. Um, though, to Dave's point, if, if we start having too many entities within there and you multiply that number by two, we may quickly get to 100 or more and then have to limit it. When we go outside, the current governor's order is, I believe, 250. And obviously, our stadiums are much larger than That's our fine. gyms, and I think we can handle that very, very easily. That's fine. Yeah. You're also going to have refs. You know, your you gentlemen will be in attendance. Yes. So the, Some the, of the your new staff. Gov, the new gov, the the most recent governor's order just says 100 spectators, and and I believe did so on purpose to allow because the the Maryland Department of Health order does say number of individuals within that building. So you have to count the referees, the game workers, the teams. The current governor's order, which is more recent than the Maryland Department of Health order, says 100 spectators. Okay. 
Uh, we typically hairs. have, for those that attend the Kent Island Queen Anne's game, either at Kent Island or Queen Anne's, we are around 1,000 or more. Correct. So we're talking 60 to, you know, probably at the, at the max. So our goal has to be to get the kids active. That's been our goal so far. So, of course, I we understand the parents' perspective and they want to be there, but. I don't envy the doorman. Yes. Especially yes. at the QA Kent Island game. So, and, and how do you, how would you regulate that? I mean, you're going to have to ask people to leave. I mean, that is part of our implementation plan that we're making now. And we're looking at online ticket sales, which was simply we would look at the, the rosters of the teams and assign two tickets and two online tickets only for each athlete. Okay. Um, and then simply that door person would be you have a on your smartphone or printed out. You have that ticket for that game. You come in. Certainly, it's not hard to count to 60. So Correct. you could, you know, you, but we would be turning people away most likely. Um, but the nice part is with the Pixlot cameras, the avenue is there relatively inexpensively um, for the cost of two tickets essentially to one game. You can stream for an entire month. So no concessions are being sold. Uh, that is going to be part of something that we cover. Um, it would certainly have to be sealed containers. Well, that brings a whole other health issue. Sure. In yes, sir. This is a welcome to the multi multifaceted problem we have well, in front of us now. As, as a parent who never took anything to the gym, <laughs> we're not allowed to have sodas and snacks in the gym, right? That's correct, Mrs. Harper. I've been very strict in enforcing <laughs> that thus far. Your face is getting red out there. Um, I said a long, a lot of time, a lot of years in the gym, and so I get it. Um, Okay, anything else, anybody else? And what else did you, do you we have, have to We have one quick, uh, we have one more point, um, which is more a matter of realignment. Um, one thing that we spoke about in the return to play committee and then with Dr. Ciatola um, is that we are going to move forward with the idea that athletics will operate um, when students are present for in-person classes. So um, if we are not able for COVID-19 related circumstances, to bring students in the building safely, it obviously would mean that athletics would then not continue at that time as well. We've been fortunate to get started, but we do need to align our extracurriculars with our academics. But that's not contingent on hybrid, because right now there are students in the building. Correct, right now it hasn't been it has been disconnected. We would look to have athletic activities happen when students are at least in a hybrid model. At least in a hybrid, okay. But again, they're not concurrent to each other. We can still have the athletics, still give them something to shoot for. I don't want to punish these students because it's, not, it's out of their control that we can't have more students back in the building. I don't think that's fair. I, I believe what we're saying is if the COVID-19, if the health metrics make there's it so it's outbreak. unsafe to... Oh, if there's an outbreak. Oh, there's yep. an outbreak. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And then we would, look to, we would look to resume athletics only once we were able to return to the hybrid learning. Right. So if there was an outbreak at one of the high schools and we had to shut down, then athletics would stop and resume once they came back. And we only put that in there because we had started ahead of academics. So... And that's it for athletics. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. Thank you. Thank you. These are easier to get to. Okay, so that all happened. Mm -hmm. So do we have Tiger Team number two here? Evening. Evening. Thank you, folks, for waiting. Sure thing. Appreciate it. All right. For the record, uh, my name is Louisa Welch, principal at Bayside Elementary. And I'm Adam Tolley, supervisor here at the Board of Ed. So this evening for uh, Tiger Team 2, we're going to give you kind of a, a brief review of the schedules to see if you have any questions about that. But nothing has really changed with the schedules from what we presented last time. Um, and briefly talk about the parameters uh, for each level. Um, but most important probably to provide an update for what schools have done since we last uh, spoke with you and also to provide kind of an update of the challenges that we're trying to work through and um, how that's going. So 
Before we get to that, are there any questions that you all have about the schedules that were presented before? Anything else, any other feedback about each level? I don't have anything on the schedule. I just want a clarification on the parameters. Now, if you have the minimum amount of, is it synchronous? Um, wait. Schools that average of 3.5 hours, that, that synchronous instruction. Hard when you move day. into yes. um, a hybrid, you know, they are actually being taught by synchronous when they're in the class. Is that added in here, or is, does this still have to remain above that? I couldn't understand that trying to listen to the Maryland so State what, Board meeting. So what our goal is, is to ha have an average of three and a half synchronous each day across the week, though, um, for elementary that number is going to look a little bit different though because the model that we have selected for elementary requires that teacher to divide themselves between the face-to-face -face instruction as well as the um, the virtual instruction for groups the, the opposite cohort that's at home so if they're doing synchronous for you know teaching two groups at one time do they get the you know they get the in person? Oh, and then when they go home, you've got the right. So they the elementary wouldn't be teaching two groups at one time at the okay. secondary level. I'm sorry, that would be the simultaneous. But anyhow, in that respect, when you're teaching the AAs for Monday, Tuesday, and the BBs, when is that counting toward your 3.5? I mean, that says synchronous learning. Okay. Yes, I just it didn't, is. I for couldn't sure. figure that out. Mm -hmm. for Thank sure. you. And that's something that Dr. Salmon mentioned last week. She's in the process of clarifying that definition. Okay. Because it may look a little different across the counties. So. <clears throat> if yes. teaching by Zoom, uh, that would seem to be synchronous teaching. So if we don't have the cameras, are we going to lose out on some hours that need to be in the students' uh, learning process? Well, we could be, but uh, the synchronous instruction that we're talking about right now utilizes the camera within the device if that student has a device in, in front of them or the teacher has a device in front of them. The webcams would allow teachers to do a lot more because they could you know, move around a lot more in the classroom rather than being stationary in one position, especially for the secondary model when they're trying to teach students at home so and in person. Instead of having a Zoom and everybody seeing the same thing, there's one source and it's going out to their Chromebook. Yes. So therefore they have to have connectivity or good connectivity in order to have the necessary hours. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I'm still not getting it. So, pardon, I'm sorry. So, a day, I see it's like so many hours, and then the virtual students get in the afternoon. They don't get to see what's going on at the right at the same time as. So, we're two different two different things that we're we can talk about here for elementary. Um, what we're displaying right there. So Monday and Tuesday mornings from, students would attend in the A cohort Monday and Tuesday from 9 to 1 p.m. Then in the afternoon, the teachers would meet virtually synchronously with the opposite, with the B students for an hour and a half. Can I just ask this? Yep, sure. Are you gonna, is this teacher gonna have to teach the same lesson plan that they just did for four hours to the people for one and a half hours? Or are the B folks gonna be able to see what happens in the A class in order to synchronize their learning and you can keep going on with the lesson plan? Or do they have to backtrack on B days and teach it all over again? I'll be completely honest, there is some juggling to that. However, the, it is possible for the teachers to be creative with that. So they are, um, the students who are in that B cohort on the, let's say in the second week on Monday and Tuesday, in that B cohort, they would be doing asynchronous work, independent work on their own at home 
to follow up from the instruction that they'd had in person. We want kids to stay as closely as possible, but certainly I'm not gonna sit here and say that what they had during four to five hours of instruction, they're gonna be able to recreate in an hour and a half. Correct, do you, do you see what I'm getting with this? It doesn't seem like it's gonna flow where I do. they're gonna get enough core content. But it, it's a challenge, but also remember that from nine to one, they're not receiving direct instruction for all of those hours where that part of that instruction is going to be follow-up independent work within that morning also and we're kind of the, these are things that uh, I think the teachers and leadership teams have worked out. I certainly understand your question, but I don't want to get too far down into that rabbit hole. It, it is a challenge, I will say that, no doubt. It's, it will be a challenge to follow this schedule. It, uh, no doubt. One of the things that she said, which does bring up the fact that needing the instruction, more instruction time is maybe the very first day, they aren't getting as much, but come Friday, the B, in-person B, they're given assignments to work on in the morning on the next Monday. That's correct, and I don't want to speak. Them, if, if they keep going that way, it enables them to kind of get more instruction. Correct, and I, I don't want to speak for other schools, but the way that Bayside has it worked out, in part of those mornings, they would be participating in their unified arts or special areas also virtually, and A and B cohorts would attend those specials together. So there are some, parts of that that could be synchronous and virtual. But again, schools have had to be creative to work within uh, within the bounds that they have to work in to, to use the, um, the resources and staff that they have to creatively make it work within that schedule. So you're saying that the, okay, say Monday, while the A students are four hours in school, the B people, B folks at home are actually doing unified arts. So they would have, I mean, that, part, that, part sounds, of that time. That sounds, I mean, that would be great. That way they at least are having kind of contact with a teacher. Not the, not the whole time, but the way Bayside has it worked, A and B cohorts will attend specials or unified arts together virtually. Okay. So there are times when that A and B cohort virtually would be together, but those are certainly not the majority of that four hours of instruction. Okay. We're going to touch on some of these other challenges that I think you're speaking to in a few minutes also. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions about the, the hybrid schedules for, for middle or high school? Yeah, I still, I asked this question at the last meeting. I still don't understand why we weren't doing four to five classes every single day. I, I still didn't understand that, and that way we get up on the core content. I still don't understand why high school wasn't doing four classes every day. I mean, I just didn't understand it. Especially when once we get the webcams in, they'll be able to be a, a part of every single class. The virtual students could meet up, I mean, be a part of the classroom it's, as it's going along. I just didn't, I didn't understand why we didn't start that to begin with. I mean, other districts are doing it. I mean, tell well, me if I'm I think wrong. if we, and, and I don't want to speak too much to the high school because I'm, I'm not a I know secondary not. administrator right now, but I think I can speak to the fact that, for example, in that high school hybrid schedule, and, and it's very similar in the middle school schedule also, they are in person, let's say, take an, an A cohort student. They would have first and second second period in person on Monday and Tuesday. But in the afternoons, they're still experiencing third and fourth period, but it's virtual from home. And then on the opposite days, B cohort students would be in person right, in those mornings. Sorry. So they still would get a chance to experience each content, but it would certainly not be in person each day. Okay, I see where it's continued at mm -hmm. the next page. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, it is a little confusing the way we had to, it's a lot of information to put on a single page. Oh, I have a question about the sure. CTE. Since, so if we go to this hybrid model starting Monday, your CTE folks come in Wednesdays. They lose their Wednesday. 
are they still getting enough hours? Because it doesn't look like they're, the CTE is split between second and third period, isn't it? Correct. Yes. So, so are they going to get their time? They will. They, they would actually still get their time, um, but they do lose that, that whole single day on Wednesday, but they will still get their time in this in this model because the periods are, you know, roughly, you know, a little over an hour, uh, hour and 45 minutes or so. So they get it. So they get that twice uh, because the way the cohorts are um, set up now, we're running four cohorts on those Wednesdays. So the, their time in there is actually a little bit less um, than what they would be getting for that schedule. Okay. Because what I'm hearing now from parents is... The students don't feel like they're getting enough time now as it is. Oh, I actually, yes. I, I, and we would love to have them in there more um, and have them in there more time, but just the way the schedule works out, you know, the way it's working out now is because the Wednesdays exist because it does not uh, interfere with their other classes on the Monday, Tuesday, mm -hmm. Thursday, Friday. So, but yes, as you said, the Wednesday would go away during the hybrid piece, so they wouldn't have that, that whole day, but it, they would they would get it on the other days. Okay, but that's, that's still a huge concern for those parents and those kids. Absolutely, absolutely. There are definitely definitely a lot of um, considerations there with, with with these models and, you know, those students getting their hours in for um, certifications and testing, and it's definitely, it's, it's definitely um, a concern throughout the state as well. Yeah. Couldn't you look at those CTE numbers and, and possibly have them in more? I mean, the students, I mean, some of them, this is what they were, you know, relying on when they once they graduate. Sure, sure. If you mean in the in the current situation, if we're right. in, a, in a virtual situation. No, I mean hands on. I mean. No, right, but if you can't we're in the learn how to schedule. build, you know, lay brick unless you're in there doing it. Sure. You can't learn how to cut hair unless you're in there, and certainly nursing students, they have to have hands on. Absolutely. Absolutely. But there's no way to increase that. If we, in the way, like I said, the way it's set up now in, in the virtual model, you know, they are there on Wednesdays because that is set as an, as an asynchronous day. So it does not interfere with their other courses. So if they have CTE, second, third period, and just, you know, for simplification, they have math, first period, and English, fourth period. If you did it additional days, then at some point you're going to interrupt their, um, you're going to interrupt their other classes as well. So it's tough, and like I said, I, I would love um, you know to have them in there longer. And, and in talking with the the CT teachers, that the you know the students are making out great there, but they would like to have more time. Not making out great. They're, they're having they're struggling. Well, there's trouble. Sure, I mean yes. They have really small classes, and that is helpful. Sure. I think today when I visit the masonry class, there were four to five students. So it was a really small group of right. students. That's what I'm saying. If it's such a small cohort, why couldn't they be in there more? Because it would interfere well, with their... I know. It just, it's just so unfair. It also has to be coordinated with Ken Island High School. Oh, true. And also, I think, I, I'm not a CTE person, but I have two children in the program who are experienced in that. And, but you have to remember, they have four cohorts attending during the day, each of which are 90 minutes. Right. And that really doesn't leave much other time for that teacher other than four classes and a 30-minute lunch. Okay. So certainly, we have to kind of work within the bounds of, of the school day also. And we're always planning for that group that is at home. So we still always have to support the, the group that's at home. and, and you know, other districts looked at different models and only bringing in certain students, but we wanted to bring in all, you know, all the CT students in those in those six um, pathways, so we could, you know, hopefully keep them um, keep them moving. Okay. They've probably gotten a lot now because they're one of the only games in town in school. So. Absolutely. Hopefully they've moved along pretty good. Yeah which is, that's one consolation. So what we'd like to do now is kind of share, uh, give you an update as to how the planning and preparation has gone uh, since we last spoke to you. I think it's important to keep in mind that there are moving pieces to this puzzle as we try to, to solve this. Um, and certainly, um, we started off with the parent and staff survey data, which was just sent out at, uh, I think, believe the day or day before the last board meeting. Um, there were some challenges with the survey results, um, not to lay blame anywhere, not 
certainly not trying to do that, but there were some challenges because we found in School Messenger there were some parents that were not getting emails, so we've worked really hard to try to um, coordinate that with um, the board office and, and get that corrected. Um, but we went through a lot of challenges with parents that were not getting the email, so maybe hadn't gotten the survey or weren't getting the email communications from principals. Um, and also, you know, hindsight being 2020, there was a bit of lack of clarity in how we asked those questions in the language. Uh, many parents didn't understand that we were asking for a commitment. It wasn't just what's your opinion of what you want your child to do. So. Um, we certainly understand that, and the schools have worked very hard to communicate with parents to try to make sure that um, we, we did communicate clearly what we needed from them. Um, we worked to divide the A and B cohorts, starting with alphabetically, um, from 12th grade all the way down to uh, pre-K um, and worked very hard with across the feeder schools to try to ensure that all the households were attending on the same day. Um, I have to thank uh, you know Julie Forbes and Chris Brown and all the other folks at the board that um, that gave us the, the best data possible that they could but we still found some holes in that which requires more time and communication with parents. Um, you know we have to account for um, combined families, siblings that don't have the same last names, things like that. Um, lots of different complicated family situations and we've tried to work as best we could with families uh, to communicate with them uh, about which cohort their child was going to be in. Um, certainly communication with transportation has been has been a struggle. Um, we've done our best to get the information to them. However, a, a moving part to that is what staff do I have available to teach those children when they're coming? And that we know HR has worked as hard as they can. We know they're backed up with paperwork for um, you know, requests for ADA accommodations and CARES Act and all those things that um, have gone into this formula. Um, but then every time something changes, if I lose a teacher or I get a new request for an accommodation or somebody's using the CARES Act, it changes everything. And all those pieces of the puzzle have to shift again. Um, in addition to that, for the elementary level, we've really had to recreate master schedules to meet the needs of the A, B, and C cohorts. Um, also, coordination of special education services and staff is still an ongoing challenge, um, especially with the A and, and B cohorts. You know, we're dividing the, the staff really into two different jobs, teaching in person and teaching virtually. Um, and we only have so many special educators uh, to spread out. So again, that's a, we have to be very creative in how we do that, but that is something that we must do. We, are, we know that we're providing great virtual services to our students right now for special education, and we must continue that um, even though we're kind of splitting ourselves in half. So that is an ongoing challenge. Um, again, staffing considerations from the survey data, uh, input from HR. Again, we we know that the folks that were giving us the data gave us the, the best information that they had. Um, there was still some communication to kind of iron out those details to make sure that we had accurate information for each teacher and what their plans were. Um, again, for elementary, we're reassigning students to new teachers as necessary. For example, if their teacher stayed virtual but they want to participate in a hybrid, they're being reassigned to a new teacher or vice versa. Uh, that's almost like doing grouping again um, in a very several, short period of time. We've had several parents yes. send us emails about that. Created most, a little bit of anxiety. Yes, of definitely. And, and most... I will say 80 to 90% of the parent communication that, that I've dealt with has been they wanted their child to stay with that teacher, of course. Our teachers work very hard to develop those relationships, um, and it was harder to do in a virtual environment, but they've done it. It's taken a little bit more time, um, but they, they have created those relationships, and many parents, whether that, that teacher ended up being virtual or in person, want their child to stay with that teacher. So we have done the best we could to honor families' requests when we could, still working within the bounds of how many students we can have in each cohort. Uh, certainly, we spent a lot of time communicating with families um, regarding the cohorts and teacher assignments for their students. Um, and then planning for what this is going to look like in person, new arrival and dismissal procedures, transitions, uh, student traffic patterns in the hallway. Um, 
what do bathroom breaks look like now? Um, planning for, you know, an, if the weather is appropriate, an outdoor socially distanced mass break, um, those kinds of things. And, you know, we've, we've kind of dipped our toe in the water with the small groups that are already in the schools. We've tried some of this, but we're asking people to do this on a much larger scale with 50% of the population in the building. Um, but it is a fluid situation, and, and again, you know, what one piece of the puzzle that changes there shifts everything. So some of the challenges that we're, we're trying to work through, the, the biggest one that I think you have already um, heard folks um, talk about are, are staffing needs. And, um, and Adam, I know you have some specific information that you may want to speak to about. That. Sure, and just you know, just with you know, Louisa brings the 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 school perspective and and the staffing perspective from there as well. But you know, with regard to CTE, with um, staff not being able to return, we're we're starting to see some challenges there. Um, you know, obviously CTE is very specialized, and they have specialized teachers are trained specially. And so, if we have a staff member who is not able to return, it's extremely difficult to find somebody to fill that position and to be able to, uh, for them to have the training necessary in order to you know, meet the needs of the students. So that's the um, sort of a little bit of a different perspective there um, you know, that I'm in charge of to make sure that teachers are trained. And you know, we definitely are starting to see some, um, some challenges that are arising with regard to that. Aren't you sitting with that now, even before we're in hybrid? A concern about losing staff? Really, a CTE program, right? Is there any? Maybe I'm not understanding what you're saying. So, if, if a staff member takes, um, you know, medical leave or that's not able to be with the students at this point, and they're gone for a, a, a long amount of time, then that's the that's the challenge that we're that we're going to see. And you have that right now too. Right? I mean, who teaches the ones that are async or there on Wednesdays? If you have a step, one of those people is out. So well, I guess that would be like versus you know a very short term. If they were out for uh, you know a sick day or something versus is, you know them being out for an extended period of time so that would be the that would be the difference and it hasn't been it hasn't been much of a problem at high school I think we're running into some problems with at the middle school level oh I thought you're talking about CTE I'm sorry but if it's long term as your auto mechanics guy your regular old substitute can't come in and pick up they've got to have some knowledge of auto mechanics oh totally agree right. I'm just saying you're sitting with that situation right now before we even moved to hybrid Correct, but I Who's think your audio, audio sure. body guy from also I think what is affecting this is a, a, a teacher, for example, that chooses to take the CARES Act for whatever reason that they need to to take care of their family. Um, that if if we had a teacher in a project lead the way or CTE class, it's difficult at best to fill that. Um, we are and I can speak just from the elementary level, you know, it's it's easier to find an elementary teacher than it is a CTE or Project Lead the Way. Um, but in some cases, at, at this point, uh, we don't have a teacher to fill in. Um, we are, you know, the, the coverage is very thin and there's no cushion. If we lose one person, then um, we, we don't have it. And then we end up putting classes together that weren't typically together. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a challenge, um, but it is a fluid situation and as the needs change, as approvals for ADA accommodations or CARES Act are ongoing, um, and, and parents, um, for very good reason, um, have struggled with the decision whether or not to send their child back to hybrid or to keep them virtual. Um, this is, a, you know, it's a very difficult decision for them and I, I, don't, I don't envy that. But we just, in some cases, don't have that teacher to fill in. Or we have a teacher who is, let's say, teaching virtually. They have the accommodation that they can teach virtually, but students that they're responsible for are still coming into the building. So we are required to have a, some sort of staff member there, whether it's a paraeducator or another teacher, to be physically in the building, in the room with those students to monitor them and that teacher may still be teaching virtually. So there's, there's a myriad of different situations, but um, and we will figure it out, but staffing, we need you to understand, is a, is a challenge. Well, I mean, even back in the 
years ago when you had substitutes or no replacement for a teacher. They, but when you're fully staffed, you have a little more flexibility to move things around. Sure. Now you're razor thin. And I just think the public and parents are going to have to be very understanding that you don't have any wiggle room. Matter of fact, you probably have none in some places because we're understaffed and we will be understaffed. But we're doing, we're going to do the best we can under these circumstances. But it's certainly not going to be like it, like it could be until we can get back 100% and then you've got more flexibility. But that's not going to happen in, in the you know next couple months. That's correct. And the challenge there is we we have many teachers who are. Uh, I think I think more able to teach virtually, but if we go to the hybrid, then we have to make accommodations for that. But I still need a person to be responsible for that that child's safety, you know, in the classroom. So you are saying that we'll have 10, 12 kids in a class, students in a class. We'll have to have a Paris or a substitute sit in on that class just to monitor them in the classroom, but they're gonna be on their computer looking at their teacher who's teaching from home. That's a potential scenario for some classrooms, yes. Well, the parents need to know that, but that's, yes. this but is that, what's gonna happen. That's gonna be, that's an option. It's, I mean, that's something that's gonna happen at certain times. That would be a situation if that teacher had an accommodation to teach virtually, yes, that could could happen. And it probably will happen at some at some places. Oh, that's going to happen. But it's yeah, not going to be it's not going to be the normal. We're hopefully going to get as many teachers back in as we can. Um, have you uh, and or your teachers in your school uh, seen this do these documents that explain everything and what will happen if and so forth that they have to sign? that they have the COVID-19. So. Um, COVID-19 signatory for all staff and it goes out to the parents so everything is covered. That has not been rolled Yes, I have, I'm have. i aware of the it parent document. They have more staff problems than you think. Well, that's something we, we were, I hope not, got an update at night on, but that's going out. Going out tomorrow. So that, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, okay, I didn't, okay, so it hasn't rolled out yet. It haven't been shown. Surprised you haven't seen it. Okay. Well, it's just, yeah, I, I just saw it on Monday. And then we didn't have school yesterday and today's Wednesday. So they did want to make sure that you all were aware of it as that you, the board was aware of it as well. So. so the teachers have not seen it yet. It has not been rolled out to the teachers. But it's just put together. Correct. Okay. I think Matt just got the final copies back on Monday, and that's when he forwarded them to me. And <clears throat> just came here tonight, and they'll be going out tomorrow. And it's the same thing you're talking about. We need communications, but until we have the, I mean, you don't send something out, you, we're not familiar with it yet, and that's, you know, it could be going out tomorrow to all the teachers. Yeah, it's just like the, the, the cleaning protocols that, um, you know, um, Carla has done. It just went out, what, Monday, Monday afternoon to principals, to schools, and then schools shipped it out today. And she has a first town hall tomorrow, which we anticipate will be pretty busy. <laughs> So. I could make a suggestion that it go out to the, Mr. Anderson. the groups that are doing all this planning first. Mr. Anderson, use your microphone, please. Just, just in case they have suggestions. And at this point, I would suggest it just go directly to the principals because they, right. the principals really are the planning groups and supervisors mm -hmm. right now. So, any other questions about about staffing before we move on? Um, just wanted to touch base again with the, the shortage of substitutes, which I think Mr. Talley touched on too, long term as well as, as daily. We know that that is going to be a challenge. Um, and we have many substitutes who are reluctant to take on the virtual classroom because of their um, um, perception of not, not having expertise in technology or they don't want to teach face to face. So that is a challenge, but we know HR has been working hard to get those um, substitutes ready for us. Um, Schoology at the elementary level uh, does bring about a, a major challenge for us. We have found that due, um, due to the model that we're using where we need to reassign students to another teacher, um, we have researched this and currently there is no way to archive or save the student data or work that that student has done in Schoology. 
So if I change them to another teacher assignment in Schoology, we lose that work. And have I've they had looked at this. Have they have looked at we it? We have they, looked at it. Yes, working on it. Um, you know, it's not calculating by trimesters as well, too. So it's another issue yes. that they're having at the elementary level. Um, uh, some information was sent out to um, to schools. Was that thir maybe Friday, I guess, Mr. Page sent that information out, but they are constantly working on it. And um, the problem is that they have these programs and they're not talking. They don't talk, they don't, they don't talk to each other. So it is creating some issues as far as grading is concerned and the, the saving of the work. But I, I think they just got to the point where they realized that once they started to really look into going into hybrid, they, it wasn't on their radar before because they had the same teacher. So this wouldn't be an issue for secondary students because they're not switching teachers, but because of the way that we decided to go with elementary, um, that, that would be an issue. Um, it also does become an issue, as Ms. Paul said, because, you know, if we're switching teachers for next Monday, um, student progress reports, um, you know, would be due at the end of our trimester, which is the 4th of December. So it causes some um, confusion there for, you know, how those progress reports will be completed when you've had a teacher who's had them up to November 9th. And we're not talking about every student, but to give you an example, at Bayside, I would say 30 to 40% of my student population will be assigned a new teacher as of Monday moving forward with the hybrid. Do you, uh, are you thinking of a solution that maybe halting Schoology, going back to what they used to do until the until this company that we've actually hired <laughs> to fix things can fix it? Um, I, I, just a thought, I mean, we do have a comp I think we're paying a contract well, for them to work through Schoology. Correct, but they're also working for other counties as well, too. So they're in constant communication. At this point, we do not have a, a resolution, but we are, we work. I mean, these are things that we just found out. Yeah, okay, I understand. Um, I, Michael brought it to my attention last Friday. Um, and there's also some issues with final grades no longer matching the final teacher pro as well, too, in the secondary school. So there are some major, there's some major issues that need to be resolved and they are working on them. Funny when we were told about Schoology, we oh, we were told that it's it's synced with everything and it would all, you know, talk to every platform that was necessary. Well, I think the case. problem of changing, you know, the, the classes once we decided to go to, to hybrid, move into hybrid, just posed some questions that weren't thought of at the time. Right. Okay. But some teachers in other school systems are saying their Schoology does link with Power School. So is it a county specific issue? No idea. Perhaps if we looked at the contract and see what we purchased to see that it, you know, that link was actually activated. And it may be that it's linking, but not correctly too. Oh, there okay. may be some, some glitches in how those programs are. And who would have that answer? Okay. Um, that would be Julie's department. Because certainly if we need, if we need to pay for a few more apps in order for them to all to link, we should do that. I mean, we have something to look at. Things we have CARES. I mean, we still have CARES money. Let me pull that out. CARES tutoring act or CARES money somehow. We need to have that happen. Yes, we are meeting tomorrow um, okay. with um, Ms. Boda to discuss the monies that are um, in the CARES funds and how we plan on uh, spending those, okay. spending down some of that money. So, okay. That Mr. Page and uh, Mrs. McNeil. Okay. So, so. Well, that definitely should be a part of the conversation. That is the conversation. That is the that is the purpose of us meeting. Okay. Yeah. And when I spoke with um, our new CFO, she said she had plenty of experience with, with that, so she was very familiar and felt comfortable. Great. That'd be great. Any other questions about uh, continuity of teaching and learning for us? No, thank you both very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. I know we know this is really hard. Yes, it is. You guys it are is. miraculous. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.
it okay if we let our student go? Ms. Gross, would you like to go home? I'm sure you have work to do. This is so engaging. I mean, <laughs> thank you for coming in. Good evening, ladies. Ms. Forbes, Ms. Carey, thank you for sticking around. Appreciate it. Um, good evening. So I'm Julie Forbes, the Supervisor of Accountability Assessment and Data Management. Michelle Carey, Principal at Kennard Elementary School. So the first thing we're going to talk about are the results of the student survey. Uh, Mrs. Wright, do you know? It was open, but somebody closed it. Gotcha. Just off two seconds. <laughs> That happens. That's fine. Um, and I can start speaking about the survey um, as Mrs. Wright pulls it up. So as everyone knows, we distributed a survey electronically to our community um, beginning on October 7th, and that survey closed on October 12th. Um, the survey was sent via School Messenger, which is the tool that we use for phone calls and text messages and those kind of things to send out and emails to send out updates. It was our only available surveying tool, mm -hmm, that's it, um, at our disposal that was part of a product that we already paid for and that was already set up. Um, it was the first time we used the survey tool and we discovered there were certainly some limitations to it. And um, so some of those limitations were um, that some back when folks set up their survey accounts, they may have opted out of receiving surveys from School Messenger. So we found that was an issue. So if parents initially in their account set up had opted out, many didn't remember because it was done a while back, they would not receive the survey. Um, some went to spam and then other families did not receive it if they did not complete the back to school registration. So those were some issues we ran into. Regardless, we still had a 70% response rate, which in terms of a survey that we distribute, 70% is, is a pretty good rate when we look at getting surveys out. We did send it multiple times. We did allow families um, the opportunity if they changed their mind to allow that new response to kind of override the prior response. So let me just real quickly, Ms. Mm -hmm. Forbes, for the board members who have their computer up. Where is it? It is the next um, attachment on board docs. On board docs. Um, Ms. Wright is passing out papers to, mm -hmm. if you can't access it. On board docs. Okay. There it is. You see it? it? should be right under the QACPS. And it will look like... Yeah. I need a little bigger to help too. My eyes, as I'm getting older, I'm straining. Um, so again, we had a 70% response rate. Um, the survey, due to the timelines, it wasn't even out an entire week. So um, typically with surveys, that's a pretty good response rate. Of course, we needed response from everyone. And so due to that, um, you know, we returned that survey data to schools and schools did have to follow up with the families that did not have a response yet. Um, there was quite a bit of data cleanup to be done. Um, and that took, so we had the survey closed Monday night. We had the survey results back to schools by midday Wednesday. So it was about a day and a half turnaround and that was because of the way this particular platform delivered the data to us. And it actually required a lot of just hand data work and due to that and due to, of course, such an important, the, the important nature of this data, we double, triple checked it. We literally sat in my office as a data team, pulling the original source data to make sure there were no errors. And we found that the data was very clean when we sent it to sites. And so just to um, share that piece, because it was a very quick turnaround process. So again, had about 70%. And then the schools followed up. And it was quite a bit of work for the schools to have to follow up with those 30% that they did not receive a response from. Oftentimes, those phone calls would yield many questions. Um, of course, as parents and family members are making these very important decisions. These results um, we compiled with the help of our schools. And you can see there is a breakdown um, by school, by grade level. And to get to kind of the main point of it, if you look over here when we uh, tabulate all of our students and those results, Approximately 75% of our families opted for the hybrid option, the AB schedule, and approximately 25% have opted for the 100% distance learning. And of course, like I said, you can look um, if you want more of a breakdown by school or by level, but that's the um, main, main. Well, what does that tell you we should do? <laughs> Accommodate. 
it's you know, and that that's the challenge, right? That's the challenge is that we um, are here to support all of our students, all of our families, um, and so this gives us more information about you know our community and and the options that our families um, you know are comfortable with and show preference for, but. Just remembering some statistics, having that kind of turnout means this, this is valid and has a very small error margin with that kind of turnout. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering what they think they voted for or what they had a preference for. Maybe that's the next line. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's it. Basically, the majority um, opted for the hybrid. 75% of our family said, you know, we want our students to come in on the AB schedule. So I would say that that could be concluded. But did we do one with the staff? We did, um, and that, you know, that, 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 those results went to human resources because it's staffing and it's confidential. Um, and there was a survey that went out to staff and that was more about the ability to return to work. And I think, I believe Mrs. Bass has covered some of that. So with this, are you still getting phone calls of families who are changing their minds or have, have those slowed down? Those have absolutely slowed down. Um, and I would say the schools, Mrs. Carey could probably speak to that as well. The schools did get some calls about that. We have, I would say just speaking for, for my building, um, I probably had about anywhere between 30 to 35 calls for changes. Um, just given the metrics and that sort of thing. So they've said, you know, we thought we wanted to do hybrid after we'd seen the schedules. We're considering virtual now. So, so most are going virtual instead of the other way. Yes, I would say the majority of the calls that I've gotten and emails that I've gotten, the majority have said we are going to now prefer to go to virtual. So do these numbers reflect, are they accurate for now or was this prior to the phone calls? before the switching happened. Well, we just filled this out this mm -hmm. week for oh, so, so it's is, pretty yeah, okay. I mean it's it's pretty accurate with a few changes here and there but okay. Well, even after your after your response to these people that emailed you the 30 that you said most of them chose to go back to virtual. That's included in. Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. And probably some of it when it when it but they found they they might not have the same teacher. I mean, I'm sure that played mm -hmm. some yeah. issue in it when you know you you're bonded to a teacher, you're working just working pretty well and then all of a sudden you change isn't, you know, mm -hmm. especially for the younger. Absolutely. And we did try to get quite creative with how we did our schedules so that we didn't have, you know, the least amount of movement is what we were aiming for, truly. But if a teacher decides to teach virtual or for certain reasons and you don't have him or her there, right. you don't have an option to do right. that. Right. Yeah. So there's that was quite a challenge. 200 yeah. Oh, over 100 were not able to be located at um, Queen Anne's County High School? So Queen Anne's County High School did report that they had 100, about approximately 100 families they were still trying to reach for a response, and they had tried multiple ways from the school site, yes. They're, they're missing those students, too. No, no, they're on the road. Huh? And they must be on the thing and to send them something, their students are there, it's just mm -hmm. they're not responding. Yeah. I mean, the students are in school or virtual learning and they just didn't respond to this. Oh, I don't know. That's what... Yeah, we would, we would have to reach out to the school for that. Mm -hmm. But I do know every school has worked so incredibly hard to reach out to families multiple ways, multiple methods um, of really trying to proactively reach out to families to help them with that decision. Okay. Any other questions about the data set before we move into Tiger Team 3? Buddy. I might make a suggestion though. Um, it, it, second semester, we'll, after January, <laughs> if we reevaluate what we're going to do, we may end up, just my thoughts, I mean, I'm not going to be around, but going back to a, another so called survey. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be very specific. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Because I think it, it the, a lot of emails and phone calls I've got, it, but we didn't know we were voting for that. We didn't know. Yeah. We didn't know. So, you know, I'm visioning us reevaluating it you know, starting after January. Yeah, there, I think there were a lot of lessons learned um, from this first time of distributing this type of survey. So I think there are absolutely some best practices to glean um, and, and just think about the best way to get this information, but also provide the information to families that they need to make this type of decision. Absolutely. We can always do a better job. I'm not sure they actually even knew it was a survey. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was, you know, what do you think and comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
big misunderstanding by a big number. Of mm -hmm. and, and that explains some of um, probably the changes we had um, that came through with the different versions of the survey and also some of the calls. And it caused you all a lot more work to don't need. <laughs> Well, the one problem that I had, I had heard from multiple parents and students is they only went to the student's email, didn't go to the parents. It's and, and I had, I, well, I know what it should have done, but I also know what it did do. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I had emails and texts and, and phone calls. Um, it went to my 12-year-old. Is he supposed to decide or am I? So, yeah, a legitimate question for someone who has a minor. So that there's, and they found it in this sometimes in the spam of the students' emails. Mm -hmm. So, parents, some parents. I mean, if I I literally asked some of my neighbors, I mm -hmm. said, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" And they, we don't know anything about that. We didn't see that. Okay. They went back. I said, "Go back into the students' emails," and that's where they found it. Yeah. And that would be an issue then with a the school messenger distribution list that needs to be looked at. Correct. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. Not the first time we've had trouble just with that. Just to learn something yeah. for next time. Yeah, so and I'm just giving you ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we, we really found with School Messenger, it is not a great tool to give a survey. It, it was nice that the option was there and it was free, um, but it was very limited in terms of what we can do. We, you know, we don't want to bring on new systems, but there are other systems out there that essentially let you send out electronic forms that maybe eventually we'll look at. Um, because again, we just found this to be very limited and there were issues. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. A concern, you may be getting more phone calls if parents find out that their student is coming in for hybrid and is still sitting and learning virtually. So are phone calls going to be accepted and changes at that point? Essentially, I feel like once they get in to see what the hybrid looks like, we might get some some concerns as well as, you know, we're just doing the best that we can with, with what that looks like. It's staffing, you know, I can speak, is, is a, an area of concern, uh, you know, and just for those that are on leave and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that was already shared, uh, you know, with, with the group. But, I don't think parents were aware when they did that survey, though, that their student may end up in the classroom still learning virtually because their teacher is at home. Right. So that may change some minds once we get Absolutely. rolling. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that change will be accepted? Or are they stuck in their choice? Well, I think that's a decision probably that needs to be made at the county level so that we're consistent with with how we, you know, do that. Because I think if we don't have a hard and fast, it's the scheduling is very, very challenging. And so if we continue to have, all, you know, multiple changes, it really changes the dynamics of what our classrooms look like mm -hmm. and the class sizes. You know, um, being one of the larger elementary schools, I know my class sizes are pretty high for my A and my B co cohort. So. Um, if too many shifts happen, I feel like we've we've tried very, very hard to accommodate the parents and the siblings and putting them on the same days. But if you get into, you know, a situation where you have, you know, 15 B cohort kiddos, spacing is 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 very, very challenging and getting those kiddos in there. So um, I feel like up to this point, we've tried to say, you know, please try to make a firm decision, you know, but um, I know we've said if we can work with you and, and tweak things, surely we will to meet our family's needs you know definitely i mean child care is an issue for families so mm -hmm. okay so now into our tiger team update so for grading and reporting, um, we pretty much have had no changes. We're actually through for elementary. We've already, we're almost through our first trimester. Um, progress reports, um, we're gonna be rolling those out in about a month. So really no changes here for, for elementary. For middle and high school, same. Um, they're through their first um, semester, so trimester, so or not trimester, semester. So we're, there's no real changes here um, for middle and high school either. High school, everything. 
everything stayed the same. <laughs> yep. We really don't have any. <laughs> to group them together. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> for, for our uh, Tiger team, really the recommendations have remained the same, so we don't have any changes for you. Local assessments, we're following the same path that we discovered at the, I mean, that we discussed at the last meeting. Um, again, nothing has changed by the Maryland State Department of Education in regards to state assessments. Um, a waiver was recently passed, though, for our current juniors in high school that they will only need to sit and participate in English Language Arts 10 and Algebra 1 um, due to the, the new assessments because those MCAP assessments are changing. So that does mean they will have that exemption from the graduation requirement. They will still have to take it, but they do not need to pass it. Um, but as far as the actual administrations go, the English Language Arts and uh, Math Administration that's normally held in the fall for high school has been canceled and will only be offered in the spring. And government and high school science are still scheduled to be offered in January and also in the spring. Are they they being graded or no? They're also um, giving them? Um, they currently have not waived, um, they have not changed that requirement because the assessments have not changed, but science has been a participation. It, it, it's another year of participation for science. So as long as students sit for science, they do meet the requirement. It's been that for a, a while. It has been, yeah. And, and there's actually some other shifts going on with science, but mm. so that's different. Um, and as far as attendance goes, no new recommendations, just that it's important that when we have some students attending in person and we have some students doing distance learning, we need to make sure in power school that they are coded as such. And Mr. Evans um, in Student Support Services is working with sites to um, share those new procedures for taking attendance because you need to, again, make sure your students who are distance learning are indicated as such and also your students who are present physically in the classroom are indicated because we need to be able to know who's in the building and who is doing distance learning. Anyone any questions? Are we good? We don't get too many emails on grades yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, Mr. Um, Anderson. Uh, if school starts before the end of the quarter, we change from virtual to hybrid, mm -hmm. but they'll be virtual and in class. Does that present any problem in getting an overall grade? I would think not, but. It shouldn't, no. Um, we're still following the same procedures for grading, so. Okay. And have we had any gap reporting yet? Have we had? Uh, the first quarter just ended. Okay. So um, those grades are still being finalized. So once we can bring that data back, because we just had the um, progress reporting data prior to for the high schools. But so maybe December? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for high school. for that We'll have those first quarter grades absolutely by then. So. Okay, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. And we could do a comparison to last year, and that would be a, a good true comparison. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else? Thank you. Thanks so much. Yep, thank you. Thank you, ladies. Ms. Carrie, thank you for accommodating the um, voting thing in your building. Appreciate that. Evans, welcome back. Yes, thank you. Good evening. Sorry, Ms. Paul, board members. Matt Evans, supervisor, student support services. I honestly do not have... I honestly do not have a whole lot of updates from last month. Um, the, the SEL incorporating the school improvement plan is still in progress. Uh, trainings have been completed and are ongoing. Um, SEL teams and schools are continuing to meet, are starting to meet. Uh, we did provide the self-care resources for staff electronically, and I also have those uh, physically, and they're also um, physically in HR, the HR office. Um, communication for zones of regulation will be going out this month to parents so they understand that language when, when they start hearing it from their students. And then I know um, Mr. Combs is working on the Gmail accounts uh, for all parents. The one, the one particular update I did have is we, we do have a grant now uh, funded through the Clifton Foundation. Thank you. 
for an SEL program, social and emotional learning, where we have two pilot schools, elementary schools. Uh, it would be Mattapique Elementary and Kent Island Elementary. Um, and there's, there's 12 staff members, counselors and teachers in included, that have access to these uh, this digital curriculum that they can push out to students. Also, our mental health coordinators have access as well as they do small groups. So we're, we're look, Kent County did that last year and have expanded it some this year. So we were happy to get to secure that grant and kind of provide other options and resources for um, social and emotional learning. But what are they actually doing? I mean, Basically, what are they doing? So the zones of regulation really is what it's there. We're teaching staff and then students to self-regulate, you know, and there's like the yellow zone, the red zone, the green zone, the blue zone. There's no bad zones, but it's important to identify where you might be. And then we uh, ultimately, they're teaching coping strategies to kind of help deal. And as we all have issues, you know, with moods and what have you, and, and, and to be able to recognize that and then know how to change your behavior or you know, mitigate certain things that are overwhelming to you. First time I saw this was at Bayside. Yes, yes. Uh, well showed that to me. I was so impressed with. We saw that what, last year during our school visit. Yes, they they rolled that out last year, and they were a big part of when we were initially planning in the summer. Uh, Nancy Krim and Christina Brucker, school psychologists, and they're they're big supporters. And they've helped me a ton, and and as you know, with rolling this out with other in, in all the schools. So since these, these teams are focused on the students, what are we doing for the staff? Well, that's part of it too, and that's uh, really that's the first step is when we're because we're asking teachers, classroom teachers, to you know be rolling this. Out the students but first we are actually doing that with staff members getting them to identify what zone they may be in you know I mean this whole thing with the pandemic oftentimes we always find ourselves in a red zone or a, a yellow zone and have you know kind of teach them to understand what it is to identify and then self-regulate so they even feel more comfortable because classroom teachers you know this is not something typically they're trained to do and not all of them feel comfortable but once they understand how they can use it for themselves they can better apply it to the students. After the pilots, the, are you, I, I'm a, not concerned, but I mean, I, I think we need to do the analysis up county too. I'm, I'm worried about the up county. Sure. So, and, um, Yes, and I can actually push that out to some of the schools as well. I didn't, I didn't push it too hard because I didn't want to overwhelm any schools. Or, but um, I, I can still follow through with that because we, um, it's called changing perspectives, and they would include more people if we wanted to. So I'm happy to do that. Great. Any questions? Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matt. Tiger Team 5. It doesn't want to It's like baby wipes that keep going. After everything settles down, I'd be interested in getting some statistics from Mr. Evans on social situation with students. He and I actually talked about that today and in schools where the program is running, perhaps sharing some of that data would be very helpful. So. And, and actually, the, uh, we do have a sheet where we are collecting data, all schools are, are so I, I should okay. have that okay. hopefully yeah. next month. Oh. So maybe when you come back for attendance. <laughs> <laughs> I won't have it then. <laughs> Matthew. Good evening, Mr. Combs. Good evening. Hello. Pleasure to see you. Thank you for coming in. No problem. And hanging out with us. Okay, for the record, my name is Josh Combs. I'm the supervisor of technology. Um, tonight, I just want to go over a couple updates uh, that I know that parents and staff have been asking about. Uh, one update just from our project perspective is there is an outdoor wireless point that has been installed at every single school. They are all up and running. Uh, we are still continuing the use of handing out hotspots. Um, I'm still generally re receiving requests every single week from the schools. Uh, right now we currently have about 820 units distributed to students and a few staff. When are the USB pieces getting here? The little, not USB, the um, 
webcams. Not the webcams. Weren't we supposed to be getting flash drives? Flash yeah, flash drives. drives. They've all, they're all in and they've been distributed to the schools that requested them. I'm not tech savvy, sorry. That's so okay. the flash drives are here yes. and they have not been given out to the students? No, they have been. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, we, we, we did that thing last month to use for, if they want to do electronic for uh, packets and for digital packets, every school that needed them, like Southern Elementary, anybody requested, yes. They've all been there and, and we showed them how to use it. We gave them guides on how you can put videos on it, how you can work with Chrome offline. Um, so it's like a student how-to guide and a staff how-to guide on how to use it. Now, as of today, they tell me they've actually shipped. So what's from that? The Chromebooks for what's going to be for first and second. So my hope is if they start shipping, then two, two and a half weeks, basically right around, I guess, Thanksgiving, either be Monday or Tuesday, Thanksgiving or the week after Thanksgiving, I can actually have them delivered to the schools. How sure are we that, of that delivery date? Well, once they start shipping, we receive them. As long as they send all the ones we ordered, it generally only takes about two weeks to set them up. That, that's pretty consistent. We've always been able to do that. Um, I mean, until I know for a fact that all 1,400 that we've ordered have come in, um, and I can bug them again in two days just to make sure. But once I know for a fact they're all here, I just know they started shipping to us now. Once I get all of them in, I know for sure, then I can definitely go look. It's going to be about two weeks from that point. So you're thinking, they excuse all, me. I'm sorry, wait till they all come in before you start working on them? No, no, we start working on them, but it, it takes, generally they all come in at the same time. But with the way things are going, I might only receive half of them, I don't know. I, I don't feel comfortable saying I can have them to every single kid until I know I have all 1,400 ready to go. But the idea is, yeah, as soon as they come in, we start setting them up right away. But I still need just about all of them to get them to the first and second grade kids, so. So your two, excuse me, the two dates that you have here. Oh, that's between. So I'm hoping to have them to the schools between 1125 and 1225. So 1225 would have been my worst possible date, but as of today, when I, they told me I actually should have them by 1120 to the schools, like already ready to go. As soon as they come to the schools, they can hand them out. They're already going to be set up, inventory, barcode, all that good fun stuff by us, so they can go literally call the parents, they come handle the distribute to the parents and then be ready to go. Or if they want to use them inside the school, obviously they can do that as well. Yeah, I was thinking it might do the amount to the ones that are inside the school so we aren't running with them, not having anything to, anything to use when the teacher's teaching to them. We could prioritize how we distribute them. Well, they still might need them for the virtual. Yeah, you're going to need them virtual, but as much yeah. you're need them so inside the They have been doing virtual, right? Aren't they without them? Just a thought if we're yeah, they just have it. Yeah, they might not have the same access that the kids would need who are okay. you know as the ones who are there. So we'd have to make sure that was going to happen. Okay. Webcams. Webcams um, for the to be used for the desktops in the classroom. I mean, they have webcams on their laptops now, but more flexibility by having another one on the desktops. I've been told around next week, end of next week, so the, to be delivered to me by the end of so the That's what they told me now. every classroom, or is this only for classroom, middle, middle and high school? Elementary, middle, high, all of them. Everybody gets one. Yes. Now, installed, or are they going to have to figure out what they're going to do? You just plug it, it in. It's, plug, it's what we call plug and play. Mm -hmm. So really, you just plug it in. It, the Windows, we're Windows 10 on all of our machines, either laptop or desktop, it doesn't matter. It'll automatically install, and then when you go to like Google Media, you hit the drop down looking for video and audio, you will see it. The Logitech webcam has a choice. So but no everyone software. has access now on their laptops. Yes, every laptop, every teacher laptop, uh, every ministry laptop has a webcam and mic on it. Some parents have been using Chromebooks, which also all the Chromebooks have webcams on them as well. Not the students, right? The students. All have... students have webcams. So they have webcam. Maybe I don't understand what the, we're bringing in then, because they have well, webcams. So maybe I don't so you won't have to sit in front of it. Like right now, if I had my webcam, I could talk, but it could be up here and I could walk around. Yeah, it's, just, it's the flexibility of, and also be able to use the desktop. The desktops don't have webcams right. physically there, you know. 
Computers that are hardlined directly to the network with physical cable are obviously faster. I think it's hardlined that's going to be faster than wireless. Um, there's, that's, that's always going to be the case. So we want to try to take advantage of the computers we have in the room. It also gives the flexibility of turning the camera a little bit better. Like they can still use their teacher machine doing one thing and then have this computer doing something else, maybe just having the kids up and they can split the load. So there have been like, like really creative things that I've seen uh, school districts that have used multiple machines, maybe an iPad and a laptop and done different things in order to teach virtually. Yeah. Um, and maybe because now might be teaching asynchronous and synchronous at the same time, they might need that flexibility to have two de devices yeah. to use. Josh, uh, yes, how is it different than what is in here? Uh, it's basically um, it's just like a little webcam about this big and it's basically it's, it's a USB to the computer and it kind of clips on top of the computer. So it's just a small so version. Equipment does it sit on? Do you like the, the screen itself? Everybody's? Yeah, it's a universal. It's a Windows um, webcam, it's a USB to the computer, you clip it to the top of your monitor, and now your computer is a webcam and a mic. But it also has the ability to come with a tripod, yeah. so it sits on feet. So you can have it over here with feet, and then you can twist and turn the audio towards the students in the classroom, have the video feed towards them, or towards you, so you know. But only the teachers around. have these. What's uh, that? I, I'm kind of, con and this is, I'm older than some of these critters in a Egyptian sarcophagus. Uh, I feel that way sometimes. But how in the heck does this thing on a teacher's mm -hmm. communicate to everybody that's tuned in to the teacher? I mean, it has like a basically almost a very high degree angle, what we call widescreen angle. So if I put it here. I would capture everything so from this angle. There's something so. in front of her that, or him that <laughs> the kids need to see. Just holds it. Okay. Yeah. In other like words, it's shot. just yeah. Use like a document camera. You could literally take it. I've seen people take it. and They put it on a pole. If you know what a document camera is, it's basically it does a webcam on a stick on a pole. You take the webcam and you can really face it. So yeah, you can definitely turn a web a if a non -technical, USB camera and use it as a document Josh, camera. Josh, if a so. non-technical person ever asks you a question like this again, just say it's magic. <laughs> Yes, sir. So you and I had a conversation last week about bumping up to two gigs because once yep. we have these webcams, once everybody's in, you know, even yep. with the hybrid schedule, they get back into the classrooms. We just don't have enough gigs for... Yeah, for the broadband. Yeah, we, I put a request in the state. They said it takes about 30 days of getting us in. Uh, we're going to the next week before they get back to me from the Wait engineering. Okay. The state, we're on the state of Maryland. That's our ISP. It's called Network Maryland. It's done by Department of IT of the state of Maryland. Okay. So <clears throat> Network Maryland is our ISP. So I put a request in for them to get us to two gigs. They gave me an estimate price, and they said, okay, our engineers have to make sure the path from Queen Anne's County to wherever Network Maryland feeds, I believe it's in Baltimore, that there's a path for an extra one gig, basically two gigs for us, all the way to Baltimore. And they got to check every router, every hop to make sure that's possible. That's what they're doing now. They told me it takes normally 30 days for the engineers to get back to you. And I believe what they're doing is they're pre-making sure that it's there, and then once they already know how to do it, it's a very fast turnaround. Once you say, yes, I want two gigs, we're ready to go. I made changes yesterday to the firewall and, and took a server out of the way and, and made some minutes 10 gigs. Of up, we can go up to 10 gigs. So we are ready on our end. I'm ready on my end to get us there. Now it's just a matter of getting the state of Maryland and say, yes, it's available, and then you guys give me the go ahead to for some purchase it. How much is it? They quoted me about eleven fifty a month. Extra. Extra, sorry, yes. Talking twelve thousand a year. Twelve yes. thirteen thousand. Yes. So if they come in next week, when is the system all these items distributed, the teachers have them, understand how they work. When are we online at that point to go and be in business? I don't know, because this is the first time we've ever had to do an upgrade for the internet part. I don't know how fast, it give, like, I can't tell you it's gonna be three days or it's gonna take five days. I don't know the answer to that because this is the first time we've ever had to do that. They just told me this very quickly once they do the engineering piece. That's the hard part, creating the solution package. Are the we webcams, talking? they've already been using webcams. So teachers know how to use webcams. So they, they, that's how they teach now. So it's just a matter of me getting them to it. Once I get them in, I can have them delivered in one day. I'll hit every school in one day. The Chromebooks, 
probably two weeks. I had to do you know all the elementary schools, uh, six elementary schools. It'll probably take two or three days at most because I have to have them freighted in so and drop because I'll drop freight them at the building but we'll be there to count them get them to the building and make sure that everything is, well, is there I, I have to ask and I, I'm I'm sorry if I'm beating dead horse here if we knew there was a connectivity issue why didn't we look at doing two gigs earlier before school started I mean wasn't it ever asked I guess the question came up once you guys or somebody when they made the decision about coming into the building. We were fine before this point. It was never an issue. Okay, thank you. That's we've only used half of what we had available to us. It was Google Meet takes a lot more, but we've never had this issue with the way we normally did business. Okay. It was not an issue. It's because the extra computers and the extra webcams are going to be in the school. Going using web, doing virtual meetings over Google Meet and virtual platforms like that. That's what's causing the issue of having needed more bandwidth. If you were telling us some ways how to save some of that bandwidth. Yes. But Mr. I mean, Smith. Yep. Can't hear you. You can't hear me? No. Oh, well, other people hear me, not you. Um, so, but the two gig is what we need. I mean, it would double what we have now. We we are only probably using 500 on an average basis of normal operations. Well, 500 of what? A gig. 500 meg. That's half a gig. Half a gig. So we'll half be, a gig. We'll be. So. But the next step, really, in the way the internet works, is you once you get to a gig, you just go one, two, three, four. Okay. It's easier to go. And the cheaper two, to go the two is going to cover us. I mean, yeah, that's four times as much internet we use now. So you think? So you're I think we're going to be okay. But you're also talking about all 14 schools and rise. Everybody, you know, on their computers, the webcams. They we need the width. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree that we need to do it. I. Uh, that, I'm not going to argue that. Well, I mean, <laughs> That's why I did all my work yesterday to make sure we're ready to go. I'm, I have all the engineers on my side to go. I just need the state of Maryland to do their piece and, okay. and approval for the funds, and then we are off to the races. You know anybody in the office? <laughs> Call them up. <laughs> well, I do know people stay around, but it's, it's the guys that actually do the work that I can't really pressure. <laughs> Josh, do you oh, think that will resolve some of the issues with a spotty internet in the northern county? <clears throat> or well, that's just... more of like the spotty of Google Meet. Now, I can't... Sp I can tell you with the talking to the other my counterparts in the state, Google Meet as itself can cause problems around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, because that's when the West Coast starts coming into session and they start using Google Meet. So their servers get pretty hit pretty hard starting around 11 or They've 12. They've always had issues there. So you know, windy day. Monday was bad, I think, right. countywide. Yeah, I, I know they say that about the weather, but it's it's hardline fiber. There is no, <clears throat> it's like every other building. <laughs> there is no actual poles or wireless radios or anything as well as a In the schools? Every school is fiber, hardline fiber internet. But, but when the, the, the students outside, they could have a problem because they are in the wireless situation. <laughs> Well, they do have problems yep. in the northern. Mm -hmm. yep. In the northern part of the county, it's all. Oh, yeah. For you talking about homes and stuff like that, and then for the families, absolutely. It's been a problem at the At, too. Yeah, so. so. Has it really? Yeah, it was Google Meet. You're straight with Google I mean, Meet. You, you got the okay, I mean, Janet or Miss Pauls, to give him the okay to go ahead and pr purchase this extra gig whenever it's necessary. Absolutely. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We have care sellers for that. When you meet tomorrow, I, yeah, ask. I don't know. Yes, I'll have to see. Yeah. But I, I think we're pretty good. But I'll, I'll check tomorrow. Okay. That's it for me, unless you guys sure. have more. Sure, don't, don't move. Oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> So the hotspots that we have, and they're so much money a month. How? Yes. I mean, estimated date that we will be getting rid of that. We have no idea because what we're looking at True. is the four hundred, the forty dollars a month for eight hundred and forty units. Yes, it should be getting down to fifteen to twenty per unit at this point. You've worked that out. Mm -hmm. yes. That's a huge help. Yes. I saw the I saw the actual decrease in the bill uh, yesterday okay. that they took off the twenty dollars. So I don't think it's more. It's about twenty dollars a unit at max. For and the, is it eight forty or is it still the fourteen hundred that we had for originally? Then we have like oh like if we continue until January we have to pay. But how many hotspots? How many hotspots did we have originally? Uh, the first order was one hundred. Then we ordered another three hundred. And, now we're at and then we have another 500. So we're at a total of 900 that we've purchased. And 
you said you have 820 in circulation. <coughs> mm -hmm. So what happened to those 80? Basically, every week that someone asks me for a new one, I, I hand them out. That's those last ones, which is the last 80, they're the one being paid out of the bus grant. Thank that's you. the state grant. The, uh, out of the state grant. Yes. That's separate from CARES and everything else. So you that's did, paid until the end of December already. Okay. So you didn't have any of this approved for the extra ba uh, broadband before you ordered it? You just No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Do we, we don't need to have a motion on that since it's underneath the under 25,000. Yeah. yeah. Are you, do um, you have enough staff to help you with this? We'll make it work. Your <laughs> timeline, timeline sounds pretty fast. It, it is, um, but uh, luckily we've had a lot of, pro we have a lot of practice over the past uh, <laughs> the last six years. So the, the folks in your office are, uh, God bless them. They put their time in. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. So Tiger Team Six, we can't have anybody. So, we'll take a break after this next one. Good evening, ladies. Thanks for hanging out with us. Oh, we appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. For the record, Ms. Schreckengoss and Ms. Kovach. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer Schreckengoss, Principal at Mattapique Elementary. And Kayleen Kovach, Assistant Principal at Mattapique Middle School. And we are Tiger Team 6. And honestly, we don't have a lot of updates. Let's see if we... I'll let you do that. There we go, yes. Okay, so um, there really isn't a change to the recruiting and interviewing process. It's still being done virtually, and that has worked very well. Um, professional development, uh, the most up-to-date information is that we are now developing those modules, so we kind of had to wait for the go-ahead to be able to do that and make sure we had funding for teachers who were producing those. And um, those are coming in, and they'll be able to access them on the Schoology platform platform. Um, as far as ANS, uh, those are still virtual, so there's there's no updates there. The only other update we have since um, the last time involved observation and evaluation, um, we had shared the last time that we had mirrored a virtual evaluation tool with the virtual observation tool. And as we approach a hybrid reopening, um, we realize that there will also be face-to-face -face observations happening. So now we are working to ensure that an evaluation document would reflect a combination of both virtual and face-to-face -face observations. But I'd like to just add to that because we've done a few of the virtual and they really, I mean, they're really effective. Uh, it, you can see what the student, how the student's responding, you see what the teacher's doing. Of course, you have the lesson plan ahead of time. So I think those have, I mean, they've been great, the ones that I've done so far, so. Any questions for us? Anyone? Observations. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, ladies. So we promise if we do it at Tiger Teams again, you'll go first. I was going to say we should work. <laughs> yay, yay. So you don't have to wait. Do number six first. Knock you out. It's like you're wetting cold cables opposite way. Yes. Because it seems like first takes a long time. So yes. mm -hmm. thank you. Oh, thank so you. So it is 8.15-ish. Can we take Whoops. a break and come back at 8.30? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jackie, Mr. we'll let you get this back up. It, it bumped. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Drive thank safely. You. We're taking a 15 minute break. <laughs> thank you. We're back. Thank you. Um, so we've just had the status of the QACPS recovery plan from the Tiger teams. Any, any discussion? Any questions? Anyone has? Ms. M Ms. Morissette? I don't. Nope. Mr. Anderson? Oop. I did a lot of loose ends. That's all. Well, if you have a lot of loose ends, want to bring them up now and talk to Ms. with the board and Ms. Pauls about it. Well, the thing that uh, the lists of things that people have to sign. Use your microphone. I don't get the impression that have been distributed to the Tiger teams as yet. Meaning? Uh, because they were only just developed uh, recently. I think that's going to create a different idea as far as. Uh, 
the startup and the cooperation we're going to get. Number two, um, the testimony of the association and other members of the teaching profession were decidedly against uh, the changes, uh, particularly those that could possibly uh, create sickness amongst the employees and uh, and so forth. The timing is wrong. If we start before the holidays uh, and there's a surge because people uh, with their families uh, catch it and it shows up here, it's going to spread to the school system. Uh, I, I, I'm just not excited about uh, making a vote that under the present circumstances, I believe, uh, has holes in it that need to be filled. I don't want to risk somebody's health. Uh, I know we have exceptional people doing as much as they can do, but I don't think the time is right. Mr. Smith? I think exception to that. I think our Tiger teams have done an excellent job. We've got some uh, hurdles that we probably will face when we do open up. Um, I think students need to get back as soon as possible to face-to-face, -face, even though it can only be an AABB day. Um, we're taking all kinds of precautions. We've had all kinds of and things have come up and concerns have come up. I think we've addressed them either through uh, safety with wipes and doing other things, sanitary things in our school systems. And I think the parents have to be understanding and be part of this as far as doing their due diligence, just like they do when they go out to dinner or they go to the Walmart or they do other social activities, to be conscious of what's going on in this world. But I am 100% thinking that November the 9th, we will be able to open up. It will be different. There'll be some hurdles but I think it's in the best interest of our students to have school open November the 9th. Captain Kelly? Um, I think we should open it up Monday the 9th. Um, first off, it gets the students in schools. The families are prepared for this. Um, it's only, when you think about it, it's only two mornings a week per child at least on the high school level, two mornings a week, I think on all of them. Like, that is it, it's not a whole lot, but it does get them back there. Um, it gives them a feeling more of a moving in the, in the toward normalcy, gives it um, the grade, grade point averages that this may help get them back engaged with where they should be. It may help give some kids back engaged with going to school, because some of them, the all virtual, they may not be really working like I think if they face their teachers once in a while. It's just human nature. Um, the teachers, the administrators, and the staff have worked very hard to get ready for this on November 9th. They have identified glitches they may have, but if we don't start at some point, we can, we can work on this forever and we you know the bottom line is we'll end up January 25th starting into school and that's way too late I've looked at the timing um, we have three weeks till Thanksgiving Thanksgiving is is a five a five day break we have three and a half weeks after that before it's Christmas so that's a lot of time for the kids to go ahead and be in school um, it's not just the you know from from one um, one holiday to the next. There's a lot of school in between those weeks. Um, I, um, <clears throat> the student board members <clears throat> mentioned they, they're ready, they're all getting ready to go in. Um, Mrs. Mitchell of the Queen Anne's County um, Association, she said that she felt there was a lot of work that had been done. I, I caught that, even though she brought up a couple other things, but she said a lot, a lot of work had been done. She sounded positive in my mind. There's still a few things to get ready by Monday, um, and we need to move forward on those and get as much as done as we can at, at that time. Communication will be key. We need to get communicated to the parents of what's going on. Um, even on a step-by-step -step basis, which which I like that my principal sent out, here's what's gonna happen. 
when they start on Monday and a bell's gonna ring when they quit move classes and they're gonna jump up and they're gonna be required to clean their area. Then they're gonna line up around the outside of the school, the room, until everybody is out there six feet apart with their masks and then a bell's gonna ring and they're gonna go walk to their next class with teachers in the halls, keeping them separated with all the direction going. I mean, it's, it's very well laid out trying to cover every angle. The staff clearly has done everything they can to make this completely clean and safe um, in accordance with the CDC guidelines. And and every every day they're working on making that work. We have custodians are up engaged, training has been going on. It's just been well prepared, I think. And to just, just up and take it away, I, I just don't think it's right. I don't know how else how else will be will be ready. There's other things we can do, but it'll take, you know, we could go for weeks trying to fix things that that are bothering people. We'll probably figure out maybe some of these things things are going to work better than others. Um, and it hit me with that survey, 75% after they've been updated want hybrid. 75% of these families want hybrid, 25% virtual. I didn't know it was that strong. And the last thing I want to say is we, we can't afford not to do this. Um, the children, the students need our help. And I was reading some old papers with data that I've saved on this whole episode. This one really hit me. It's from a child, a, a little girl going into 10th grade. Um, she said, something to consider is that virtual learning is not every child's, I mean, every, is not every child being home in a safe learning environment. Even if that child showed up to school every day with clean clothes, a lunch bag, and a smile on their face, you never know what someone doesn't speak about, especially teenagers. Teenagers have mastered at hiding their emotions. Many children struggle with abusive parents at home, yet never knock on that counselor's door. Maybe it's because school was their time to focus on themselves and their future away from their their parents. Maybe it was because they were afraid. I'm asking you to not pretend that most children have loving parents and quiet rooms to complete their schoolwork in. You cannot expect a child to perform the same way in school and at home. School is an environment that has been crafted especially for learning. And it goes on about learning and how she gets more out of learning. And at the end wrote, I've realized over these recent months that virtual learning would ruin mine and many others' dreams of going to college one day. It would ruin my dreams of escaping a home that made it hard to dream in the first place. We owe this to these kinds of kids. Thank you. I have questions, more questions. And I'm hoping that Ms. Pauls will be able to help me understand. Do you recommend pushing back the hybrid schedule because of the Schoology issue? We just heard tonight how the Schoology, if a student is transferring to a new teacher, all their schoolwork is going to be, it doesn't transfer over to the new teacher. Well, I'd have to talk a little bit more to um, Chris Brown to see how we're going to um, make accommodations for that. And I think in one of the questions, um, Ms. Morissette just received a message from a teacher who said it's just a matter of calling up here and they've been able to, to um, fix some of the, the issues. So we could fix that in-house? Some of them, but as far as the transferring, I mean, it's it's going to make more work for teachers for sure. Well, and it's not fair to the students who have already done that work, and it, it could possibly be, be gone. I mean, we need to find this out before they get to the building or get transferred to a new student. Yeah, they're just teacher. not going to be able to add anything new if they change teachers. So how about setting up a new student ID for them? when they transfer to the new teacher. Yeah, I'd have to talk to Chris Brown to see okay. what's I'm, I'm just, I'm just making it I mean, with, without making additional work for um, classroom te teachers. Cor correct. I mean, they've done all the work already. Secondly, do we have any schools that are not ready? Yes. So we do have three schools and um, Rise that are not staffed. They are not staffed. Um, 
and ready to begin on Monday. And I know that they've been working with Ms. Bass, but at today, as of today, they are not um, fully staffed. I, um, the, today, I tried to visit all of the schools in Centerville, and I did. I would love to have visited all the schools. I just have not had time. And I wanted to visit to speak to the principals, and I wanted to visit to just to kind of get a general idea of setup and, um, and what their needs were. And I wanted to be able to see exactly what it looked like in a school if they had put down all the materials that they were to use. And, and so... I want to say Centerville Elementary School, we've been receiving emails from them. They're ready to rock and roll. So I went to Centerville Elementary School first and, and it looks great. They're just, they're, they are ready to go. And all of, most of the teachers there um, have given a lot of kudos to their leader for their, their planning. And then um, I traveled over to Queen Anne's County High School and I had been there yesterday and today again. I was there and able to see um, how the students were transitioning and it, it worked well but we're gonna double those numbers and I don't know how it's gonna work with the six you know with the six feet they are missing some signs and I know Carla's working with them on that and as I peruse the school you know I personally had some questions about hand sanitizers I know they're all in the classrooms but you know are they in other areas as well too so I know she said she had some additional materials and supplies and she'd be sending those out to the schools and Ken Art of course I visited Ken Art they just got back in their building so teachers were actually in and working today and um, Centerville Middle School they said they have a plan but as of today um, you know I didn't see evidence of much that had been put in place and I have not been able to visit any of the other schools so my concern and some of the major concerns with um, principals we met with them all on um, Monday we had a virtual meeting and each of them had the opportunity to report out and some of their major concerns were the burn, burn rate of supplies which they have no way of knowing will they have enough supplies and I think that's also a concern for teachers as well uh, transportation looks great and um, I, they were a little bit stressed today but we kind of set a deadline and said we have to cut it off so we can get these routes out to bus drivers and then they can start to communicate with parents um, technology, Josh addressed that today. I was very concerned about the webcam, but it looks like they can get started. And then they'll um, add to their programs with broadband. It's, it seems like they're okay there with the computers. Um, we did talk to the teachers about being able to make modifications if those computers were not available for first and second grade, and which um, they have. Um, we did spend some time talking to Dr. Ciotola today, and um, he shared some, some great information with us about opening. And um, I know the other thing that we have to work on, the checklist is there, and it will be posted on doors, but I know that a lot of schools are still having some concerns about um, cleaning and what that's gonna look like, because I think two machines have been purchased per school, and some of them have already um, and so they were concerned about that. So I know Carla is in the process of, of ordering um, some more machines. Uh, custodians have been trained, and um, that video I know is out for um, the entire staff. Um, I, I'm, I, I don't know, Matt, I, I hate to put you on the spot, but will there be uh, like a training video to go out with the... Um, self-screening guidelines, how is that going to be presented? Because principals, to my knowledge, unless they're listening tonight and I chance to say most of them are, this will be the first time that they've heard of those sign-offs. So. You mean for the employees or mm -hmm. for the parents as well? Mm -hmm. Both, both. Yeah. 
the employees have been doing this, you know, with our, our but this is a little up. bit different. Yeah. yeah, they've not had to really affix a signature to anything thus far. They've been doing a little checklist um, already. So, so yes, they do that checklist, but then mm -hmm. when they're signing in on that contact form, that you're acknowledging that they are symptom-free by doing that. We also use that to be able to see who is in the building. Um, it will be new to the principals for the parents, um, but ultimately, and that was the discussion that we had had last week, was like, how are we going to um, show the We've, we've done our due diligence, one, informing families that, you know, it is your responsibility to self-screen. Um, and we even explored some things with technology, uh, even something where they're signing off every day. That seemed logistically to be difficult. Um, we had seen that other school systems were, in fact, doing a one-time sign-off, and they're saying that you're acknowledging when you send your, your child to school, you're going to, that, that you've, che you've done the self-screening in the morning, they don't have symptoms, and that they're going to wear a mask, et cetera. <laughs> I would anticipate that might pose some questions um, just because it's new and I, and I understand that it's it's all just being been developed and I also just kind of walked in <laughs> as well so I, I think you share this with me maybe Monday went Friday at some Friday point, Friday probably Friday yeah yeah I, I, I think the way we're looking at it is ultimately you know we send it that the principals can send that out uh, digitally to all their families not now not everybody will get it and then that first day back we're making sure that they're getting a, a physical form as well with the idea that you know we need to have this return but we weren't but even prior to them getting the physical form we're putting out via school messenger messages text voice and what have you saying if you are participating in hybrid learning um, you will need to self-screen etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, I think that would be helpful for principals because you have a little bit more background on the development if they had you know a, a statement to be able to read or to share with their staff so it's pretty consistent um, countywide. Okay. And may I ask that check the school messenger, make sure it's going to parents and, yes. and students. And, yes. You know, it yeah. needs to be updated somehow. And I'd like to give, uh, you know, kudos to each of the schools and the school teams and, of course, their administrators, because as we met with the administrators, they said we have a plan. And that's what they were directed to come up with. They are nervous. They are nervous about, um, you know, instituting that plan. Um, but of course, we have such great, you know, administrators. They're willing to do whatever is tasked of them. So, um, but they they are they are nervous about. They feel like a short period of time before a lot of things um, are in place. And they did have some questions, not a lot, but they did. Carla was there to uh, entertain their questions and Vanessa was there as well too. So, um, but the biggest issue is the schools that are not staffed. Correct. And those are middle schools and high school? It is Queen Anne's County High School, um, Sutlersville Middle School, Centerville Middle School, and Arise. And uh, Rob, uh, Mr. Watkins thought perhaps he might be able to work out uh, some with his schedule, and he says he's still working on it. And I quickly grabbed him tonight, and he says he's still working on that. So it could go either way. But uh, Queen Anne's County High School is definitely going to have an issue at Centerville Middle School as well. So which schools don't have two sprayers? So we currently have four that are out of service, but we have an order of 12 of replacement handheld units that should be in on Friday. So they will be our reserves that if something goes down, we'll be able to issue others. Okay. And I'll remind you that we still are able without the electrostatic machines to thoroughly disinfect utilizing the 404 and a 10 minute dwell time. That's exactly what we did back in March when we came back into the building. So the electrostatic machines are great because they they cover a large area in a short amount of time. It's basically a time issue. There's no additional help in disinfection. It's the same product, same type of disinfection. And we still have to address the regular cleaning duties Yes, that are not being done because one, we don't have enough help in the buildings. Correct. And we have, as well as implementing the new cleaning policies, we're going to be doing new inspection policies. So there will be three different separate random inspections that will be done at each building every week to determine if we are having problems. And that way it will allow us to quickly catch up and to figure that out. Have we discussed about hiring more custodians, seeing that all this has been going on? At this time, we have not. We've had discussions about it. 
the funding at this point did not look to be possible, that could be something that we talk about moving forward. Mm -hmm. I thought you said you, we had enough custodians. We, we, ha we have the number of custodians that we feel we need to complete the job. Would more be helpful? Of course. Sure. But we have an outline for everyone as to what jobs they'll complete during the day. And we feel that we have enough to complete it if everyone shows up to work. And you don't have substitutes for the custodians? We have a plan for substitutes in terms of a regional plan as to who would be able to fill in. But at this time, we have one substitute custodian who is in this building, and that is our only substitute. So we are we will be looking at other buildings to assist with that. But we do have a plan in place. So my next question, do is it is it possible to be recommended to just open up elementary school on Monday to, I mean, to give the middle school and the high school extra time to find staff. I'm, I'm just, at, I mean, I've asked this before about opening up elementary schools first. Queen, I mean, Anne Arundel County is doing it. Um, you know, baby steps. Start with the smaller students, you know, our smaller, you know, smaller kids. Get them in the buildings. Our elementary schools seem to be ready to go. How are they going to open up in that plan? How, what, what, when you say open up the elementary schools, how? On the hybrid up? plan. <clears throat> so two days a week, two days a, a, a week. AABB, yes. We're already scheduled for the entire system to open up on November 9th. I'm only asking if it's possible well, that we. Did. I'm asking if the element, if you th recommend that just the elementary schools <clears throat> open up first in order to give, give us a, you know. Give us an idea of what it's going to look like. And then bring that back to middle schools. Hopefully we'll have the staffing issues taken care of the following week. We, we have Suttersville Elementary School pretty much on a 50% thing right now, don't we? I mean, that's with the... Suttersville. Close to it. Part. I just feel that if we sit there and start picking and choosing on what schools or grades are going to do it, it could cause some other issues, both with staff and parents. And I think, you know, I know there's bumps in this road, and I'll be the first to admit there's issues that everybody's bringing up legitimate. But at some point, we've got to open up. And I feel that this staff has done a job that put us in that position. I'm talking about equity. And equality. Well, if you talk about equity and equality, how can you let a laundry school go and if not? If we don't own? have teachers in the classrooms to teach our students, how is that equitable? Well, we're gonna we're gonna work on getting teachers in there. <laughs> we were told we were our, well, okay substitutes. We were told we've got some stuff happening, and we should see how far along we can get. Look how much value our uh, uh, superintendent has found by walking around, knowing people, and gathering information. Uh, most informed assessment that I've heard in this room from a superintendent in a long time. Okay. So why wouldn't we listen to somebody who actually did something and comes up with an opinion? I'm only asking because I would like to give the middle schools time to be able to get the staff that's necessary to instruct our students. What would what would the secondary schools be doing next week when the elementary schools open? Virtual. We'll be doing the virtual they're doing now. And would that cause a problem with the association? That's another question. I know it's a possibility. I have to throw that out there. But our elementary schools are ready, and they have they have their staffing issues all fixed. It's just I'm just throwing it out there. I have to ask, and I can't answer that question if it would create issues. Um, I'm, I'm sure it probably would, but I but I don't know. So to be equitable, all the schools open up regardless of the issues we have. I'm not saying that either. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, well, I think we're putting Mrs. Pauls in, in a very <laughs> awkward position. We've only been here two or three days. I think this board needs to make a decision because we've been here for a year working on this with staff giving us information. I know there's a split in this board as far as which direction to go, but I think as five members, we should make that decision. I'm, 
I'm asking a professional opinion. I understand. Knowing that she knows all the principles, knowing our school system, something that we all don't know. We're sitting here, you know, with our own agendas about how we should open up the school system. So it's nice to hear someone else's opinion besides ours. And that's a very difficult position, uh, a very difficult question for me to, to answer because right. I have not visited the schools. I've had one meeting with all principals. You know, what they've communicated to me because they're a great group is we'll do what we need to do. We do have a plan, but they did have some, you know, some some concerns. Okay. Um, but they, they all have a plan for sure. But I don't know what the schools who are not fully staffed would do if students were to come in. And I know they received <clears throat> that information about substitutes today. So they haven't had much time to really uh, secure, to, to secure someone. Um, Ms. Bass, knowing that we have three days, do they, is it possible? Two days. Wave your magic wand. <laughs> It will be someone with teachers added to the sub to the LTS list. I can't tell you how many. Okay. The ones that I quoted you earlier already, they have the list. There are some more in the queue, but that depends on when they complete the entire process. Okay. So tomorrow that number will change. But you did say of the shortages we have, you have enough you have enough substitutes ready if the principals want them. If they want the, and they want to go it's there. a give and take. Right. Okay. You've got your hand, your work cut out for you, Ms. Bass, you and everyone upstairs. We appreciate it. Okay. Those were my questions. Ms. Forsett didn't have the opportunity to speak. Well, at first, I didn't have anything to say, but <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, I'm pulled on this issue. I on one side, we're hearing the desperation from the students. We need something in person and a good deal of teachers. They want those kids back in school. It's hard, especially when you're a hands-on type of teacher, it's hard to do things this way. And the kids want to get back to sports. But on the other side, you've got teachers who don't feel we are ready to move forward yet. Not, not at all, just yet. And then you've got some families, which is a very small percentage compared to the ones that want to come back, who, who feel this is too big a risk. I, I'm just very pulled about the whole thing. I don't have the answer. What right we're now. running against is setting a date setting a date that's been a mistake all along because people get their mind made up that that's the date and something comes up that says no it would have been better not to set that date we're going to move it to another date and then that's not right and we we ought to get it right enough once and say that's it you raised a good point why not let uh, you know the the elementary school kids in uh, most are already in person that is sitting in that chair needs the time to make sure that that's she can intelligently say well that'll work because if we do that's all I just know tonight I heard several times that there's moving moving pieces and it's not all clicking yet that's right so if we give it more time to click we'll be ready for our students 100%. And then there's equity and there's equality. I mean, we're always gonna run the risk of the virus. We just don't know what's gonna, what's gonna happen regarding metrics, you know, what we just don't know. We, we don't have a crystal ball and we can't predict that. Um, we do need to get students back in school. Um, that much I will say. At what time? I have not been here long enough to be able to make that decision. I've not been able to circulate around the county. I've had one meeting with principals. I've had some conversations from teachers and there are some who adamantly are ready to go back and the others who are not. Um, you know, in a couple of weeks, I might be able to, to give you that feedback, but I, I'll probably be gone. So 
uh, it makes it very difficult sitting in this seat for the amount of time that I'll be sitting here to make those decisions and then I'm no longer here. I mean, I think we've got a lot of good information from staff. And, you know, when, and Mark, when we said we set dates, you've got to set dates at some point because, I mean, parents are making decisions out there. Students are making decisions. I mean, we, we, I mean, there's no perfect answer to this thing. And something could go wrong. Something's going wrong now with these kids not being in school. So I think it's just a decision this board's got to make. It's a tough one. I don't think anybody likes to make it. But... I think we have to make a decision and uh, what's best for our students in Queen Anne's County. And there's certainly bumps and there's certainly some issues, you know? I mean, will a sanitizer break? Yes. Will somebody not have a sign on the door? Yes. You know, but at some point we've, we've, we've got to go. I agree with all of that, except if you don't have enough teachers to teach and the kids show up and there's nobody in the classroom, we can't let that happen. The other question is what if teachers don't? sign off on the access guidelines, then right. what, what would be the next plan, Matt? I hate to put you on the spot again, I'm sorry. But. Uh, again, and really that is Matt. more of, and it, again, that actual sign off is more to stop us, you know, currently they're filling out a piece of paper every single day, okay. and that seems to be wasteful and, and, and unnecessary. Um, and so really, what they're already doing is they're signing off when they, when they are filling out that form. Now we're just saying, you're gonna sign this one time saying you understand what you've been doing, we're now, when you sign the login every day and swipe in, you're saying you've done that self-screening. And it's not that there's no teachers in the classrooms now. Um, so they're exposed to kids. So, I mean and, kids. I mean kids, I'm sorry. And exposed to kids now. The other piece, too, is, I mean, is it... So uh, I had asked Dr. Kane if, if, if we want to require that signature, and she said yes. Yeah. So that's why we went down that road. You know, it's certainly, I want to say there's systems that are, and even the guidance from MSTE is that it's not necessarily required, but that you have to put out that information saying that when you come into the building and you're swiping in, you're acknowledging that you've done the self-screen and you're symptom-free. And they don't have to sign off on that. Right. I mean, so from, what, from what I saw that, it was very detailed information ex showing what needs to be done, what protocol we have if something uh, happens. Um, I think it's good to have that communication out there for the people uh, as far as signing something. And I think there's a responsibility both of our staff and because we want to make sure they're safe, but then we also want to make sure that the parents understand they got a responsibility when they send these students to school that they're taking responsibility of this because we're all in this together. I mean, you know, for the same reason. And I would take that a step further to beg these parents, and I mean beg these parents, once once these kids are back in school, to limit social gatherings and really adhere to social distancing and the mask wearing. Um, I know we, we kind of forget, we get comfortable, and that's when the exposures will happen, more likely at the social gatherings than in the classroom. So. I would just beg parents just to amp up how careful you're being outside of the classroom so that we can keep them in the classroom. Yeah, I think that's been the, the largest number of transmissions is community activity and um, not necessarily school. We haven't had large numbers of students in classrooms, but um, so far we've been pretty good. The documents we saw, I asked a principal, had you seen those? And she was on a, a group that's been working on this whole process and hadn't seen them yet. So we couldn't ask her what her comment was uh, about them. The, I think uh, Mrs. Pauls only saw them a, a day or two. Last week, Friday. Yeah, Friday. Gave them to me. There hasn't been enough time to digest and disseminate carefully amongst the Tiger Group principles. Uh, then uh, you have uh, the issue of what happens if they're handed to teachers and asked to review and sign. What if they say no? I don't know why they would, but uh, you know. Then you've introduced a whole new uh, set of issues that you have to deal with. 
every time something happens here, a new thing shows up that has to be figured out. I'll tell you all in private practice or whatever the secret session is we have, why that's gonna be a problem. Well, I think they've already addressed the whole, the document you saw. They're pretty much doing that already when they sign in. That document takes the place of signing in daily and attesting uh, to it daily. The document goes a lot further than that. Be that as it may, uh, I'll just shut up. <laughs> Is that doc document accounted for each day with the folks that are in the buildings? So you mean for the staff and students? Yes. It's a one-time sign-off. I know, but currently. When yes. I sign in every day, yes. is that? Yes. Okay. It, at the school buildings, the school nurses are in charge of okay. that, and here Ms. Ms. Lagarde. And I apologize for not knowing, but I just didn't know. I still worry about filling the positions at these levels. I mean, I, you may say you have substitutes, but some of them would, uh, may only sign up for just daily and not long-term, which is what's necessary to cover the teachers that are taking the FMLA or the CARES 5. So, I mean, we really don't know until Friday, pr probably, if you're going to have enough substitutes to fill these positions. I, I keep bringing this back up because I just want to make sure that we have people in the classrooms. Absolutely. And we also have not accounted for day-to-day -day sickness. And people with the sick outside of the kids and ADA or the appendix or anything else. Correct. You know. But we always have to worry about that. That's a, yeah, that's been an ongoing problem for, I mean, every, I mean, it's just magnitude now with what's going on. But, you know. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it up. No, so. I agree. I just think we ought to give it a shot and see if we can solve the staffing issue to alleviate the concerns we have, at least in a couple of schools. We're only talking about three, three schools, basically. Not that, not that we can operate without these, but I'm, I'm hopeful Ms. Bass could come up with a solution. So, um, and my last thing is I think we need to think about the students. That is our job, to think about the students. I am thinking about the Number students. Number one thing is we need to do this for the students. So we, uh, we'll talk Friday about the metrics, make sure we're okay to go good with going back on Monday. So you're not going to give parents any notice until Friday that it's... I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Right, not, right now, Dr. Ciotola says we're all right. Isn't that correct? So right at this present time, we're all right until... I mean, when's the next time you would check, though? We check every day. Okay. And that would happen. I mean, when we're back, that could happen on a weekly basis anyway. On a daily basis. Okay, next week or two weeks or three weeks from now, if the numbers hit the wrong thing and he says we need to shut down, then we shut down. But right now, as far as he's concerned, my understanding is we're okay. Correct. Okay. Based on today's conversation, right. he said we're okay. okay. I agree with you on the parents. They're, they're planning on this, and if we're going to think of changing it by Friday, we don't think that would be fair. I mean, we'd have to at least give them a day's notice. It's, if we've got bus drivers, we would have to give notice. I mean, there's a lot um, that would need to be done, even if we just went to elementary. Um, I think families are thinking that all of their siblings will, will be out um, for that time. Now, it may not be a problem if the older siblings are home. I don't know. Any more discussion? All right, thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it. We are at current action items 8.01. So, um, Mrs. President, since we did not do anything else and we have voted for tonight, that's what we will be doing is opening up Monday. There is no other action other than we are opening hybrid on November 9th. Thank you. 
So current action item 8.01, human resources is substitute bus driver report that was presented in closed session. Do I have a motion to accept the HR report? So moved. I have a second. Second. Questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the human resources and substitute bus driver report as presented in closed session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The aye. ayes have it. The motion is carried. Uh, 8.02, secondary novels for board approval. Let me, Ms. Passon. So do I have a motion to approve? Let me read this just right. The MOI approval uh, extended works adoption secondary novels. Fiscal dollar amount of $36,507.18. Um, budget uh, striving readers, comprehensive literacy grant year three. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Good evening. Thank you for waiting. I hey, really, for really appreciate me. it. I know you've got a busy agenda. Thank you for having me for this item. So these are the secondary novels under consideration? Yes. And I have received no comment on them. No comments? Okay. They, they were out, no public comments at all. No, sir. And they've been approved by our... Stakeholders. Stakeholders and teams. Yes. And I think now we have one, out, we always have somebody from the public that's on one of these things. Yep, we have a non-educator parent in that grade level who was part of the committee for all of them. So just the titles for consideration, Refugee by Alan Gratz, Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds, Where the Crawdads Sing by Delilah Owens, All American Boys by Brendan Keeley and Jason Reynolds, Born a Crime by Trevor Noah, Fences by August Wilson, Americana by, and I will not butcher that person's name, Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda by Becky Alter Albertali, Albertali. Mm -hmm. educated by Tara Westover, and the 57 bus by Dashka Slater. Those are the ones up, up for. And it's Chamanda Gozi Adichie. The you said it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wasn't even going to. <laughs> Is this Trevor Noah, the comic? Yes. He wrote a book on it. Yes, he wrote a book. He was uh, born in South Africa to a black mom and a white dad, which was considered a crime. So it was a book about his experience. That's the... read that one. I read The right. Long Way Down. It's a compilation of poems. Yes, it's, um, it's it was, not written in prose. It's yeah. pretty powerful. It was very good. Which one was that? Long Way Down. Yes, it does a fantastic job looking at inner city youth. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to approve the MOI approval extended works adoption secondary novels, fiscal impact dollar amount of $36,507.18, budget source, striving readers, comprehensive literacy grant year three. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Appreciate it. We are at 8.03, textbook for board approval. Do I have a motion to approve American Government Roots and Reform AP edition? Um, this is for uh, the purchasing from Sava Pearson, fiscal dollar amount of $27,742.79. Budget source, capital textbook budget. Do I have a motion? I have a second. Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Mr. Tolley, thank you for hanging out with us. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, same as last time, no, no public comments at this point. And this is... Uh, it looks like a, good, a very good novel, textbook. Yeah, for our AP, AP government students, it's a text that's used by many of our um, surrounding counties and, and other uh, jurisdictions okay. throughout the country. We, we have a digital copy of this too as part of the contract? Absolutely, okay. yes. Yeah, same, same as the other books we purchased. It's a six-year agreement, so we're, and it comes with a, a digital access for all students. So we have hard copy for them and digital access as well for six years. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it says right here, new textbooks and digital licenses. Because the current resource we have now is over 10 years old. Correct. 
All right, any other questions, comments, discussion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to approve the purchase of American Government Roots and Reforms AP edition purchased by um, from Sava Pearson. Fiscal impact dollar amount of $27,742.79. Budget source, the capital textbook budget, which I approve, I assume there's money there. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it, the motion is carried. We will have a CFO starting next week, Monday. Thank you. So we'll be glad to have her join us, be able to answer these questions. Thank you for hanging out with us, sir. Thank you very much. Information items, policy for second re uh, review, the student attendance policy number 503 and the regulation 503.1. This is just for setting out for a second read. Any questions, comments? Hearing none, I just, uh, we don't have to have a motion for that, do we? No, we're just setting it out. Okay. Transfer notice, uh, Mr. Fister, our uh, financial consultant sent this out. <coughs> There are no transfers budgeted for October 2020. Did everyone get a copy of the expenditure status report? Mm -hmm. We just had, we always have this transfer on our agenda because sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't. We just leave it as a permanent agenda item. So yep. your information. All the encumbrances are listed that are outstanding. Uh, I'd like next meeting uh, when our CFO is here, there's a couple questions I have only, and some of them are in special ed, which I know we run different, you know, have to transfer money there sometimes, but there's a couple that look like we are a little bit out of bounds. Why don't you get those, your thoughts together, those questions? Well, I got them right here, but I don't no, want... but then just email them to Ms. Pauls. I've then... talked to Mrs. Pauls about it, but what I just said is when the new CFO starts next, you know, she'd have more information on it. What I was trying to lead to is that when she meets with this person, then she can give you your questions and that way you can be answered quicker. Okay, hearing none on that. Expenditure report detail. Do we have anyone outside waiting for a public comment? Second go around. I have on here, no, I guess that's, oh, that's right, but take care of. Future board meetings. November 18th, board work session, December 2nd, and next school board meeting. Does anyone feel like we have to meet any time in between there? Yes, December 2nd is coming. Uh, brief comment. When are we going to find out whether the information that we get is credible to start on Monday the 9th? I mean, that seems to be something that the board collectively ought to know something about if we're not going to do that. If we find that there aren't teachers to teach or some other issue, right now, as I understand it, we start on Monday virtual. Or do we stay on uh, virtual hybrid. or on hybrid? There are some students who are going hybrid. There are some students that are still staying, staying virtual. Yeah, but most are going. Most virtual. are going back. 80% of our students are going back. So what are the conditions and who is going to make the decision of whether that is a yes or a no? Right now it's yes, unless there's a no. I'm just, you know, on, on Friday, there probably needs to be a, a discussion of what changed to say no, since right away uh, I get to the conclusion I'm the only one that will say no on Monday. Well, That's already been decided. Yes. Well, what do you recommend? I mean, there, should, there, there needs to be at least a communication to the, the president and the, vi and, and the vice chair uh, to be disseminated to everybody that these are the things that have come up and we've decided to postpone or 
whatever. I would think that a, super, a superintendent would do that if there was a reason. Right now, the parents, everyone needs to understand we are opening Monday. I wasn't and then talking to you. No, I okay. Was I'm, to sorry. The okay. I'm sorry. Okay. 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 Am I not allowed to talk? I just, I just asked Ms. Pauls what she recommends how to handle this. I mean, I'd be happy to send something out to let you know where we are on Friday morning, but right now we're not staffed and tomorrow is Thursday morning. Okay. So um, unless Ms. Bass can wave a magic wand, I don't foresee us being staffed by Friday. I just don't see it. Um, right now we're talking about, what, five teachers at Queen Anne's County High School and four or five at Centerville Middle School. Five at Centerville. Okay. And I think, and how many at um, Sutlersville? Four. So almost 15 teachers that we need between now and Friday. I don't anticipate that the metrics are going to change that much because Dr. Ciotola has pretty much said we have not had one day in the county above 15. The highest number has been 12. But staffing is going to be an issue. So it might behoove us right now to, to have a plan if we by Friday. And Friday, I think it's, I don't think that's fair to the parents to say, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna open school. So, I mean, at, at we discussed a little bit, and th this could happen very easily, and probably will happen. Some students would go to school and still learn virtually because their teacher, if we don't have a teacher there, then they'd have to do it virtually from school. And wouldn't that be an option? Not necessarily, because that teacher might be involved with uh, the, the hybrid learning and just might not be available at that particular time. No, I'm talking about the, you know, one that's doing virtual from home. Virtual won't be an issue. Okay. It's a hybrid that will be an issue. These are the, these are the, the, the classrooms that we have not been able to fill for hybrid learning. But if, if somebody's out there and we have too many, I'm using 75% in school and 25% out whatever the numbers are. Mm -hmm. If we have a teacher that is not filled up with virtual, then could she then, or he teach virtual from, from the school, the class would be there just to fill in until we get some things going. Now, I know somebody going to school learning virtually is not gonna be happy because they're going to school to learn uh, the you know, thing, but. I think those, those students have already been accounted for with okay. the virtual. Okay. So I, I don't think that will be an option. Oh. That's where um, Ms. Welsh was talking about having a pair in the room with the students while the, the teacher is home teaching virtually. I mean, they're all going to be looking at the monitor and that person, the teacher, they're going to be looking at the teacher on their monitors while somebody is sitting in there just making sure that they're all being, being you know, socially distanced and, you know, washing their hands and keeping their face masks on. I think the concept was it would be it, it, as an interim step if we don't have, we may pick up half the teachers you need. And if we have a few left, that would be an option until we're able to pick up the others. It's only going to be it's only gonna be two mornings a week, is all I'm saying. So I mean, it would be an option not to derail the entire plan. Well, it, two mornings for A, two mornings for B. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit more than that. Right. I understand. I'm just thinking about if I were a principal, I would be in panic mode right now if I did not have the personnel that I needed to begin instruction on Monday. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not backpedaling. And like I said, I haven't visited all the schools. I have, not, I've had conversations with principals, but I've not had individual conversations with principals. Um, about where you know where they are as far as being ready ready to to begin but I do know that we have about 15 spots that are not covered and so my question would be how do we make it work um, if we can't find coverage for for those areas so you don't and or 
are able then to give notice to the parents and the whole thing becomes confused and parents teachers and everyone else yeah i mean either we are gonna the night before we leave here make a decision that we're opening the ninth or we're not we cannot wait till friday to make that decision that is not fair to anybody not fair to anybody so the so. answer is we shouldn't open <laughs> you don't have the teachers i heard very clearly it's unfair Today is Wednesday, and by Friday, find 15 teachers to fill 15 holes. Those that want to start, I understand the passion, but all I hear is ifs and maybes and this and that. We're going to have enough of those already. We don't need more. And I suspect there are going to be more than 15 holes. The problem is if we, I mean, the PR right now, if we try to put it back another week, I, I just, I just see I think chaos. you don't say when you're going to put them back. You say, we're going to have a plan and we'll give you a week's notice. And you can't do that either. I well, mean, that's we, what I would do. Uh, uh, you know, I'm only one person and I may not be here when it all goes down anyway. Maybe I'm used to a different kind of dishes you're making, but you know. Well, yes. Um, it's a very hard decision. And like Mrs. Paul says, it's gonna be very tough and, like, and, and she's been a principal, so she knows she'd be in panic mode, not having staff to cover that. The other side of that is we're gonna be short and there's no way Mrs. Bass is gonna pull 18 or 20 rabbits out of a hat to, to perfect ones to put in the, in the right place. But we've got to move on, I feel. And if we find out it's not working in two or three weeks, we can revisit the situation. That's my opinion. Not yours, I understand, Mark, but that's just the way I look at it. But we've got to make a decision and we've got to give some direction, both to staff and to the public tonight. I guess as a solution, my, my question is, what I was trying to say was, would, we, would it be possible to try to get the para in for those five classes, out of, or what is it, nine classes out of the system, to get them in and let them, if that's what we're, we're, we're stuck with, let them do virtual in the classroom. The ones that come in to do in classroom, at least they're doing the in classroom thing to go ahead and, and get their replacements in there. It gives them a little break. At least the, the principals aren't gonna be with a bunch of kids running around in their class. I don't know that schools have enough pairs to be able to do that. I think some of them are still in the process. I've seen a lot of uh, forms coming my way. And I, I think the, the hiring freeze, correct me if I'm incorrect, Ms. Bass, has just been lifted to a certain degree. So they're still in the process of hiring. I know when we met with principals, a lot of them are saying we need, you know, I need to hire another para. Um, so I, I don't know, and I don't know the classes, unfortunately, and it's my apology. I should probably be better prepared. However, I don't know what teachers are missing from each of the schools to be able to say if that would be feasible to do. I mean, like one of them I know is a, um, a project lead the way. And as Adam talked about, you know, he'll do the best that he can to gather the materials, but that does require some, some level of training for those teachers. And that affects two schools. Um, it's hard to, it's not like an elementary school teacher who teaches K through five and five content, core contents. Someone who has a specified mm -hmm. project either way or science or math I mean, yeah, content, yeah, at the high, yeah. to, at high the school, high school level, it's totally different. You can't just. But aren't they teaching virtually? I mean, they're gonna be teaching virtually. What I'm saying right? is a replacement for that person is very hard to find. Yeah. You can't put a round right. peg in a square, you can't. But, I mean, it's going to be tough, but in the middle and high school, they are de de dealing with different teachers, so that students will be getting, they might be missing one teacher out of their teachers are dealing with every day on their thing, but I don't think there's ever going to be a perfect thing until this thing gets over with, and it's, it's, it's not going to happen tomorrow. 
and I, and and Mrs. Pauls, you should not apologize to anything. <laughs> you've no. been you've been on board for three days with what's going on. I commend on on, on exactly. uh, the communications we're getting from you right now. It's been very helpful to me. So, Miss Bass, how much more time would you think to give it give you? How much more time? Well, the principals would have to make the calls and they would let me know. Then I call the sub, then they would let me know, and then I would plug in and let Mrs. Paul know what subject has been covered. So they have the list, they just gotta contact them. The sub has to answer in affirmative, and then we could get them in the system, because they've done the process, and so we gotta get them on payroll, which Mrs. Collin would take the pink sheets that we talk about all the time and try to get them into payroll. So they would be the only night. So a week? Are you into? Would, are you it, saying? It would <clears throat> be about a week because I don't know the turnaround how quickly the principals are contacting them. They're probably home tonight contacting people who have been subs in their building a lot. But outside of that, if they're new to that school, they're trying to fit the square into the round, the round into the square. They absolutely are. Because it has to be the right fit for the classroom. I mean, I'm all for getting kids back in school. I know we need to do it, but we also need to be prepared. When I've talked to my counterparts in um, neighboring counties, they have not had the staffing issues that we've had. And so it's been a little bit easier for them to go ahead and, and begin school. They don't also have the same amount of students that we have. They don't have the same amount of students, but they, they have not had the staffing issues. I don't know what to tell a principal that does not have staffing other than I guess I'll be at your school on Monday trying to teach um, something, which probably won't go over very well, but that's what it would amount to. I, I mean, we would literally have to use people here at central office, content supervisors to go out and support, and there's not enough of them to go around. No. Not if we have 15, um, you know, that we need. So I guess I would just need some some help with that because I have to be able to entertain those questions. Um, once again, I mean, I'm all for opening school, but again, um, there's never going to be a good time because it's always going to be a holiday coming up or a change in weather or it's flu season. Flu season is going to, you know, be here for quite some time. But I do. <laughs> I do have to think about schools and how they're going to um, support our students. I mean, that's a liability issue. There's a lot of other things. So um, I just need to make sure that everyone understands that with the decision that's being made and and you're here to, you will be here to support that because the emails and the calls will probably be. Oh yeah. I'm just worried about the blowback if we if we only do the elementary schools. So can we just push this back a week, give these schools and these administrators time to do what they need to do? And then if we decide to do that, which schedule are they following next week? What they're doing now or the new proposed schedules virtually? Because the times change. So the first question, what's the harm in pushing back one week and give them time to fill positions and see what they've got. We stay at the virtual. We should stay at the virtual they're doing right now, and then just start the new hybrid. On the following the 16th. week, sixteenth, and that would just give that would still give us two weeks before Thanksgiving came. So we would at least right. be immersed in it long enough to have a general idea of what we need and and how we need to proceed. So. Um, we, if we can't fill spots, we don't have the staff, at least we know before the holiday season, we can't do this. We'd have more of a, an accurate picture of what we've got and what we don't have. Yeah. I hate to push it back that far, but I mean, I mean, we heard loud and clear today with the teachers, <laughs> with their messages. I mean, that's, it's, it's been pretty clear. I would go with um, laying it back a week, pushing it back to the 16th uh, in support of your concerns, Mrs. Paul. We will be in the same trap as we are now. Well, um, we'll give it uh, a If you set another date, then we'll be pushing up against that. We will give you a week's notice when we can start. And that sort of follows what uh, Mrs. Moore said is saying. If, 
if, if you say, as soon as you say a week, it's another week before you can start, then you're into the holiday season. Why are we keep setting a date? We haven't met a single date that's been set. Because we've got to set a date. People have to make plans. Both our staff does. They have children. Our parents have children. Everybody's got if an issue. Trigger, we got to give them dates. If the trigger is having the staff in the right place, I think everything else has fallen into place. This is not a go without the teachers in the classroom certified to teach the lessons they got to teach. One week's not going to get the teachers back. One week might get us a more well, accurate thing about super. Don't start and we, we don't might find a, a you, other solution. How do you teach without teachers? Well, one week will give us the opportunity to increase our com uh, communication to that's families right. because right now I think that's also something that's been lacking because it, tomorrow's Thursday. So all of a sudden, you know, we're going to say, these are the guidelines that we have or you know, we have Ken R who just got back in their building, even though they're elementary school, and they'll be, but they just got back in their building. They really, Michelle had started to put some things in place and she probably made a lot of progress after I left there this morning, but I don't know. We need to, um, we may have our webcams by then. I'm, I'm okay with moving in a week. It, I, w I think we need to set a, a time on it and then they can look up for, if they see how that goes to hire on and then, Look at um, maybe the the like like uh, Sellersville Middle's doing. He's trying to come up with solutions. I mean, giving him a chance to come up with other solutions. We'll give him another week. I'd like to do that in support of of your concerns, Mrs. Paul. So what would we do instead of starting this Monday the ninth? We'd start the sixteenth. That would be my recommendation. Well, then I would suggest that we tentatively set up a board meeting for the eleventh. Because we, if, the, if, if any, and we don't only need to have that board meeting if something's not going to happen and we're not going to open up on the 16th. But I, I, I you know, who's going to make that call? Because pushing it one week, I think, is, 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 a, is a, a good idea to, to solve some of these issues. But I think we're going to still have issues on the 16th, too, of the same magnitude. Okay. So your motion? Just remember, I'm scheduled to leave on the 19th, 18th, 19th. I'm scheduled to leave, so we don't know. That's another, that's another big issue. When Mrs. Bass says we have the, the teachers covered, they're signed on and they'll be on the payroll on such and such a day. One week from that moment, we start. Our, whatever uh, advance notice families need. what I think should happen. Well, I make a motion that we open for the hybrid plan on the 16th and do our best to cover the staffing issues up to that point. Oh. And the other issues we're going to have. We've okay. wait, 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 wait a minute. Motion to change the date for the school system moving to a hybrid plan hybrid learning plan to November 16th. Is that what I understand? Yes. Motion to change the date for the school system moving into a hybrid plan to November 16th. Do I have a motion? Moved. I have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Questions, comments? Oh, I think we have to, that's fine if we still if we have all the teachers that can fill the spots. But that'll be a, something that will be discussed at the time. I, I highly recommend that we have a November 11th work session regardless of whether we have staff or not. So that's a given at this point. Any other discussion about moving the date? Mr. Smith? No, I'm fine. Okay, Ms. Morissette? No, not on this. Okay. So hearing no other discussion. I'll go along with it. <laughs> hearing no other discussion. Along with everything so far. I call for the vote on the motion to change the date for moving the school system to a hybrid plan to November 16th, 2020. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. 
I do have one concern after this discussion. I overheard us saying that we we have op we have lifted the hiring freeze. I thought we were long since lifted the hiring freeze. I think it's been a gradual process. Okay, because I'm gradual. all for lift it. You know, we don't want to freeze on hiring teachers. Yes, I think it will really be nice too to have uh, Miss Towers on board on um, <laughs> what we meet. Um, You'll let her know. She won't have her head wrapped around everything at that particular point, as well as myself. But at least it will not be nice to have her there. And you know, I mean, you got to remember, I'm I've been here three days. I'm acting superintendent. I'm acting deputy superintendent. It's been a lot, and I'm not complaining, and I'm trying to do the best that I can. But it it does take a little bit of time to really. Um, you know, to have those conversations and to to work with the principals and to make sure because they have worked so hard and I don't want it to fail for them. I really don't. Um, Tammy, could we, uh, at Mrs. Paul's uh, uh, wish, have a meeting next Wednesday if necessary? Already scheduled. Uh, already scheduled. Well, I mean, but but I I want the people to know that we're planning to open up on the 16th. And I don't need to change it next week again unless there's a good reason to. And that for Staffing a reason, issue is definitely a reason. Well, there might be. But if Mrs. Pauls has that straight and Mrs. Bass can get the people in this week and next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there won't be a need to this. We just go do it. And that's what our plan is. I just think having another meeting and have everybody sitting in limbo for next week, I think we should really sit there and say we're going for it with this thing a week from Monday. Ms. Morissette, what does, can you make four o'clock? I can. I was going to ask, do we need to make a motion to add that we do. session? We do have to. Do I have a motion to add to board's uh, meeting schedule, a work session at four o'clock on November 11th? Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? All those in favor, hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to add aye. November 11th at 4 o'clock work session for the board. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Okay, so we are. May I just ask, it to, for, just to clarify, this has no effect on where sports are right now. They can continue doing what they're doing. Okay. Correct. But at some point, if we don't open up, I mean, they were talking about not opening up playing until if schools aren't open. Only if we go hybrid and, and a school has to close because of an outbreak. Okay. Then th that would be sus sports would be suspended at that school for you know for that. But if we if we're not open with a hybrid situation by December, whatever it is, mm -hmm. the, uh, my thing at the end when I talked or heard those two gentlemen speak that you know, they're looking at sports behind opening up schools that the first priority would be opening up schools i mean maybe i heard it wrong it's only for the outbreak that we would close okay. the school otherwise sports will continue as it is now even if we stayed virtual you still have small groups coming in students are still coming in buildings mm -hmm. yes okay yeah uh, dr salmon has made it very clear that you would like sports too um I hope she makes it clear we need to have kids back in school and she's made that as clear as well. We've had to submit paperwork to say where we are. And, uh, you know, I don't think anyone disagrees with that at all. But we have to be ready to receive students as well. And I think that's fair to all entities, the students, you know, parents, to teachers, administration. We can't be the only school system struggling with staffing. I mean, she, Dr. Sam, I'm sure, has seen this all over the state. Work on it. <clears throat> we have four days. Oh, we're not blaming you. We appreciate you. it. Oh, no, you, you've, you've fallen into a... I know. I well, Ms. Bass, we appreciate everyone upstairs. <laughs> we appreciate, I mean, all the administrators and supervisors and everyone who's working in the system, the teachers, custodians, everyone. I have to... Uh, the entire board thanks everyone so much for all their hard work they're putting into this. And the students, they're the ones that are, are having to be resilient and adapt um, to the changes made because of this pandemic. So thank you all very much. No other questions, comments? I would just say to the teachers who are hesitant or have reservations, 
you're not going unheard. And we totally understand the stress. All the teachers, they're stressed beyond belief. Your cries are being heard. It's not being ignored. It's We're trying. And we can get that to the parents too because they, they want their kids back in school. Yes, yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yeah. And and I don't think that there's anyone who doesn't want the kids back in school. I think that was loud and clear today. I personally want students back in school. But if they're coming in a hybrid model, model I want a teacher to be there in front of them as well, too. Um, yeah, I... I did get it text from some a teacher who said that I don't understand paras you now that they're only funded by special ed but we were told that they we can pay for them with local money not special ed that would enable them to to be in a classroom teaching somewhere but isn't there a difference between a para and a classroom aid is I mean is that what you're talking can you about? Claire, that by that for me. Yes, I can. Thank you. The, the paraprofessionals are delegated to special ed. Their funding is through special ed. Now we have in the past there's something called pass through that Mrs. Smith works on. So she can do that at certain schools, but I have to get permission for that funding source to be changed into a local pass through. Okay. Just in general, we, do, we have five hour purpose. They are temporary employees that we call to ask back, but most of them assist in special needs. I understand. Okay. I think the language is used interchangeably, which makes it a little bit more difficult because we often call our school assistants who are paid out of local funds, paras as well, too. What should we call them then? Like, um, okay. Sub, is that what it's, no, like a school sub assistants, okay. pairs. I mean, it's okay. It's just the funding that makes the difference. If okay. they're if they're local locally funded, then we can use them. Thank you. Okay. And to clarify, next week will be the usual schedule. Virtually, yes. Will CTE come on Wednesdays? Wouldn't change. And special needs Tuesday, Thursday. Just so parents are aware, if a bus is or is not coming. So we, we need to let everyone in the school system know that it's going to just to get, maintain the schedule that you have currently been doing for now. And um, hopefully we'll have... Be prepared for the Be prepared 16th by the November 16th the date. The so hybrid. for the, the Centerville Elementary School staff who really, really are gung-ho about getting their students back in school, you know, we, we've only pushed it back a week, so we thank you. It just gives you, you know, a little bit more time to perfect your plan. And for the parents, you know, we sincerely apologize for, uh, you know, any issues that we may have caused. I know you were planning on sending your students back, but hopefully you will agree and we have your support to know that we want to be ready when your students come back to school. So. You know, my apologies right now, but we'll work diligently to make sure that the 16th we're ready. Thank okay. you. No questions or comments. Uh, do I have a motion to go into closed session to reconvene closed session? Second. Motion is second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I, I call for the vote on the motion to reconvene closed session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We will close out and close session. Thank you, Mr. Strait. Appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good evening. Please be safe and healthy.